Section 1 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Underground Railroad, Part 5 by William Still. Section 1. Organization of the Vigilance Committee meeting to form a vigilance committee as has already been intimated others besides the committee were deeply interested in the road indeed the little aid actually rendered by the committee was comparatively insignificant compared with the aid rendered by some who were not nominally members to this latter class of friends it seems meet that we should particularly allude but before doing so however simple justice to all concerned dictates that we should here copy the official proceedings of the first meeting and organization of the philadelphia vigilance committee as it existed until the very day that the ever to be remembered emancipation proclamation of abraham lincoln rendered the services of the organization and road no longer necessary it reads as follows Pennsylvania Freeman, December 9, 1852. Pursuant to the motion published in last week's Freeman, a meeting was held in the anti slavery rooms on the evening of the second instance for the purpose of organizing a vigilance committee. On motion, Samuel Nicholas was appointed chairman and William Still secretary. J. M. McKim then started at some length the object of the meeting he said that the friends of the fugitive slave had been for some years past embarrassed for the want of a properly constructed active vigilance committee that the old committee which used to render effective service in this field of anti-slavery labor had become disorganized and scattered and that for the last two or three years the duties of this department had been performed by individuals on their own responsibility and sometimes in a very irregular manner that this had been the cause of much dissatisfaction and complaint and that the necessity for a remedy of this state of things was generally felt hence the call for this meeting it was intended now to organize a committee which should be composed of persons of known responsibility and who could be relied upon to act systematically and promptly and with the least possible expenditure of money in all cases that might require their attention james mott and samuel nicholas expressed their hearty concurrence in what had been said as did also b n goines and n w d p the opinion was also expressed by one or more of these gentlemen that the organization to be formed should be of the simplest possible character with no more machinery or officers than might be necessary to hold it together and keep it in proper working order after some discussion it was agreed first to form a general committee with a chairman whose business it should be to call meetings when necessity should seem to require it and to preside at the same and a treasurer to take charge of the funds and second to appoint out of this general committee an acting committee of four persons who should have the responsibility of attending to every case that might require their aid as well as the exclusive authority to raise the funds necessary for their purpose it was further agreed that it should be the duty of the chairman of the acting committee to keep a record of all their doings and especially of the money received and expended on behalf of every case claiming their interposition the following persons were appointed on the general vigilance committee general vigilance committee robert purvis charles h bustill samuel nicholas morris hall nathaniel d p charles wise jacob c white cyrus whitson j asher j p burr william still p williamson b n goines j m mckim isaiah o wares john d oliver professor c l reason henry gordon w h riley 
robert purvis was understood to be chairman of the general committee having been nominated at the head of the list and charles wise was appointed treasurer the acting committee was thus constituted william still chairman n w d p passmore williamson j c white this committee was appointed for a term of one year on motion the proceedings of this meeting were ordered to be published in the pennsylvania freeman adjourned william still secretary samuel nicholas chairman the committee having been thus organized j m mckim corresponding secretary and general agent of the pennsylvania anti-slavery society issued the subjoined notice which was published shortly afterwards in the pennsylvania freeman and the colored churches throughout the city Quote, we are pleased to see that we have at last what has for some time been felt to be a desideratum in philadelphia a responsible and duly authorized vigilance committee the duties of this department of anti-slavery labor have for want of such an organization been performed in a very loose and unsystematic manner the names of the persons constituting the acting committee are a guarantee that this will not be the case hereafter they are william still chairman thirty one north fifth street nathaniel w d p three thirty four south street jacob c white one hundred old york road and passmore williamson southwest corridor seventh and arch streets we respectfully commend these gentlemen and the cause in which they are engaged to the confidence and cooperation of all the friends of the hunted fugitive any funds contributed to either of them are placed in the hands of their treasurer charles weiss corner of fifth and market streets will be sure of a faithful and judicious appropriation end of section one section two of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the underground railroad part five by william still section two portraits and sketches esther moore for many years no woman living in philadelphia was better known to the colored people of the city generally than esther moore no woman white or colored living in philadelphia for the same number of years left her home oftener especially to seek out and aid the weary travelers escaping from bondage than did this philanthropist it is hardly too much to say that with her own hand she administered to hundreds she begged of the committee as a special favor that she might be duly notified of every fugitive reaching philadelphia and actually felt hurt if from any cause whatever this request was not complied with for it was her delight to see the fugitives individually take them by the hand and warmly welcome them to freedom she literally wept with those who wept while in tones of peculiar love sincerity and firmness she lauded them for their noble daring and freely expressed her entire sympathy with them and likewise with all in the prison house she condemned slavery in all its phases as a monster to be loathed as the enemy of god and man often after listening attentively for hours together to recitals of a very harrowing nature especially from females her mind would seem to be filled with the sufferings of the slave and it was hard for her to withdraw from them even when they were on the eve of taking up their march for a more distant station and she never thought of parting with them without showing her faith by her works putting a gold dollar in the hand of each passenger as she knew that it was not in the power of the committee to do much more than defray their expenses to the next station to new york sometimes to elmira at other times and now and then clear through to canada she desired that they should have at least one dollar to fall back upon independent of the committee's aid 
this magnanimous rule of giving the gold dollar was adopted by her shortly after the passage of the fugitive slave law which daily vexed her righteous soul and was kept up as long as she was able to leave her house which was within a short time of her death not only did esther mora manifest such marked interest in the fugitive but she likewise took an abiding interest in visiting the colored people in their religious meetings schools and societies and whenever the way opened and the spirit moved her she would take occasion to address them in the most affectionate manner in regard to their present and future welfare choosing for her theme the subjects of temperance education and slavery nor did she mean that her labors in the interest of the oppressed should cease with her earthly existence as the following extracts from her last will and testament will prove second item i give and bequeath to my executors hereinafter named the sum of twelve hundred dollars in trust to invest in ground rent or city of philadelphia loans at their disposal or discretion to pay the interest or income arising therefrom annually to be applied the interest of the twelve hundred dollars above mentioned for educational purposes alone for children of both sexes of color in canada apart from all sectarian or traditional dogmas which is the only hope for the rising generation the application of this money is intended to remain perpetual seventh item i give and bequeath to my executors the sum of one hundred dollars to be expended by them in educating and assisting to clothe phaeton and pliny j locke the sons of ishmael locke deceased and matilda locke his wife my will is that it shall be given out discretionally by my executors for the purpose above mentioned seventeenth item i give and bequeath to oliver johnson editor of the pennsylvania freeman one hundred dollars if he be living at my death if not living to go with the remainder of my estate my will is that if oliver johnson be not living at my death his bequest go with my estate eighteenth item i give and bequeath to cyrus burley lecturer and agent for the pennsylvania anti-slavery society one hundred dollars if cyrus be living at my death if not living at my death his bequest cyrus burley's i wish to go with the residue of my estate the untiring vigilance of these two young men in devoting the best of their days to the rescue and emancipation of the poor and downtrodden fugitives has obtained for them a warm place in my heart and may heaven's richest blessings reward them they have ministered more than the cup of water item nineteenth i give and bequeath unto the association for the care of colored orphans of philadelphia called the shelter for the use and benefit of colored orphans of both sexes to be paid into the hands of the treasurer for the time being for the use of said society all the rest and remainder of my estate i wish my executors or trustees to carry out my views in regard to the education of colored children in canada by paying over the interest arising annually from the twelve hundred dollars mentioned in the second item to such school or schools as in their judgment they may deem best my desire being the benefit of such children who may be in the same neighborhood with them the interest arising from the twelve hundred dollars mentioned in the second item for the purpose of educating colored children in canada is intended to remain perpetual i give and bequeath to william still of philadelphia now employed in the anti-slavery office in fifth street philadelphia february twenty one the sum of one hundred dollars and request my executors and trustees to pay over that amount out of my estate estimora was not rich in this world's goods but was purely benevolent and rich in good works towards her fellow men hating every form of oppression and injustice and an uncompromising witness against prejudice on account of color such a friend as was esther moore during these many dark years of kidnapping slave catching mob violence and bitter prejudice which the colored people were wont to encounter should never be forgotten 
the legacy devised for educational purposes was applied in due time after one of the executors in company with his wife dr j wilson and rachel barker moore visited the various settlements of fugitives in canada expressly with a view of finding out where the fund would do the most good in accordance with the testator's wishes and although the testator has been dead seventeen years her legacy is still doing its mission in her name in a school near chatham canada west in order to complete this sketch it is only necessary that we should copy the beautiful and just tribute to her memory written by oliver johnson editor of the national anti-slavery standard and published in the columns thereof as follows death of a noble woman from the national anti-slavery standard just as our paper is going to press there comes to us intelligence of the death of our beloved and revered friend esther moore widow of the late dr robert moore of philadelphia she expired on tuesday morning november twenty first eighteen fifty four of gout of the heart after a short but painful illness in the eightieth year of her age the writer of this first became acquainted with her in eighteen thirty six and at various times since then has met her at anti-slavery meetings or in familiar intercourse at her own house her most remarkable traits of character were an intense hatred of oppression in all its forms a corresponding love for the oppressed an untiring devotion to their welfare and a courage that never quailed before any obstacles however formidable her zeal in behalf of the anti-slavery cause and especially in behalf of the fugitive a zeal that absorbed all the powers of her noble nature was a perpetual rebuke to the comparative coldness and indifference of those around her we well remember how her soul was fired with a righteous indignation when upwards of thirty innocent persons most of them colored people were thrown into prison at philadelphia upon a charge of treason for their alleged participation in the tragedy at christiana day after day did she visit the prisoners in their cells to minister to their wants and cheer them in their sorrow and during the progress of hanway's trial her constant presence in the courtroom and her frequent interviews with the district attorney attested her deep anxiety as to the result of the impending struggle when we last saw her about a month since she was engaged in collecting a large sum of money to ransom a family of slaves whose peculiar condition had enlisted her deepest sympathy notwithstanding her age and infirmities she had enlisted in this work with a zeal which even in a younger person would have been remarkable for many days perhaps for many weeks she went from door to door asking for the means whereby to secure the freedom and the happiness of an enslaved and plundered household as a member of the society of friends she lamented the guilty supineness of that body in regard to the question of slavery and often in its meetings as well as in private intercourse felt herself constrained to utter the language of expostulation and rebuke in this as in other relations of life she was obedient to the revelation of god in her own soul and a worthy example of fidelity to her convictions of duty her stepson j wilson moore in a letter to us announcing her decease says among the last injunctions she gave was quote, write to oliver johnson and tell him i die firm in the faith mind the slave she had enjoyed excellent health the last few years and continued actively engaged in works of benevolence during the last few weeks she had devoted much time and labor to the collection of funds for the liberation of ten slaves in north carolina who had been promised their freedom at a comparatively small amount notwithstanding her great bodily suffering her mind was clear to the last expressing her full assurance of divine approbation in the course she had taken this is all that we can now say of the life of our revered and never to be forgotten friend perhaps some one who knew her more intimately than we did and who is better acquainted with the history of her life and labors will furnish us with a more complete sketch if so we shall publish it with great satisfaction happy i happy let her ashes rest her heart was honest and she did her best in storm and darkness evil and dismay 
the star of duty was her guiding ray her injunction to mind the slave comes to us as the dying admonition of one whose life was a beautiful exemplification of the duty and the privilege thus enjoined it imposes indeed no new obligation but coming from such a source it will linger in our memory while life and its scenes shall last inspiring in us we hope a purer and more ardent devotion to the cause of freedom and humanity and may we not hope that others also will catch a new inspiration from the dying message of our departed friend mind the slave end of section two Section 3 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 3. Portraits and Sketches, Abigail Goodwin. Contemporary with Esther Moore, and likewise an intimate personal friend of hers, Abigail Goodwin of Salem, New Jersey, was one of the rare, true friends to the Underground Railroad, whose labors entitle her name to be mentioned in terms of very high praise. A. W. M., a most worthy lady, in a letter to a friend, refers to her in the following language. From my long residence under the same roof, I learned to know well her uncommon self-sacrifice of character, and to be willing and glad whenever in my power to honor her memory. But yet I should not know what further to say about her than to give a very few words of testimony to her life of ceaseless and active benevolence, especially toward the colored people. Her life, outwardly, was wholly uneventful, as she lived out her whole life of seventy-three years in the neighborhood of her birthplace. With regard to her portrait, which was solicited for this volume, the same lady thus writes, No friend of hers would for a moment think of permitting that miserable caricature, the only picture existing meant to represent her, to be given to the public. I cannot even bear to give a place in my little album to so mournful and ridiculous a misrepresentation of her in face. You wonder why her sister, E., my loved and faithful friend, seems to be so much less known among anti-slavery people than Abby? One reason is that, although dear Betsy's interest in the subject was quite equal in earnestness, it was not quite so absorbingly exclusive. Betsy economized greatly in order to give to the cause, but Abby denied herself even necessary apparel, and Betsy has often said that few beggars came to our doors whose garments were so worn, forlorn, and patched up as Abby's. Giving to the colored people was a perfect passion with her. Consequently, she was known as a larger giver than Betsy. Another and greater reason why she was more known abroad than her sister E. was that she wrote with facility, and corresponded at intervals with many on these matters, Mr. McKim and others, and for many years. Abigail was emphatically of the type of the poor widow who cast in all her living. She worked for the slave as a mother would work for her children. Her highest happiness and pleasure in life seemed to be derived from rendering acts of kindness to the oppressed. Letters of sympathy accompanied with bags of stockings, clothing, and donations of money were not unfrequent from her. New Jersey contained a few well-tried friends, both within and without the Society of Friends, to which Miss Goodwin belonged. But among them all, none was found to manifest, at least in the Underground Railroad of Philadelphia, such an abiding interest as a co-worker in the cause, as did Abigail Goodwin. The sympathy which characterized her actions is clearly evinced in her own words as contained in the appended extracts from her letter as follows dear friend i sent e m esther moore forty one dollars more by half than i expected to when i set about it i expect that abolitionists there are all opposed to buying slaves and will not give anything i don't like buying them or giving money to slaveholders either but this seems to be a peculiar case can be had so cheap and so many young ones that would be separated from their parents slavery is peculiarly hard for children that cannot do anything to protect themselves nor can their parents and the old too it is hard for them but it is a terrible thing altogether the case of the fugitive thee mentioned was indeed truly affecting it makes one ashamed as well as sad to read such things that human beings or any other beings should be so treated i cannot but hope and believe that slavery will ere long cease i have a strong impression that the colored people and the women are to have a day of prosperity and triumph over their oppressors we must patiently wait and quietly hope but not keep too much in the quiet shall have to work our deliverance from bondage who would be free themselves must strike the blow 
I regret very much that I have not more clothing to send than the stockings. I have not had time since I thought of it to make anything. Am ashamed that I was so inconsiderate of the poor runaways. I will go to work as soon as I have earned money to buy materials, have managed so as to spend my little annual allowance in nine months, and shall not be able to give you any money for some months. But if more stockings are wanted, let me know. Our benevolent society have plenty on hand, and I have some credit, if not money. They will trust me till I have. They furnish work for poor women and sell it. I get them for fifty cents a pair. My sister says Lucretia, Mott, told her that there was not much clothing in the trunk, only a few old things. I think she told me there was nothing in it. She meant, I suppose, of any consequence. I should like to know if the fugitives are mostly large. I have an idea they are generally small in stature, that slavery stunts the body as well as the mind. I want to know in regard to the clothes that I intend making. It's best to have them fit as well as can be. I shall work pretty much for women. I hope and expect that there are many friends of the cause who furnish clothing in the city. They ought to be fitted out for Canada with strong, warm clothing in cold weather, and their sad fate alleviated as much as can be. The forty-one dollars referred to in the above letter and sent to E. M. was to go especially towards buying an interesting family of ten slaves who were owned in North Carolina by a slaveholder whose rare liberality was signalized by offering to take one thousand dollars for the lot, young and old. In this exceptional case, while opposed to buying slaves, in common with abolitionists generally, she was too tender-hearted to resist the temptation so long as they could be bought so cheap. To rid men of their yoke was her chief desire. Such was her habit of making the sad lot of a slave a personal matter that let her view him in any light whatever, whether in relation to young ones that would be separated from their parents, or with regard to the old, the life of a slave was peculiarly hard, a terrible thing in her judgment. The longer she lived, and the more faithfully she labored for the slave's deliverance, the more firmly she became rooted in the soul-encouraging idea that slavery will ere long cease. Whilst the great masses were either blind or indifferent, she was nerved by this faith to bear cheerfully all the sacrifices she was called on to make. From another letter we copy as follows. January twenty fifth, 1855. Dear Friend, the enclosed ten dollars I have made, earned in two weeks, and of course it belongs to the slave. It may go for the fugitives or Carolina slaves, whichever needs it most. I am sorry the fugitives' treasury is not better supplied, if money could flow into it as it does into the tract fund, but that is not to be expected. The answer in regard to impostors is quite satisfactory. No doubt you take great pains to arrive at the truth, but cannot at all times avoid being imposed on. Will that little boy of seven years have to travel on foot to Canada? there will be no safety for him here. I hope his father will get off. John Hill writes very well, considering his few advantages. If plenty of good schools could be established in Canada for the benefit of fugitives, many bright scholars and useful citizens would be added to society. I hope these will be in process of time. It takes the most energetic and intelligent to make their way out of bondage from the most southern states. It is rather a wonder to me that so many can escape. The masters are so continually watching them. The poor man that secreted himself so long must, indeed, have suffered dreadfully, and been exceedingly resolute to brave dangers so long. It was so characteristic of her to take an interest in everything that pertained to the Underground Railroad, that even the deliverance of a little nameless boy was not beneath her notice. To her mind, his freedom was just as dear to him as if he had been the son of the President of the United States. How they got on in Canada and the question of education were matters that concerned her deeply, Hence, occasional letters received from Canada, evincing marked progress, such as the hero John H. Hill was in the habit of writing, always gave her much pleasure to peruse. In the Wheeler slave case, in which Passmore Williamson and others were engaged, her interest was very great. From a letter dated Salem, September 9, 1855, we quote the subjoined extract. Dear friend, I am truly rejoiced and thankful that the right has triumphed, but stranger had it been otherwise in your intelligent community where it must be apparent to all who inquire into it that you had done nothing but what was deserving of high commendation instead of blame and punishment, and shame on the jury who would bring in the two men guilty of assault and battery. They ought to have another trial, perhaps another jury would be more just. It is well for the credit of Philadelphia that there is one upright judge, as Kelly seems to be and his sentence will be a light one, it is presumed, showing he considered the charge a mere pretense. I hope and trust that neither thyself nor the other men will have much, if any, of the expense to bear. Your lawyers will not charge anything, I suppose, and the good citizens will pay all else. 
It seems there are hopes entertained that Passmore Williamson will soon be set at liberty. It must be a great comfort to him and wife in their trials that it will conduce to the furtherance of the good cause. If Philadelphians are not aroused now after this great stretch of power to consider their safety, they must be a stupid set of people, but it must certainly do good. You will take good care of Jane Johnson, I hope, and not let her get kidnapped back to slavery. Is it safe for her to remain in your city or anywhere else in our free land? I have some doubts and fears for her. Do try to impress her with the necessity of being very cautious and careful against deceivers, pretended friends. She had better be off to Canada pretty soon. Thy wife must not sit up washing and ironing all night again. She ought to have help in her sympathy and labors for the poor fugitives, and I should think there are many there who would willingly assist her. I intended to be careful of trespassing upon thy time, as thee must have enough to do. The fugitives are still coming, I expect. With kind regards, also to thy wife, your friend, A. Goodwin. In another letter she suggests the idea of getting up a committee of women to provide clothing for fugitive females. On this point she wrote thus. Salem, 8th month, 1st. Would it not be well to set up a committee of women to provide clothes for fugitive females? A dozen women sewing a day, or even half a day, of each week, might keep a supply always ready. They might, I should think, get the merchants or some of them to give cheap materials, mention it to thy wife, and see if she cannot get up a society. I will do what I can here for it. I enclose five dollars for the use of fugitives. It was a good while that I heard nothing of your railroad concerns. I expected thee had gone to Canada, or has the journey not been made, or is it yet to be accomplished, or given up? I was in hopes thee would go and see with thine own eyes how things go on in that region of fugitives, and if it's a goodly land to live in. This is the first of August, and I suppose you are celebrating it in Philadelphia, or some of you are, though I believe you are not quite as zealous as the Bostonians are in doing it. When will our first of August come? Oh, that it might be soon, very soon. It's high time the reign of oppression was over. Ever alive to the work, she would appeal to such as were able among her friends to take stock in the Underground Railroad, and would sometimes succeed. In a letter dated July 30, 1856, she thus alludes to her efforts. I have tried to beg something for them, but have not got much. One of our neighbors, S. W. Acton, gave me three dollars for them. I added enough to make ten, which thee will find inside. I shall owe three more, and make my ten. I presume they are still coming every day almost, and I fear it comes rather hard on thee and wife to do for so many, but you no doubt feel it a satisfaction to do all you can for the poor sufferers. February tenth, 1858, she forwarded her willing contribution, with the following interesting remarks. Salem, February tenth, 1858. Dear friend, thee will find enclosed five dollars for the fugitives, a little for so many to share it, but better than nothing. Oh, that people, rich people, would remember them instead of spending so much on themselves, and those two who are not called rich might, if there was only a willing mind, give two of their abundance. How can they forbear to sympathize with those poor destitute ones? But so it is. There is not half the feeling for them there ought to be. Indeed, scarcely anybody seems to think about them. Inasmuch as ye have not done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have not done it unto me. Thy friend, A. Goodwin. When the long-looked-for day of emancipation arrived, which she had never expected to witness, the unbounded thankfulness of her heart found expression in the appended letter. Salem, September 23, 1862 Dear friend, thy letter, dated 17th, was not received till last night. I cannot tell where it has been detained so long. On the 22nd, yesterday, Amy Reckless came here, after I began writing, and wished me to defer sending for a day or two, thinking she could get a few more dollars, and she has just brought some, and will try for more, and clothing. A thousand thanks to President Hamlin for his kindness to the contrabands. Poor people! How deplorable their situation! Where will they go when cold weather comes? So many of them to find homes for, but they must and will, I trust, be taken care of, not by their former caretakers, though. I have read the President's proclamation of emancipation with thankfulness and rejoicing, but upon a little reflection I did not feel quite satisfied with it. Three months seems a long time to be in the power of their angry and cruel masters, who, no doubt, will wreak all their fury and vengeance upon them, killing and abusing them in every way they can, and sell them to Cuba if they can. It makes me sad to think of it. Slavery, I fear, will be a long time in dying, after receiving the fatal stroke. What do abolitionists think of it, and what is thy opinion? I feel quite anxious to know something more about it. The daily press says it will end the war in its cause. 
how can we be thankful enough if it should and soon too oh praise and thanks what a blessing for our country i never expected to see the happy day if thee answers this thee will please tell me all about it and what is thought of it by the wise ones but i ought not to intrude on thy time thee has so much on thy hands nor ask thee to write i shall know in time if i can be patient to wait enclosed are seventeen dollars from amy reckless one dollar fifty cents j bassett one dollar jesse bond one dollar martha reeve one dollar s woodnut one dollar hannah wheeler one dollar a colored man twenty-five cents twenty-five cents thrown in to make it even a g ten dollars amy is very good in helping and is collecting clothing which she thinks cannot be sent till next week i will attend to sending it as soon as can be by stage driver may every success attend thy labors for the poor sufferers with kind regards thy friend a goodwin thus until the last fetter was broken with singular persistency zeal faith and labor she did what she could to aid the slave without hope of reward in this world not only did she contribute to aid the fugitives but was for years a regular and liberal contributor to the pennsylvania anti-slavery society as well as a subscriber to the anti-slavery papers the liberator national anti-slavery standard pennsylvania freeman etc having seen with joy the desire of her heart in the final emancipation of every bondman in the united states she departed in peace november second eighteen sixty seven in the seventy-fourth year of her age end of section three recording by denise nordell modesto california section four of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The Underground Railroad, Part 5 By William Still Section 4 Portraits and Sketches Thomas Garrett, Part 1 The recent death of Thomas Garrett, called forth from the press, as well as from abolitionists and personal friends, such universal expressions of respect for his labors as a philanthropist and especially as an unswerving friend of the underground railroad that we need only reproduce selections therefrom in order to commemorate his noble deeds in these pages from the wilmington daily commercial published by jenkins and atkinson men fully inspired with the spirit of impartial freedom we copy the following notice which is regarded by his relatives and intimate anti-slavery friends as a faithful portraiture of his character and labors thomas garrett who died full of years and honor this morning at the ripe age of eighty-one was a man of no common character he was an abolitionist from his youth up and though the grand old cause numbered amongst its supporters poets sages and statesmen it had no more faithful worker in its ranks than thomas garrett he has been suffering for several years from a disease of the bladder which frequently caused him most acute anguish and several times threatened his life the severe pain attending the disease and the frequent surgical operations it rendered necessary undermined his naturally strong constitution so that when he was prostrated by his last illness grave fears were entertained of a fatal result he continued in the possession of his faculties to the last and frequently expressed his entire willingness to die yesterday he was found to be sinking very rapidly just before midnight last night he commenced to speak and some of those in attendance went close to his bedside he was evidently in some pain and said it is all peace 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 but no rest this side of the river he then breathed calmly on for some time about half an hour later one of those in attendance ceased to hear his breathing and bending over him found that his soul had fled he retained a good deal of his strength through his illness and was able to get up from his bed every day with the assistance of one person 
He will be buried in the friend's graveyard, corner of 4th and West Streets, on Saturday next, at 3 o'clock p.m., and in accordance with a written memorandum of an agreement made by him a year ago with them, the colored people will bear him to his grave, they having solicited of him that honor. He was born of Quaker parents in Upper Darby, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, on the 21st of August, 1789, on a farm still in the possession of the family. His father, though a farmer, had been a scythe and edge tool maker, and Thomas learned of him the trade, and his knowledge of it afterwards proved of the utmost advantage to him. He grew up and married at Darby, his wife being Sarah Sharpless, and in 1820 they came to Wilmington to live, bringing with them several children, most of whom still live here. Some years after his arrival here, his wife died, and in course of time he again married, his second wife being Rachel Mendenhall, who died in April 1868, beloved and regretted by all who knew her. His business career was one of vicissitude, but generally and ultimately successful, for he made the whole of the comfortable competence of which he died possessed, after he was sixty years of age. While in the beginning of his business career, as an iron merchant in this city, a wealthy rival house attempted to crush him by reducing prices of iron to cost. But Mr. Garrett, nothing dismayed, employed another person to attend his store, put on his leather apron, took to his anvil, and in the prosecution of his trade, as an edge tool maker, prepared to support himself as long as this ruinous rivalry was kept up. Thus in the sweat of the brow of one of the heroes and philanthropists of this age was laid the foundation of one of the most extensive business houses that our city now boasts. His competitor saw that no amount of rivalry could crush a man thus self-supporting, and gave up the effort. Of course, Thomas Garrett is best known for his labors in behalf of the abolition of slavery, and is a practical and effective worker for emancipation, long before the nation commenced the work of liberation and justice. Born a Quaker, he held with simple trust the faith of the society that God moves and inspires men to do the work he requires of their hands, and throughout his life he never wavered in his conviction that his father had called him to work in the cause to which he devoted himself. His attention was first directed to the iniquity of slavery, while he was a young man of twenty-four or twenty-five. He returned one day to his father's house, after a brief absence, and found the family dismayed and indignant at the kidnapping of a colored woman in their employ. Thomas immediately resolved to follow the kidnappers, and so started in pursuit. Some peculiarity about the track made by their wagon enabled him to trace them with ease, and he followed them by a devious course from Darby to a place near the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, and then by inquiries, etc., tracked them to Kensington, where he found them, and, we believe, secured the woman's release. During this ride he afterwards assured his friends he felt the iniquity and abomination of the whole system of slavery borne in upon his mind so strongly as to fairly appall him, and he seemed to hear a voice within him, assuring him that his work in life must be to help and defend this persecuted race. From this time forward he never failed to assist any fugitive from slavery on the way to freedom, and, of course, after his removal to this city, his opportunities for this were greatly increased, and in course of time his house became known as one of the refuges for fugitives. The sentiment of this community was, at that time, bitterly averse to any word or effort against slavery, and Mr. Garrett had but half a dozen friends who stood by him. Nearly all others looked at him with suspicion, or positive aversion, and his house was constantly under the surveillance of the police, who then, sad to say, were always on the watch for any fugitives from bondage. Thomas was not disheartened or dismayed by the lack of popular sympathy or approval. He believed the Lord was on his side, and cared nothing for the adverse opinion of men. Many and interesting stories are told of the men and women he helped away, some of them full of pathos, 
and some decidedly amusing. He told the latter which related to his ingenious contrivances for assisting fugitives to escape the police with much pleasure in his later years. We would repeat many of them, but this is not the time or place. The necessity of avoiding the police was the only thing, however, which ever forced him into any secrecy in his operations, and in all other respects he was without concealment and without compromise in his opposition to slavery. He was a man of unusual personal bravery and of powerful physique, and did not present an encouraging object for the bullying intimidation by which the pro-slavery men of that day generally overawed their opponents. He seems to have scarcely known what fear was, and though irate slaveholders often called on him to learn the whereabouts of their slaves, he met them placidly, never denied having helped the fugitives on their way, positively refused to give them any information, and when they flourished pistols or bowie knives to enforce their demands, he calmly pushed the weapons aside, and told them that none but cowards resorted to such means to carry their ends. He continued his labors thus for years, helping all who came to him, and making no concealment of his readiness to do so. His firmness and courage slowly won others, first to admire and then to assist him, and the little band of faithful workers, of which he was chief, gradually enlarged, and included in its number men of all ranks and differing creeds, and singular as it may seem, even numbering some ardent Democrats in its ranks. He has, in conversation with the present writer and others, frequently acknowledged the valuable services of two Roman Catholics of Irish birth, still living in this city, who were ever faithful to him, and will now be amongst those who most earnestly mourn his decease. His efforts, of course, brought him much persecution and annoyance, but never culminated in anything really serious, until about the year 1846 or 47. He then met at Newcastle a man, woman, and six children, from down on the eastern shore of Maryland. The man was free, the woman had been a slave, and while in slavery had had by her husband two children. She was then set free, and afterwards had four children. The whole party ran away. They traveled several days, and finally reached Middletown, late at night, where they were taken in, fed and cared for, by John Hunn, a wealthy Quaker there. They were watched, however, by some persons in that section, who followed them, arrested them, and sent them to Newcastle to jail. The sheriff and his daughter were anti-slavery people, and wrote to Mr. Garrett to come over. He went over, had an interview, found from their statement that four of the party were undoubtedly free, and returned to the city. On the following day, he and U.S. Senator Wales went over and had the party taken before Judge Booth on a writ of habeas corpus. Judge Booth decided that there was no evidence on which to hold them, that in the absence of evidence the presumption was always in favor of freedom, and discharged them. Mr. Garrett then said, Here is this woman with a babe at her breast, the child suffering from a white swelling on its leg. Is there any impropriety in my getting a carriage and helping them over to Wilmington? Judge Booth responded, Certainly not. Mr. Garrett then hired the carriage, but gave the driver distinctly to understand that he only paid for the woman and the young children. The rest might walk. They all got in, however, and finally escaped. Of course, the two children born in slavery amongst the rest. Six weeks afterwards, the slaveholders followed them, and incited, it is said, by the Cochrans and James A. Bayard, commenced a suit against Mr. Garrett, claiming all the fugitives as slaves. Mr. Garrett's friends claimed that the jury was packed to secure an adverse verdict. The trial came on before Chief Justice Taney and Judge Hall in the May term, 1848, of the U.S. Court, sitting at Newcastle, Bayard representing the prosecutors, and Wales the defendant. There were four trials in all, lasting three days. We have not room here for the details of the trial, but the juries awarded even heavier damages than the plaintiffs claimed, and the judgment swept away every dollar of his property. When the trials were concluded, Mr. Garrett arose, the court being adjourned, made a speech of an hour to the large crowd in the courtroom, in the course of which he declared his intention 
to redouble his exertions so help him god his bold assertion was greeted with mingled cheers and hisses and at the conclusion of his speech one of the jurors who had convicted him strode across the benches grasped his hand and begged his forgiveness end of section four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section five of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the underground railroad part five by william still section five portraits and sketches thomas garrett part two mr garrett kept his pledge and redoubled his exertions the trial advertised him and such was the demand on him for shelter that he was compelled to put another story on his back buildings his friends helped him to start again in business and commencing anew in his sixtieth year with nothing he again amassed a handsome competence generously contributing all the while to every work in behalf of the downtrodden blacks or his suffering fellow men of any color in time the war came and as he remarked the nation went into the business by the wholesale, so he quit his retail operations having, after he commenced to keep a record, helped off over twenty-one hundred slaves, and no inconsiderable number before that time. In time, too, he came to be honored instead of execrated for his noble efforts. Wilmington became an abolition city, and for once, at least, a prophet was not without honor in his own city. Mr. Garrett continued his interest in every reform up to his last illness, and probably his last appearance in any public capacity, was as president of a woman suffrage meeting in the City Hall a few months ago, which was addressed by Julia Ward Howe, Lucy Stone, and Henry B. Blackwell. He lived to see the realization of his hopes for universal freedom, and in April last, on the occasion of the great parade of the colored people in this city, he was carried through our streets in an open barouche surrounded by the men in whose behalf he had labored so faithfully and the guards around his carriage carrying banners with the inscription our moses a moses he was to their race but unto him it was given to enter into the promised land toward which he had set his face persistently and almost alone for more than half a century he was beloved almost to adoration by his dusky-hued friends and in the dark days of the beginning of the war which every Wilmingtonian will remember with a shudder, in those days of doubt, confusion, and suspicion, without his knowledge or consent, Thomas Garrett's house was constantly surrounded and watched by faithful black men, resolved that, come weal, come woe to them, no harm should come to the benefactor of their race. He was a hero in a lifetime fight, an upright, honest man in his dealings with men, a tender husband, a loving father, and above all, a man who loved his neighbor as himself, and righteousness and truth better than ease, safety, or worldly goods, and who never let any fear of harm to person or property sway him from doing his whole duty to the uttermost. He was faithful among the faithless, upright and just in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, and lived to see his labors rewarded and approved in his own lifetime, and then with joy that the right had triumphed by mightier means than his own, with thankfulness for the past, and with calm trust for the future, he passed to the reward of the just. He has fought a good fight, he has finished his course, he has kept the faith. From the same paper of January 30th, 1871, we extract an account of the funeral obsequies which took place on Saturday, January 28th. Funeral Service on Saturday the funeral of Thomas Garrett, which took place on Saturday, partook almost of the character of a popular ovation to the memory of the deceased, though it was conducted with the plainness of form which characterizes the society of which he was a member. There was no display, no organization, nothing whatever to distinguish this from ordinary funerals, except the outpouring of people of every creed, condition, and color, to follow the remains to their last resting place. There was for an hour or two before the procession started a constant living stream of humanity passing into the house, around the coffin, and out at another door, to take a last look at the face of the deceased, the features of which displayed a sweetness and serenity which occasioned general remark. A smile seemed to play upon the dead lips. Shortly after three o'clock the funeral procession started, the plain coffin, containing the remains, being carried by the stalwart arms of a delegation of colored men, and the family and friends of the deceased following in carriages with a large procession on foot, 
while the sidewalks along the line from the house to the meeting-house more than six squares were densely crowded with spectators the friends meeting-house was already crowded except the place reserved for the relatives of the deceased and though probably fifteen hundred people crowded into the capacious building a greater number still were unable to gain admission the crowd inside was composed of all kinds and conditions of men white and black all uniting to do honor to the character and works of the deceased the coffin was laid in the open space in front of the gallery of ministers and elders and the lid removed from it after which there was a period of silence presently the venerable lucretia mott arose and said that seeing the gathering of the multitude there and thronging along the streets as she had passed on her way to the meeting-house she had thought of the multitude which gathered after the death of jesus and of the remark of the centurion who seeing the people said certainly this was a righteous man looking at this multitude she would say surely this also was a righteous man she was not one of those who thought it best always on occasions like this to speak in eulogy of the dead but this was not an ordinary case and seeing the crowd that had gathered and amongst it the large numbers of a once despised and persecuted race for which the deceased had done so much she felt that it was fit and proper that the good deeds of this man's life should be remembered for the encouragement of others she spoke of her long acquaintance with him of his cheerful and sunny disposition and his firm devotion to the truth as he saw it aaron m powell of new york was the next speaker and he spoke at length with great earnestness of the lifelong labor of his departed friend in the abolition cause of his cheerfulness his courage and his perfect consecration to his work he alluded to the fact that deceased was a member of the society of friends and held firmly to its faith that god leads and inspires men to do the work he requires of them that he speaks within the soul of every man and that all men are equally his children subject to his guidance and that all should be free to follow wherever the spirit might lead it was thomas garrett's recognition of this sentiment that made him an abolitionist and inspired him with the courage to pursue his great work he cared little for the minor details of quakerism but he was a true quaker in his devotion to this great central idea which is the basis on which it rests he urged the society to take a lesson from the deceased and recognizing the responsibility of their position to labor with earnestness and to consecrate their whole beings to the cause of right and reform it is impossible for us to give any fair abstract of mr powell's earnest and eloquent tribute to his friend on whom he had looked as he said as a father in israel from his boyhood william howard day then came forward saying he understood that it would not be considered inappropriate for one of his race to say a few words on this occasion and make some attempt to pay a fitting tribute to one to whom they owed so much he did not feel to-day like paying such a tribute his grief was too fresh upon him his heart too bowed down and he could do no more than in behalf of his race not only those here but the host the deceased had befriended and of the whole four millions to whom he had been so true a friend cast a tribute of praise and thanks upon his grave rev alfred cookman of grace m e church next arose and said that he came there intending to say nothing but the scene moved him to a few words he remembered once standing in front of st paul's cathedral in london and seeing therein the name of the architect sir christopher wren inscribed and under it this inscription stranger if you would see his monument look about you and the thought came to him that if you would see the monument of him who lies there look about you and see it built in stones of living hearts he thanked god for the works of this man he thanked him especially for his noble character he said that he felt that the body had been the temple of a noble spirit i the temple of god himself and some day they would meet the spirit in the heavenly land beyond the grave lucretia mott arose and said she feared the claim might appear to be made that quakerism alone held the great central principle which dominated this man's life but she wished it understood that they recognized this voice within as leading and guiding all men and they probably meant by it much the same as those differing from them meant by the third person in their trinity she did not wish even in appearance to claim a belief in this voice for her own sect alone t clarkson taylor then said that the time for closing the services had arrived and in a very few words commended the lesson of his life to those present after which the meeting dissolved and the body was carried to the graveyard in the rear of the meeting-house and deposited in its last resting-place the trial of the cases eighteen forty eight to the editor of the commercial 
your admirable and interesting sketch of the career of the late thomas garrett contains one or two statements which according to my recollection of the facts are not entirely accurate and are perhaps of sufficient importance to be corrected the proceedings in the u s circuit court were not public prosecutions or indictments but civil suits instituted by the owners of the runaway slaves who employed and paid counsel to conduct them an act of congress then in force imposed a penalty of five hundred dollars on any person who should knowingly harbor or conceal a fugitive from labor to be recovered by and for the benefit of the claimant of such fugitive in any court proper to try the same saving moreover to the claimant his right of action for or on account of loss etc thus giving to the slave owner two cases for action for each fugitive one of debt for the penalty and one of trespass for damages there were in all seven slaves only the husband and father of the family being free who escaped under the friendly help and guidance of mr garrett five of whom were claimed by e n turner and the remaining two by c t glanding both claimants being residents of maryland in the suits for the penalties turner obtained judgment for twenty five hundred dollars and glanding for one thousand dollars in these cases the jury could give neither less nor more than the amount of the penalties on the proper proof being made nor in the trespass case did the jury give larger damages than were claimed a jury sometimes does queer things but it cannot make a verdict for a greater sum than the plaintiff demands in the trespass cases glanding had a verdict for one thousand dollars damages but in turner's case only nine hundred dollars were allowed though the plaintiff sued for twenty five hundred it is hardly true to say that any one of the juries was packed indeed it would have been a difficult matter in that day for the marshal to summon thirty sober honest and judicious men fairly and impartially chosen from the three counties of delaware who would have found verdicts different from those which were rendered the jury must have been fixed for the defendant to have secured any other result on the supposition that the testimony admitted of any doubt or question the anti-slavery men in the state being like virgil's shipwrecked mariners very few in number and scattered over a vast space what most redounds to the honor and praise of mr garrett in this transaction as a noble and disinterested philanthropist is that after the fugitives had been discharged from custody under the writ of habeas corpus and when he had been advised by his lawyer who was also his personal friend to keep his hands off and let the party work their own passage to a haven of freedom not then far distant or he might be involved in serious trouble he deliberately refused to abandon them to the danger of pursuit and capture the welfare and happiness of too many human beings were at stake to permit him to think of personal consequences and he was ready and dared to encounter any risk for himself so that he could ensure the safety of those fleeing from bondage it was this heroic purpose to protect the weak and helpless at any cost this fearless unselfish action not stopping to weigh the contingencies of individual gain or loss that constitutes his best title to the gratitude of those he served and to the admiration and respect of all who can appreciate independent conduct springing from pure and lofty motives he did what he thought and believed to be right and let the consequences take care of themselves he never would directly or otherwise entice a slave to leave his master but he never would refuse his aid to the hunted panting wretch that in the pursuit of happiness was seeking after liberty and who among us is now bold enough to say that in all this he did not see clearly act bravely do justly and live up to the spirit of the sacred text whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them end of section five recording by denise nordell of modesto california Section 6 of The Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 5. By William Still section six portraits and sketches thomas garrett part three in a letter addressed to one of the sons william lloyd garrison pays the following beautiful and just tribute to his faithfulness in the cause of freedom boston january twenty fifth eighteen seventy one my dear friend I have received the intelligence of the death of your honored and revered father with profound emotions. 
if it were not for the inclemency of the weather and the delicate state of my health i would hasten to be at the funeral long as the distance is not indeed as a mourner for in view of his ripe old age and singularly beneficent life there is no cause for sorrow but to express the estimation in which i held him as one of the best men who ever walked the earth and one of the most beloved among my numerous friends and co-workers in the cause of an oppressed and downtrodden race now happily rejoicing in their heavenly wrought deliverance for to no one was the language of job more strictly applicable than to himself when the ear heard me then it blessed me and when the eye saw me it gave witness to me because i delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and i caused the widow's heart to sing for joy i put on righteousness and it clothed me my judgment was as a robe and a diadem i was eyes to the blind and feet was i to the lame i was a father to the poor and the cause which i knew not i searched out and i break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth this is an exact portraiture of your father a most comprehensive delineation of his character as a philanthropist and reformer it was his meat and drink the poor to feed the lost to seek the proffer life to death hope to the erring to the weak the strength of his own faith to plead the captive's right to remove the sting of hate from law and soften in the fire of love the hardened steel of war he walked the dark world in the mild still guidance of the light in tearful tenderness a child a strong man in the right did there ever live one who had less of that fear of man which bringeth a snare than himself or who combined more moral courage with exceeding tenderness of spirit or who adhered more heroically to his convictions of duty in the face of deadly peril and certain suffering or who gave himself more unreservedly or with greater disinterestedness to the service of bleeding humanity or who took more joyfully the spoiling of his goods as the penalty of his sympathy for the hunted fugitive or who more untiringly kept pace with all the progressive movements of the age as though in the very freshness of adult life while venerable with years or who as a husband father friend citizen or neighbor more nobly performed all the duties or more generally distributed all the charities of life he will leave a great void in the community such a stalwart soul appears only at rare intervals delaware enslaved treated him like a felon delaware redeemed will be proud of his memory only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in the dust his rightful place is conspicuously among the benefactors saviors martyrs of the human race his career was full of dramatic interest from beginning to end and crowded with the experiences and vicissitudes of a most eventful nature what he promised he fulfilled what he attempted he seldom or never failed to accomplish what he believed he dared to proclaim upon the housetop what he ardently desired and incessantly labored for was the reign of universal freedom peace and righteousness he was among the manliest of men and the gentlest of spirits there was no form of human suffering that did not touch his heart but his abounding sympathy was especially drawn out towards the poor imbruted slaves of the plantation and such of their number as sought their freedom by flight the thousands that passed safely through his hands on their way to canada in the north will never forget his fatherly solicitude for their welfare or the dangers he unflinchingly encountered in their behalf stripped of all his property under the fugitive slave law for giving them food shelter and assistance to continue their flight he knew not what it was to be intimidated or disheartened but gave himself to the same blessed work as though conscious of no loss great-hearted philanthropist what heroism could exceed thy own for while the jurist sitting with the slave whip o'er him swung from the tortured truths of freedom the lie of slavery wrung and the solemn priest to moloch on each god-deserted shrine broke the bondsman heart for bread poured the bondsman's blood for wine 
while the multitude in blindness to a far-off saviour knelt and spurned the while the temple where a present saviour dwelt thou beheldst him in the task field in the prison shadow dim in thy mercy to the bondman it was mercy unto him i trust some one well qualified to execute the pleasing task will write his biography for the grand lessons his life inculcated yours in full sympathy and trust william lloyd garrison a contemporary who had known him long and intimately who had appreciated his devotion to freedom who had shared with him some of the perils consequent upon aiding the fleeing fugitives and who belonged to the race with whom garrett sympathized and for whose elevation and freedom he labored so assiduously with an overflowing heart of tender regard and sympathy pen the following words touching the sad event chatham c w january thirtieth eighteen seventy one to mr henry garrett dear sir i have just heard through the kindness of my friend mrs graves of the death of your dear father the intelligence makes me feel sad and sorrowful i sincerely sympathize with you and all your brothers and sisters in your mournful bereavement but you do not mourn without hope for you have an assurance in his death that your loss is his infinite gain for he was a good christian a good husband a good father a good citizen and a truly good samaritan for his heart his hand and his purse were ever open to the wants of suffering humanity wherever he found it irrespective of the country religion or complexion of the sufferer hence there are many more who mourn his loss as well as yourselves and i know verily that many a silent tear was shed by his fellow citizens both white and colored when he took his departure especially the colored ones for he loved them with a brother's love not because they were colored but because they were oppressed and like john brown he loved them to the last that was manifest by his request that they should be his bearers i can better feel than i have language to express the mournful and sorrowing pride that must have stirred the inmost souls of these men of color who had the honor conferred on them of bearing his mortal remains to their last resting place when they thought of what a sacred trust was committed to their hands we are told to mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace and such was the end of your dear father and he has gone to join the innumerable company of the spirits of the just made perfect on the other side of the river where there is a rest remaining for all the children of god my brother abraham d shad and my sister amelia join their love and condolence with mine to you all hoping that the virtues of your father may be a guiding star to you all until you meet him again in that happy place where parting will be no more forever your humble friend elizabeth j williams from the learned and the unlearned from those in high places and from those in humble stations many testimonials reached the family respecting this great friend of the slave but it is doubtful whether a single epistle from any one was more affectingly appreciated by the bereaved family than the epistle just quoted from elizabeth j williams the slave's most eloquent advocate wendell phillips in the national standard of february four eighteen seventy one in honor of the departed bore the following pertinent testimony to his great worth in the cause of liberty i should not dare to trust my memory for the number of fugitive slaves this brave old friend has helped to safety and freedom nearly three thousand i believe what a rich life to look back on how skilful and adroit he was in eluding the hunters how patient in waiting days and weeks keeping the poor fugitives hidden meanwhile till it was safe to venture on the highway what whole-hearted devotion what unselfish giving of time means and everything else to his work of brotherly love what house in delaware so honorable in history as that where hunted men fled and were sure to find refuge it was the north star to many a fainting heart this century has grand scenes to show and boast of among its fellows but few transcend that auction block where the sheriff was selling all garrett's goods for the crime of giving a breakfast to a family of fugitive slaves as the sale closed the officer turns to garrett saying thomas i hope you'll never be caught at this again friend was the reply 
I haven't a dollar in the world, but if thee knows a fugitive who needs a breakfast, send him to me. Over such a scene, Luther and Howard and Clarkson clapped their hands. Such a speech redeems the long infamy of the state. It is endurable, the having of such a blot as Delaware in our history, when it has once been the home of such a man. I remember well the just pride with which he told me that after that sale, pro-slavery as Wilmington was, he could have a discount at the bank as readily as any man in the city. Though the laws robbed him, his fellow citizens could not but respect and trust him, love and honor him. The city has never had, we believe, a man die in it worthy of a statue. We advise it to seize this opportunity to honor itself and perpetuate the good name of its worthiest citizen by immortalizing some street, spot, shaft, or building with his name. Brave, generous, high-souled, sturdy, outspoken friend of all that needed aid or sympathy, farewell for these scenes. In times to come, when friendless men and hated ideas need champions, God grant them as gallant and successful ones as you have been, and may the state you honored grow worthy of you. Wendell Phillips Likewise, in the National Standard, the editor, Aaron M. Powell, who attended the funeral, paid the following glowing tribute to the moral, religious, and anti-slavery character of the slave's friend. On the 24th instant, Thomas Garrett, in his 82nd year, passed on to the higher life. A week previous, we had visited him in his sick chamber, and, on leaving him, felt that he must go hence ere long. He was the same strong, resolute man in spirit to the last. He looked forward to the welcome change with perfect serenity and peace of mind, and well he might, for he had indeed fought the good fight and been faithful unto the end. He was most widely known for his services to fugitive slaves. Twenty-five hundred and forty-five he had preserved a record of, and he had assisted somewhat more than two hundred prior to the commencement of the record. Picture to the mind's eye this remarkable procession of nearly three thousand men, women, and children fleeing from slavery, and finding in this brave, large-hearted man a friend equal to their needs in so critical an emergency. No wonder he was feared by the slaveholders, not alone of his own state, but of the whole South. If their human chattels once reached his outpost, there was indeed little hope of their reclamation. The friend and helper of fugitives from slavery truly their moses he was more than this he was the discriminating outspoken uncompromising opponent of slavery itself he was one of the strongest pillars and one of the most efficient working members of the american anti-slavery society he was an abolitionist of the most radical and pronounced character though a resident of a slave state and through all the period wherein to be an abolitionist was to put in jeopardy not only reputation and property but life itself Though he rarely addressed public meetings, his presence imparted much strength to others, was weighty in the best Quaker sense. He was of the rare type of character, represented by Francis Jackson and James Mott. Thomas Garrett was a member of the Society of Friends, and as such, served by the striking contrast of his own life and character, with the average of the Society, to exemplify to the world the real, genuine Quakerism. It is not at all to the credit of his fellow members that it must be said of them that when he was bearing the cross and doing the work for which he is now so universally honored, they, many of them, were not only not in sympathy with him, but would undoubtedly, if they had the requisite vitality and courage, have cut him off from their denominational fellowship. He was a sincere, earnest believer in the cardinal point of Quakerism, the divine presence in the human soul. This furnishes the key to his action through life. This divine attribute he regarded not as the birthright of friends alone, not of one race, sex, or class, but of all mankind. Therefore was he an abolitionist. Therefore was he interested in the cause of the Indians. Therefore was he enlisted in the cause of equal rights for women. Therefore was he a friend of temperance, of oppressed and needy working men and women, worldwide in the scope of his philanthropic sympathy and broadly catholic and comprehensive in his views of religious life and duty he was the soul of honor and business his experience when deprived at sixty of every dollar of his property for having obeyed god rather than man in assisting fugitives from slavery and the promptness with which his friends came forward with proffered cooperation 
furnishes a lesson which all should ponder well. He had little respect for, or patient with shams of any kind, in religious, political, or social life. As we looked upon Thomas Garrett's calm, serene face, mature in a ripe old age, still shadowing forth kindliness of heart, firmness of purpose, discriminating intelligence, conscientious, manly uprightness, death never seemed more beautiful. Why, what is death but life, in other forms of being? Life without, the coarser attributes of men, the dull and momently decaying frame which holds, the ethereal spirit in, and binds its down. To brotherhood with brutes, there is no such thing as death, but so called is but the beginning of a new existence, a fresh segment of the eternal round of change. A. M. P. End of Section 6 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 7 of the Underground Railroad Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Underground Railroad Part 5 by William Still Section seven portraits and sketches thomas garrett part four another admirer of this great lover of humanity in a letter to george w stone thus alludes to his life and death taunton mass june twenty fifth 1871 dear stone your telegram announcing the death of that old soldier and saint and my good friend thomas garrett reached me last evening at ten o'clock my first impulse was to start for wilmington and be present at his funeral but when i considered my work here and my engagements for the next four days i found it impossible to go i will be there in spirit and bow my inmost soul before the all-loving one his father and ours in humble thankfulness that i ever knew him and had the privilege of enjoying his friendship and witnessing his devotion to the interest of every good cause of benevolence and reform i could write you many things of interest which i heard from him and which i have noted on my memory and heart but i cannot now i think he was one of the remarkable men of the times in faith in holy boldness in fearless devotion to the right in uncompromising integrity in unselfish benevolence in love to god and man and in unceasing lifelong efforts to do justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with god we shall not soon look upon his like again if i was present at his funeral i should take it as a privilege to pronounce his name and say as i never said before blessed are the dead that die in the lord even so saith the spirit for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them do at once see his children and Clarkson Taylor, and give them my condolence. No, my congratulations, and assure them that they have a rich legacy in his noble life, and he has a glorious reward in the bosom of God. Peace to his memory, noble old man, so pure and peaceful, and yet so strong, firm and fearless 
so gentle, tender, and truthful, afraid and ashamed of nothing but sin, and in love and labor with every good work. I could write on and fill many pages, but he desired no eulogy and needs none. He lives and will live for ever in many hearts and in the heaven of heavens above. T. Israel If it were necessary, we might continue to introduce scores of editorials, communications, epistles, etc., all breathing a similar spirit of respect for the rare worth of this wonderful man, but space forbids. In conclusion, therefore, with a view of presenting him in the light of his own interesting letters, written when absorbed in his peculiar work from a large number on file, the following are submitted. Wilmington, 11th month, 21st day, 1855. Esteemed friend, William Still, thine of this date, inquiring for the twenty-one, and how they have been disposed of, has just been received. I can only answer by saying, when I parted with them yesterday afternoon, I gave the wife of the person in whose house they were money to pay her expenses to Philadelphia and back in the cars to pilot the four women to thy place. I gave her husband money to pay a pilot to start yesterday with the ten men divided in two gangs also a letter for thee. I hope they have arrived safe ere this. I had to leave town soon after noon yesterday to attend a brother ill with an attack of apoplexy, and today have been very much engaged. The place they stayed here is a considerable distance off, I will make inquiry tomorrow morning, and in case any other disposition has been made of them than the above, I will write thee. I should think they have stopped today in consequence of the rain, and most likely will arrive safe tomorrow. In haste, thy friend, Thomas Garrett although having to attend a brother ill with an attack of apoplexy garrett took time to attend to the interest of the twenty-one as the above letter indicates how many other men in the united states under similar circumstances would have been thus faithful on another occasion deeply concerned for a forwarder of slaves he wrote thus wilmington twelfth month twenty-sixth day eighteen fifty five esteemed friend william still the bearer of this george wilmer is a slave whose residence is in maryland he is a true man and a forwarder of slaves has passed some twenty-five within four months. He is desirous of finding some of his relations, William Mann and Thomas Carmichael. They passed here about a month since. If thee can give him any information where they can be found, thee will much oblige him and run no risk of their safety in so doing. I remain, as ever, thy sincere friend, Thomas Garrett. Four able-bodied men form the subject of the subjoined correspondence. Wilmington, 11th month, 4th day, 1856. Esteemed friends, J. Miller McKim and William Still, 
Captain F. has arrived here this day with four able-bodied men. One is an engineer and has been engaged in sawing lumber, a second a good house carpenter, a third a blacksmith, and the fourth a farmhand. They are now five hundred miles from their home in Carolina and would be glad to get situations without going far from here. I will keep them till tomorrow. Please inform me where thee knows of a suitable place in the country where the mechanics can find employment at their trades for the winter. Let me hear tomorrow and oblige your friend, Thomas Garrett. What has become of Harriet Tubman, agent of the Underground Railroad, is made a subject of special inquiry in the following note. Wilmington, third month, 27th day, 1857 esteemed friend william still i have been very anxious for some time to hear what has become of harriet tubman the last i heard of her she was in the state of new york on her way to canada with some friends last fall has thee seen or heard anything of her lately it would be a sorrowful fact if such a hero as she should be lost from the underground railroad i have just received a letter from ireland making inquiry respecting her if thee gets this in time and knows anything respecting her please drop me a line by mail to-morrow and i will get it next morning if not sooner and oblige thy friend i have heard nothing from the eighth man from dover but trust he is safe thomas garrett on being informed that harriet was all right the following extract from a subsequent letter expresses his satisfaction over the good news and at the same time indicates his sympathy for a poor traveller who had fallen a victim to the cold weather and being severely frostbitten had died of lockjaw as related on page fifty two i was truly glad to learn that harriet tubman was still in good health and ready for action but i think there will be more danger at present than heretofore there is so much excitement below in consequence of escape of those eight slaves i was truly sorry to hear of the fate of that poor fellow who had periled so much for liberty i was in hopes from what thee told me that he would recover with the loss perhaps of some of his toes thomas garrett in the next letter an interesting anecdote is related of an encounter on the underground railroad between the fugitives and several irishmen and how one of the old countrymen was shot in the forehead etc which g thought would make such opponents to the road more cautious wilmington eleventh month fifth day eighteen fifty seven esteemed friend william still i have just written a note for the bearer to william murphy chester who will direct him on to thy care he left his home about a week since i hear in the lower part of the state he met with a friend to pilot him some twenty-five miles last night we learn that one party of those last week were attacked with clubs by several irish and that one of them was shot in the forehead the ball entering to the skull bone and passing under the skin partly round the head my informant says he is likely to recover but it will leave an ugly mark it is thought as long as he lives 
we have not been able to learn whether the party was on the lookout for them or whether they were rowdies out on a hallow eve frolic but be that as it may i presume they will be more cautious here how they trifle with such desiring the prosperity and happiness i remain thy friend thomas garrett four of god's poor the following letter shows the fearless manner in which he attended to the duties of his station wilmington ninth month sixth day eighteen fifty seven respected friend william still this evening i send to thy care four of god's poor severn johnson a true man will go with them to-night by railroad to thy house i have given johnson five dollars which will pay all expenses and leave each twenty-five cents we are indebted to campton f t n for those may success attend them in their efforts to maintain themselves please send word by johnson whether or no those seven arrive safe i wrote thee of ten days hence my wife and self were at longwood to-day had a pleasant ride and good meeting we are as ever thy friend thomas garrett quite a satisfactory account is given in the letter below of the irishman who was shot in the forehead also of one of the same kin who in meddling with the underground railroad passengers got his arm broken in two places etc wilmington eleventh month fourteenth day eighteen fifty seven esteemed friend william still thy favor of a few days since came to hand giving quite a satisfactory account of the large company i find in the melee near this town one of the irishmen got his arm broken in two places the one shot in the forehead is badly marked but not dangerously injured i learned to-day that the carriage in that company owing to fast driving with such a heavy load is badly broken and the poor horse was badly injured it has not been able to do anything since please say to my friend rebecca hart that i have heretofore kept clear of persuading or even advising slaves to leave their masters till they have fully made up their minds to leave knowing as i do there is great risk in so doing and if betrayed once would be a serious injury in the cause hereafter i had spoken to one colored man to try to see him but he was not willing to risk it if he has any desire to get away he can during one night before they miss him get out of the reach of danger booth has moved into newcastle and left the two boys on the farm if rebecca hart will write to me and give me the name of the boy and the name of his mother i will make another effort the man i spoke to lives in newcastle and thinks the mother of the boy alluded to lives between here and newcastle the young man's association here wants wendell phillips to deliver a lecture on the lost arts and some of the rest of us wish him to deliver a lecture on slavery where will a letter reach him soonest as i wish to write him on the subject i thought he would perhaps deliver two lectures two nights in succession if thee can give the above information thee will much oblige garrett and son in his business-like transactions without concealment he places matters in such a light that the wayfaring man though a fool need not err 
as may here be seen. Wilmington, 11th month, 25th day, 1857. Esteemed friend, William Still, I now send Johnson, one of our colored men, up with the three men I wrote thee about. Johnson has undertook to have them well washed and clean during the day, and I have provided them with some second-hand clothes to make them comfortable, and a new pair of shoes and stockings, and shall pay Johnson for taking care of them. I mention this so that thee may know. Thee need not advance him any funds. In the present case I shall furnish them with money to pay their fare to Philadelphia and Johnson home again. Hoping they will get on safe, I remain thy friend, Thomas Garrett. Four females on board. The fearless Garrett communicated through the mail, as usual, the following intelligence. Wilmington, 8th month, 25th day, 1859. Esteemed friend, William Still. The brig Alvina of Lewiston is in Delaware opposite here, with four females on board. The colored man who has them in charge was employed by the husband of one of them to bring his wife up. When he arrived here, he found the man had left. As the vessel is bound to Red Bank, I have advised him to take them there in the vessel, and tomorrow take them in the steamboat to the city and to the anti-slavery office. He says they owe the captain one dollar and fifty cents for board, and I gave him three dollars to pay the captain and take them to your office. I have a man here to go on tonight that was nearly naked, shall rig him out pretty comfortably. Poor fellow, he has lost his left hand, but he says he can take care of himself. In haste, thy friend, Thomas Garrett. While Father Abraham was using his utmost powers to put down the rebellion in 1864, a young man who had been most unrighteously sold for seven years, desirous of enlisting, sought advice from the wise and faithful Underground Railroad manager, who gave him the following letter, which may be looked upon in the light of a rare anecdote, as there is no doubt that the professed non-resistant in this instant hoped to see the poor fellow snugly fixed in his regimentals doing service for Father Abraham. Wilmington, first month, 23rd day, 1864. Respected friend William Still, the bearer of this, Winlock Clark, has lately been most unrighteously sold for seven years and is desirous of enlisting and becoming one of uncle sam's boys i have advised him to call on thee so that no land sharks shall get any bounty for enlisting him he has a wife and several children and whatever bounty the government or the state allows him will be of use to his family please write me when he is snugly fixed in his regimentals so that i may send word to his wife by so doing thee will much oblige thy friend and the friend of humanity thomas garrett n b am i naughty being a professed non-resistant to advise this poor fellow to serve father abraham t g we have given so many of these inevitable underground railroad letters from the pen of the sturdy old laborer not only because they will be new to the readers of this work but because they so fittingly illustrate his practical devotion to the slave and his cheerfulness in the face of danger and difficulty in the manner that other pens might labor in vain to describe 
End of section 7section eight of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by maria casper the underground railroad part five by william still section eight portraits and sketches daniel gibbons a life as uneventful as the one whose story we are about to tell affords little scope for the genius of the biographer or the historian but being carefully studied it cannot fail to teach a lesson of devotion and self-sacrifice which should be learned and remembered by every succeeding age daniel gibbons son of james and deborah hoops gibbons was born on the banks of mill creek in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, on the 21st day of the 12th month, December, 1775. He was descended on his father's side from an English ancestor whose name appears on the colonial records as far back as 1683. John Gibbons evidently came with or before William Penn to this goodly heritage of freedom, his earthly remains lie at Concord Friends Burying Ground, Delaware County, near where the family lived for a generation or two. The grandfather of Daniel Gibbons, who lived near where West Town Boarding School now is, in Chester County, bought for seventy pounds one thousand acres of land and allowances in what is now Lancaster County, intending, as he ultimately did, to settle his three sons upon it this purchase was made about the year seventeen fifteen in process of time the eldest son desiring to marry deborah hoops the daughter of daniel hoops of a neighboring township in chester county the young people obtained the consent of parents and friends but it was a time of grief and mourning among young and old the young friends assured the intended bride that they would not marry the best man in the province and do what she was about to do, and the elder dames so far relaxed the puritanic rigidity of their rules as to allow the invitation of an uncommonly large company of guests to the wedding, in order that a long and perhaps last farewell might be said to the beloved daughter, who with her husband was about to emigrate to the far west loud and long were the lamentations and warm the embraces of these simple-minded christian rustics companions of toil and deprivation as they parted from two of their number who were to leave their circle for the west the west being then thirty-six miles distant this was on the sixth day of the fifth month seventeen fifty six more than a century has passed away all the good people eighty-nine in number who signed the wedding certificate as witnesses have passed away and how vast is the change wrought in our midst since that day joseph gibbons was so much pleased with the daring enterprise of his son and daughter-in-law that he gave them one hundred acres of land in his western possessions more than he reserved for his other and younger sons and to it they immediately emigrated and building first a cabin and the next year a storehouse began life for themselves in earnest it is interesting in view of the long and consistent anti-slavery course which daniel gibbons pursued to trace the influence that wrought upon him while his character was maturing and the causes which led him to see the wickedness of the system which he opposed the society of friends in that day bore in mind the advice of their great founder fox whose last words were friends mind the light and following that guide which leads out of all evil and into all good they viewed every custom of society with eyes undimmed by prejudice and were influenced in every action of life by a belief in the common brotherhood of man and a resolve to obey the command of jesus to love one another 
This being the case, slavery and oppression of all kinds were unpopular and indeed almost unknown amongst them. James Gibbons was a Republican and an enthusiastic advocate of American liberty. Being a man of commanding presence and great energy and determination, efforts were made during the revolution to induce him to enlist as a cavalry soldier he was prevented from doing so by the entreaties of his wife and his own conscientious scruples as a friend about the time of the revolution or immediately after he removed to the borough of wilmington delaware where being surrounded by slavery he became more than ever alive to its iniquities he was interested during his whole life in getting slaves off, and being elected second Burgess of Wilmington during his residence there, his official position gave him great opportunities to assist in this noble work. It is related that during his magistracy a slaveholder brought a colored man before him whom he claimed as his slave. There being no evidence of the alleged ownership, the colored man was set at liberty, the pretended owner was inclined to be impudent but james gibbons told him promptly that nothing but silence and good behavior on his part would prevent his commitment for contempt of court about the year seventeen ninety james gibbons came back to lancaster county where he spent twenty years in the practice of those deeds which will remain in everlasting remembrance dying full of years and honors in eighteen ten born in the first year of the revolution and growing up surrounded by such influences daniel gibbons could not have been other than he was the friend of the downtrodden and oppressed of every nationality and color in seventeen eighty nine his father took him to see general washington then passing through wilmington to the end of his life he retained a vivid recollection of this visit and would recount its incidents to his family and friends during his father's residence in Wilmington, he spent his summers with kinsmen in Lancaster County learning to be a farmer, and his winters in Wilmington going to school. At the age of fourteen years, he was bound an apprentice, as was the good custom of the day, to a friend in Lancaster County, to learn the tanning business. At this he served about six years, or until his master ceased to follow the business during this apprenticeship he became accustomed to severe labor so severe indeed that he never recovered from the effects thereof having a difficulty in walking during the remainder of his life which prevented him from taking the active part in the underground railroad business which he otherwise would have done his father's estate being involved in litigation caused him to be put to this trade farming being his favorite employment and one which he followed during his whole life in 1805 he took a pedestrian tour by way of new york albany and niagara falls to the state of ohio then the far west coming home by way of pittsburgh and walking altogether one thousand three hundred and fifty miles in this trip he increased the injury to his feet so as to render himself virtually a cripple upon the death of his father he settled upon the farm on which he died about the year 1808, on going to visit some friends who had removed to Adams County, Pennsylvania, he became acquainted with Hannah Weirman, whom he married on the fourth day of the fifth month, 1815. At this time Daniel Gibbons was about forty years old, and his wife about twenty-eight, she having been born on the ninth of the seventh month, 1787. A life of one, after their union, would be incomplete without some notice of the other. During a married life of thirty-seven years, Hannah Gibbons was the assistant of her husband in every good and noble work. Possessed of a warm heart, a powerful though uncultivated intellect, an excellent judgment, and great sweetness of disposition, she was fitted both by nature and training to endure without murmuring the inconvenience and trouble incident to the reception and care of fugitives and to rejoice that to her was given the opportunity of assisting them in their efforts to be free the true measure of greatness in a human soul is its willingness to suffer for its own good or the good of its fellows its self-sacrificing spirit 
Granting the truth of this, one of the greatest souls was that of Hannah W. Gibbons. The following incident is a proof of this. In 1836, when she was no longer a young woman, there came to her home one of the poorest, most ignorant, and filthiest of mankind, a slave from the great valley of Virginia. He was footsore and weary, and could not tell how he came or who directed him. He seemed, indeed, a missive directed and sent by the hand of the Almighty. Before he could be cleansed or recruited, he was taken sick and before he could be removed, even if he could have been trusted at the county poorhouse, his case was pronounced to be smallpox. For six long weeks did this good angel in human form attend upon this unfortunate object. Reasons were found why no one else could do it, and with her own hands she ministered to his wants until he was restored to health. Such was her life. This is merely one case. She was always ready to do her duty. Her interest in good never left her, for when almost dying she aroused from her lethargy and asked if Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States, which he was a few days afterwards. She always predicted a civil war in the settlement of the slavery question. During the last twenty-five years of her life she was an elder in the Society of Friends, of which she had always been an earnest, consistent, and devoted member. Her patience, self-denial, and warm affection were manifested in every relation of life. As a daughter, wife, mother, friend, and mistress of a family, she was beloved by all, and to her relatives and friends who are left behind, the remembrance of her good deeds comes wafted like a perfume from beyond the golden gates. She survived her husband about eight years, dying on the 16th of the 10th month, 1860, Three children, sons, were born to their marriage, two of whom died in infancy, and one still, 1871, survives. To give some idea of the course pursued by Daniel and Hannah Gibbons, I insert the following letter, containing an account of events which took place in 1821. A short time since I learned that my old friend William Still was about to publish a history of the Underground Railroad. His own experience in the service of the road would make a large volume. I was brought up by Daniel Gibbons, and am asked to say what I know of him as an abolitionist. From my earliest recollection he was a friend to the colored people, and often hired them and paid them liberal wages. His house was a depot for slaves and many hundreds has he helped on their way to freedom. Many a dark night he has sent me to carry them victuals and change their places of refuge, and take them to other people's barns when not safe for him to go. I have known him start in the night and go fifty miles with them when they were very hotly pursued. One man and his wife lived with him for a long time. Afterwards the man lived with Thornton Walton. The man was hauling lumber from Columbia, he was taken from his team in Lancaster and lodged in Baltimore jail. Daniel Gibbons went to Baltimore, visited the jail, and tried hard to get him released, but failed. I would add here that Daniel Gibbons' faithful wife, one of the best women I ever knew, was always ready day or night to do all she possibly could to help the poor fugitives on their way to freedom. Many interesting incidents occurred at the home of my uncle. I will relate one. He had living with him at one time two colored men, Thomas Colbert and John Stewart. The latter was from Maryland. John often said he would go back and get his wife. My uncle asked him if he was not afraid of his master's catching him. He said no, for his master knew if he undertook to take him, he would kill him. He did go back and brought his wife to my uncle's. While these two men, Tom and John, were there, along came Robert, other name unknown, in a bad plight, his feet bleeding. Robert was put in the barn to thrash until he could be fixed up to go again on his journey. But in a few days, behold, along came his master. He brought with him that notorious constable Haynes from Lancaster and one other man. They came suddenly upon Robert. As soon as he saw them, he ran and jumped out of the overshoot, some ten feet down. In jumping, he put one knee out of joint. The men ran around the barn and seized him. By this time, 
the two colored men tom and john came together with my uncle and aunt poor robert owned his master but john told them they should not take him away and was going at them with a club one of the men drew a pistol to shoot john but uncle told him he had better not shoot him this was not a slave state inasmuch as robert had owned his master uncle told john he must submit so they put robert on a horse and started with him after they were gone john said mr gibbons just say the word and i will bring robert back aunt said go john go so john ran to joseph rakestraw's and got a gun without any lock and ran across the fields and tom after him and headed the party the men all ran except haynes who kept robert between himself and john so that john should not shoot him but john called out to robert to drop off that horse or he would shoot him this robert did and john and tom brought him back in triumph my aunt said john thee is a good fellow thee has done well robert was taken to jesse gilbert's barn and dr dingy fixed his knee as soon as he was able to travel he took a bee line for the north star my life with my uncle and aunt made me an abolitionist i left them in the winter of eighteen twenty four and came to salem ohio where i kept a small station on the underground railroad until the united states government took my work away i have helped over two hundred fugitives on their way to canada respectfully daniel bonsell salem columbiana county ohio one day in the winter of eighteen twenty two thomas johnson a colored man living with daniel gibbons went out early in the morning to set traps for muskrats while he was gone a slaveholder came to the house and inquired for his slave daniel gibbons said there is no slave here of that name the man replied i know he is here the man we're after is a miserable worthless thieving scoundrel oh very well then said the good quaker if that's the kind of man thee is after then i know he is not here we have a colored man here but he is not that kind of man the slaveholder waited a while the man not making his appearance then said well now mr gibbons when you see that man next tell him that we were here and if he will come home we will take good care of him and be kind to him very well said daniel i will tell him what thee says but say to him at the same time that he is a very great fool if he does as thee requests the colored man sought having caught sight of the slaveholders and knowing who they were went off that night under daniel gibbons's directions and was never seen by his master again afterward daniel and his nephew william gibbons went with this man to adams county with his master came the master of mary a girl with straight hair and nearly white who lived with daniel gibbons and his wife poor mary was unfortunate her master caught her and took her back with him into slavery she and a little girl who was taken away about the year eighteen thirty were the only ones ever taken back from the house of daniel gibbons between the time of his marriage when he began to keep a depot on the underground railroad and the year eighteen twenty four he passed more than one hundred slaves through to canada and between the latter time and his death eight hundred more making in all nine hundred aided by him he was ever willing to sacrifice his own personal comfort and convenience in order to assist fugitives in eighteen thirty three when on his way to the west in a carriage with his friend thomas pert also a most faithful friend of the colored man and interested in underground railroad affairs he found a fugitive slave a woman in adams county who was in immediate danger he stopped his journey and sent his horse and wagon back to his own home with the woman that being the only safe way of getting her off this was but a sample of his self-denial in the cause of human freedom his want of ability to guide in person runaway slaves or to travel with them prevented him from taking active part in the wonderful adventures and hairbreadth escapes which his brain and tact rendered possible and successful it is believed that no slave was ever recaptured that followed his directions sometimes the abolitionists were much annoyed by impostors who pretended to be runaways in order to discover their plans and betray them to the slaveholders daniel gibbons was possessed of much acuteness in detecting these people 
but having detected them he never treated them harshly or unkindly almost from infancy he was distinguished for the gravity of his deportment and his utter heedlessness of small things the writer has heard men preach the doctrine of the trifling value of the things of a present time and of the tremendous importance of those of a never-ending eternity but daniel gibbons is the only person she ever knew who lived that doctrine he believed in plainness of apparel as taught by friends not as a form or rule of society but as a principle often quoting from some one who said that the adornment of a vain and foolish world would feed a starving one he opposed extravagant fashions and all luxury of habit and life as calculated to produce effeminacy and degrading sensuality and as a bestowal of idolatrous attention upon that body which he would often say was here but for a short time looking only upon that as religion which made men love each other and do good to each other in this world he was little of a stickler for points of belief and even when he did look into theological matters or denounce a man's religious opinions it was generally because they were calculated to darken the mind and be entertained as a substitute for good works pursuing the even tenor of his way he could as easily lead the flying fugitive slave by night out of the way of his powerful master as one differently constituted could bestow his wealth upon the most popular charity in the land his faith was of the simplest kind the parable of the prodigal son contains his creed discarding what are commonly called plans of salvation he believed in the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world and that if people would follow this light they would thus seek the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness and all other things needful would be added thereunto he was a devoted member of the society of friends in which he held the position of elder during the last twenty-five years of his life that peculiar doctrine of the society which repudiates systematic divinity and with it a paid ministry he held in special reverence finding confirmation of its truth in the general advocacy of slavery by the popular clergy of his day when he was quite advanced in years and the anti-slavery agitation grew warm he was solicited to join an anti-slavery society but on hearing the constitution read and finding that it repudiated all use of physical force on the part of the oppressed in gaining their liberty he said that he could not assent to that that he had long been engaged in getting off slaves and that he had always advised them to use force although remonstrating against going to the extent of taking life and that now he could not recede from that position and he did not see how they could always be got off without the use of some force his faith in an overruling providence was complete he believed even in the darkest days of freedom in our land in the ultimate extinction of slavery and at times although advanced in years thought he would live to witness that glorious consummation it is only in a man's own family and by his wife and children that he is really known and it is by those who best knew and indeed who only knew this good man that his biographer is most anxious that he should be judged as a parent he was not excessively indulgent as a husband one more nearly a model is rarely found but his kindness in domestic life his love for his wife his son and his grandchildren and their reciprocal love and affection for him no words can express it was in his father's household in his youth and in his own household in his mature years that was fostered that wealth of love and affection which extending and widening took in the whole race and made him the friend of the oppressed everywhere, and especially of those whom it was a dangerous and unpopular task to befriend. The tenderness and thoughtfulness of his disposition are well shown in the following incident. Upon one occasion his son received a kick from a horse, which he was about to mount at the door. When he had recovered from the shock, and it was found that he was not seriously injured, the father still continued to look serious and did not cease to shed tears on being asked why he grieved 
His answer was, I was just thinking how it would have been with thee had that stroke proved fatal. Such thoughts were at once the notes of his own preparation, and a warning to others to be also ready. A life consistent with his views was a life of humility and universal benevolence, and such was his. It was a life, as it were, in heaven while yet on earth for it soared above and beyond the corrupt and slavish influences of earthly passions. His interest in temperance never failed him. On his deathbed he would call persons to him who needed such advice, and admonish them on the subject of using strong drinks, and his last expression of interest in any humanitarian movement was an avowal of his belief in the great good to rise from a prohibitory liquor law. To a friend who entered his sick-room a few days before his death, he said, Well, E, thee is preparing to go to the West. The friend replied, Yes, and Daniel, I suppose thee is preparing to go to eternity. There was an affirmative reply, and E inquired, How does thee find it? Daniel said, I don't find much to do. I find that I have not got a hard master to deal with. Some few things which I have done I find not entirely right. He quitted the earthly service of the master on the seventeenth day of the eighth month, 1852. A young physician, son of one of his old friends, after attending his funeral, wrote to a friend as follows. To quote the words of Webster, We turned and paused, and joined our voices with the voices of the air, and bade him hail and farewell. Farewell, kind and brave old man, the voices of the oppressed whom thou hast redeemed welcome thee to the eternal city. End of section 8section 9 of the Underground Railroad, part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 9. Portraits and Sketches. Lucretia Mott. Of all the women who served the anti-slavery cause in its darkest days, there is not one whose labors were more effective, whose character is nobler, and who is more universally respected and beloved than Lucretia Mott. You cannot speak of the slave without remembering her who did so much to make slavery impossible. You cannot speak of freedom without recalling that enfranchised spirit which, free from all control save that of conscience and God, labored for absolute liberty for the whole human race. We cannot think of the partial triumph of freedom in this country without rejoicing in the great part she took in the victory. Lucretia Mott is one of the noblest representatives of ideal womanhood. Those who know her need not be told this, but those who only love her in the spirit may be sure that they can have no faith too great in the beauty of her pure and Christian life. This book would be incomplete without giving some account, however brief, of Lucretia Mott's character and labors in the great work to which her life has been devoted. To write it fully would require a volume. She was born in 1793 in the island of Nantucket, and is descended from the Coffins and Macy's on the father's side, and from the Folgers on the mother's side, and through them is related to Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Her maiden name was Lucretia Coffin. During the absence of her father on a long voyage, her mother was engaged in mercantile business, purchasing goods in Boston in exchange for oil and candles, the staples of the island. Mrs. Mott says in reference to this employment, the exercise of women's talent in this line, as well as the general care which devolved upon them in the absence of their husbands, tended to develop their intellectual powers, and strengthened them mentally and physically. The family removed to Boston in 1804. Her parents belonged to the Religious Society of Friends, 
and carefully cultivated in their children the peculiarities as well as the principles of that sect to this early training we may ascribe the rigid adherence of mrs mott to the beautiful but sober costume of the society when in london in eighteen forty she visited the zoological gardens and a gentleman of the party pointing out the splendid plumage of some tropical birds remarked you see mrs mott our heavenly father believes in bright colors how much it would take from our pleasure if all the birds were dressed in drab yes she replied but immortal beings do not depend upon feathers for their attractions with the infinite variety of the human face and form of thought feeling and affection we do not need gorgeous apparel to distinguish us moreover if it is fitting that women should dress in every color of the rainbow why not men also clergymen with their black clothes and white cravats are quite as monotonous as the quakers whatever may be the abstract merit of this argument it is certain that the simplicity of lucretia mott's nature is beautifully expressed by her habitual costume in giving the principal events of lucretia mott's life we prefer to use her own language whenever possible in memoranda furnished by her to elizabeth cady stanton she says my father had a desire to make his daughters useful at fourteen years of age i was placed with a younger sister at the friends boarding school in dutchess county state of new york and continued there for more than two years without returning home at fifteen one of the teachers leaving the school i was chosen as an assistant in her place pleased with the promotion i strove hard to give satisfaction and was gratified on leaving the school to have an offer of a situation as teacher if i was disposed to remain and informed that my services should entitle another sister to her education without charge my father was at that time in successful business in boston but with his views of the importance of training a woman to usefulness he and my mother gave their consent to another year of being devoted to that institution here is another instance of the immeasurable value of wise parental influence in eighteen o nine lucretia joined her family in philadelphia whither they had removed at the early age of eighteen she says i married james mott of new york an attachment formed while at the boarding school mr mott entered into business with her father then followed commercial depressions the war of eighteen twelve the death of her father and the family became involved in difficulties mrs mott was again obliged to resume teaching these trials she says in early life were not without their good effect in disciplining the mind and leading it to set a just estimate on worldly pleasures to this early training to the example of a noble father and excellent mother to the trials which came so quickly in her life the rapid development of mrs mott's intellect is no doubt greatly due thus the foundation was laid which has enabled her for more than fifty years to be one of the great workers in the cause of suffering humanity these are golden words which we quote from her own modest notes i however always loved the good in childhood desired to do the right and had no faith in the generally received idea of human depravity yes it was because she believed in human virtue that she was enabled to accomplish such a wonderful work she had the inspiration of faith and entered her life battle against slavery with a divine hope and not with a gloomy despair the next great step in lucretia mott's career was taken at the age of twenty-five when summoned by a little family and many cares i felt called to a more public life of devotion to duty and engaged in the ministry in our society in eighteen twenty seven when the society was divided mrs mott's convictions led her to adhere to the sufficiency of the light within us resting on the truth as authority rather than taking authority for truth we may find no better place than this to refer to her relations to christianity there are many people who do not believe in the progress of religion they are right in one respect god's truth cannot be progressive because it is absolute immutable and eternal 
but the human race is struggling up to a higher comprehension of its own destiny and of the mysterious purposes of god so far as they are revealed to our finite intelligence it is in this sense that religion is progressive the christianity of this age ought to be more intelligent than the christianity of calvin the popular doctrine of human depravity says mrs mott never commended itself to my reason or conscience i searched the scriptures daily finding a construction of the text wholly different from that which was pressed upon our acceptance the highest evidence of a sound faith being the practical life of the christian i have felt a far greater interest in the moral movements of our age than in any theological discussion her life is a noble evidence of the sincerity of this belief she has translated christian principles into daily deeds that spirit of benevolence which mrs mott possesses in a degree far above the average of necessity had countless modes of expression she was not so much a champion of any particular cause as of all reforms it was said of charles lamb that he could not even hear the devil abused without trying to say something in his favor and with all mrs mott's intense hatred of slavery we do not think she ever had one unkind feeling toward the slaveholder her longest and probably her noblest work was done in the anti-slavery cause the millions of downtrodden slaves in our land she says being the greatest sufferers the most oppressed class i have felt bound to plead their cause in season and out of season to endeavor to put my soul in their soul's stead and to aid all in my power in every right effort for their immediate emancipation when in eighteen thirty three william lloyd garrison took the ground of immediate emancipation and urged the duty of unconditional liberty without expatriation mrs mott took an active part in the movement she was one of the founders of the philadelphia female anti-slavery society in eighteen thirty four being actively associated in the efforts for the slave's redemption she says i have traveled thousands of miles in this country holding meetings in some of the slave states have been in the midst of mobs and violence and have shared abundantly in the odium attached to the name of an uncompromising modern abolitionist as well as partaken richly of the sweet return of peace attendant on those who would undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free and break every yoke in eighteen forty she attended the world's anti-slavery convention in london because she was a woman she was not admitted as a delegate all the female delegates however were treated with courtesy though not with justice mrs mott spoke frequently in the liberal churches of england and her influence outside of the convention had great effect on the anti-slavery movement in great britain but the value of mrs mott's anti-slavery work is not limited to what she individually did great as that labor was her influence over others and especially the young was extraordinary she made many converts who went forth to spread the great ideas of freedom throughout the land no one can of himself accomplish great good he must labor through others he must inspire them convince the unbelieving kindle the fires of faith in doubting souls and in the unequal fight of right with wrong make hope take the place of despair this lucretia mott has done her example was an inspiration in the temperance reform mrs mott took an early interest and for many years she has practiced total abstinence from intoxicating drinks in the cause of peace she has been ever active believing in the ultra non-resistance ground that no christian can consistently uphold and actively engage in and support a government based on the sword yet this we believe did not prevent her from taking a profound interest in the great war for the union though she deplored the means her soul must have exulted in the result through anguish and tears blood and death america wrought out her salvation do we not believe that the united states leads the cause of human freedom it follows then that the abolition of the gigantic system of human slavery in this country 
is the grandest event in modern history. Mrs. Mott has also been earnestly engaged in aid of the working classes, and has labored effectively for a radical change in the system which makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. In the women's rights question she was early interested, and with Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton she organized in 1848 a woman's rights convention at Seneca Falls, New York. At the proceedings of this meeting the nation was convulsed with laughter, but who laughs now at this irresistible reform? The public career of Lucretia Mott is in perfect harmony with her private life. My life in the domestic sphere, she says, has passed much as that of other wives and mothers of this country. I have had six children. Not accustomed to resigning them to the care of a nurse, I was much confined to them during their infancy and childhood. Notwithstanding her devotion to public matters, her private duties were never neglected. Many of our readers will no doubt remember Mrs. Mott at anti-slavery meetings, her mind intently fixed upon the proceedings, while her hands were as busily engaged in useful sewing or knitting. It is not our place to inquire too closely into this social circle, but we may say that Mrs. Mott's history is a living proof that the highest public duties may be reconciled with perfect fidelity to private responsibilities. It is so with men. Why should it be different with women? In her marriage, Mrs. Mott was fortunate. James Mott was a worthy partner for such a woman. He was born in June 1788 in Long Island. He was an anti-slavery man almost before such a thing as anti-slavery was known. In 1812, he refused to use any article which was produced by slave labor. The directors of that greatest of all railway corporations, the Underground Railroad, will never forget his services. He died January 26, 1868, having nearly completed his 80th year. Not only in regard to slavery, said the Philadelphia Morning Post at the time, but in all things was Mr. Mott a reformer and a radical, and while his principles were absolute and his opinions uncompromising, his nature was singularly generous and humane. Charity was not to him a duty but a delight, and the benevolence which in most good men has some touch of vanity or selfishness always seemed in him pure, unconscious, and disinterested. His life was long and happy, and useful to his fellow men. He had been married for fifty-seven years, and none of the many friends of James and Lucretia Mott need be told how much that union meant, nor what sorrow comes with its end in this world. Mary Grew pronounced his fitting epitaph when she said, he was ever calm, steadfast, and strong in the forefront of the conflict. In her seventy-ninth year, the energy of Lucretia Mott is undiminished, and her soul is as ardent in the cause to which her life has been devoted as when, in her youth, she placed the will of a true woman against the impotence of prejudiced millions. With the abolition of slavery and the passage of the Fifteenth Amendment, her greatest life work ended. Since then she has given much of her time to the female suffrage movement, and so late as November 1871 she took an active part in the annual meeting of the Pennsylvania Peace Society. Since the great law was enacted which made all men, black or white, equal in political rights, as they were always equal in the sight of God, Mrs. Mott has made it her business to visit every colored church in Philadelphia. This we may regard as the formal closing of fifty years of work in behalf of a race which she has seen raised from a position of abject servitude to one higher than that of a monarch's throne. But though she may have ended this anti-slavery work, which is but the foundation of the destiny of the colored race in America, her influence is not ended. That cannot die. It must live and grow and deepen and generations hence the world will be happier and better that Lucretia Mott lived and labored for the good of all mankind. End of section 9
Section 10 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 10. Portraits and Sketches. James Miller McKim. More vividly than it is possible for the pen to portray, the subject of this sketch recalls the struggles of the worst years of slavery, when the conflict was most exciting and interesting, when more minds were aroused, and more laborers were hard at work in the field, when more anti-slavery speeches were made, tracts, papers, and books were written, printed, and distributed, when more petitions were signed for the abolition of slavery, in a word, when the barbarism of slavery was more exposed and condemned than ever before in the same length of time. Abolitionists were then intensely in earnest, and determined never to hold their peace or cease their warfare, until immediate and unconditional emancipation was achieved. On the other hand, during this same period, it is not venturing too much to assert that the slave power was more oppressive than ever before, slave enactments more cruel, the spirit of slavery more intolerant, the fetters more tightly drawn, perilous escapes more frequent, slave captures and slave hunts more appalling. In short, the enslavers of the race had never before so defiantly assumed that Negro slavery was sanctioned by the divine laws of God. Thus, while these opposing agencies were hotly contesting the rights of man, James Miller McKim, as one of the earliest, most faithful and ablest abolitionists in Pennsylvania, occupied a position of influence, labor, and usefulness, scarcely second to Mr. Garrison. For at least fourteen of the eventful years referred to, it was the writer's privilege to occupy a position in the anti-slavery office with Mr. McKim, and the best opportunity was thus afforded to observe him under all circumstances while battling for freedom. As a helper and friend of the fleeing bondman, in numberless instances, the writer has marked well his kind and benevolent spirit before and after the formation of the late Vigilance Committee. At all times, when the funds were inadequate, his aid could be counted upon for sure relief. He never failed the fugitive in the hour of need. Whether on the Underground Railroad bound for Canada, or before a United States commissioner trying a fugitive case, the slave found no truer friend than Mr. McKim. If the records of the Pennsylvania Society for Promoting the Abolition of Slavery and the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society were examined and written out by a pen as competent as Mr. McKim's, two or three volumes of a most thrilling, interesting, and valuable character could be furnished to posterity. But as his labors have been portrayed for these pages by a hand much more competent than the writer's, it only remains to present it as follows. The subject of this sketch was born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, November 14, 1810, the oldest but one of eight children. On his father's side, he was of Scotch-Irish. On his mother's, Miller, of German descent. He graduated at Dickinson College in 1828, and entering upon the study of medicine, attended one or more courses of lectures in the University of Pennsylvania. Before he was ready to take his degree, his mind was powerfully turned toward religion, and he relinquished medicine for the study of divinity, entering the theological seminary at Princeton in the fall of 1831, and a year later being matriculated at Andover. The death of his parents, however, and subsequently that of his oldest brother, made his connection with both these institutions a very brief one, and he was obliged, as the charge of the family now devolved upon him, to continue his studies privately at home under the friendly direction of the late Dr. Duffield. An ardent and pronounced disciple of the new school of Presbyterians, 
belonging to a strongly old-school presbytery, he was able to secure license and ordination only by transfer to another. And in October 1835, he accepted a pulpit in Womelsdorf, Berks County, Pennsylvania, where he preached for one year to a Presbyterian congregation. To what purpose and with what views may be learned from the following passage taken from one of his letters, written more than twenty years afterwards, to the National Anti-Slavery Standard. The first settled pastor of this little flock was one sufficiently well known to such of your readers as will be interested in this, to make mention of his name unnecessary. He had studied for the ministry with a strong desire and a half-formed purpose to become a missionary in foreign lands. Before he had proceeded far in his studies, however, he became alive to the claims of the perishing heathen here at home. When he received his licensure, his mind was divided between the still-felt impulse of his first purpose and the pressure of his later convictions. While yet unsettled on this point, the case of the little church at Womelsdorf was made known to him, followed by an urgent request from the people and from the Home Missionary Society to take charge of it. He acceded to the request and remained there one year, zealously performing the duties of his office to the best of his knowledge and ability. The people, earnest and simple-hearted, desiring the sincere milk of the word, and receiving it, grew thereby. All the members of the church became avowed abolitionists. They showed their faith by their works, contributing liberally to the funds of the Anti-Slavery Society. Many a seasonable donation has our Pennsylvania organization received from that quarter. For though their anti-slavery minister had left and had been followed by others of different sentiments, and though he had withdrawn from the church with which they were in common connected, and that on grounds which subjected him to the imputation and penalties of heresy, these good people did not feel called upon to change their relations of personal friendship, nor did they make it a pretext, as others have done, for abandoning the cause. In October 1836, he accepted a lecturing agency under the American Anti-Slavery Society as one of the seventy, gathered from all professions, whom Theodore D. Weld had by his eloquence inspired to spread the gospel of emancipation. Mr. McKim had long before this had his attention drawn to the subject of slavery in the summer of 1832 and the reading of Garrison's Thoughts on Colonization at once made him an abolitionist. He was an appointed delegate to the convention which formed the American Anti-Slavery Society, and enjoyed the distinction of being the youngest member of that body. Henceforth, the object of the society and of his ministry became inseparable in his mind. Footnote it may be a matter of some interest to state that the original draft of the Declaration of Sentiments adopted at this meeting, together with the autographs of the signers, is now in the keeping of the New York Historical Society. End footnote. In the following summer, 1834, he delivered in Carlisle two addresses in favor of immediate emancipation, which excited much discussion and bitter feeling in that border community and gained him no little obloquy, which was of course increased when, as a lecturer, on the regular stipend of eight dollars a week in travelling expenses, pocket lined with British gold was the current charge, he traversed his native state among a people in the closest geographical, commercial, and social contact with the system of slavery. His fate was not different from that of his colleagues, in respect of interruptions of his meetings by mob violence, personal assaults with stale eggs and other more dangerous missiles, and a public sentiment which everywhere encouraged and protected the rioters. Meantime, a radical change of opinion on theological questions led Mr. McKim formally to sever his connection with the Presbyterian Church and ministry. Being now free to act without sectarian constraint, he was, in the beginning of 1840, made publishing agent of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, which caused him to settle in Philadelphia, where he was married in October to Sarah A. Speakman of Chester County. 
the chief duties of his office at first were the publication and management of the pennsylvania freeman including for an interval after the retirement of john g whittier the editorial conduct of that paper in course of time his functions were enlarged and under the title of corresponding secretary he performed the part of a factotum and general manager with a share in all the anti-slavery work local and national after the consolidation of the freeman with the standard in eighteen fifty four he became the official correspondent of the latter paper his letters serving to some extent as a substitute for the discontinued freeman the operations of the underground railroad came under his review and partial control as has already appeared in these pages and the slave cases which came before the courts claimed a large share of his attention after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1851, his duties in this respect were arduous and various, as may be inferred from one of his private letters to an English friend, which found its way into print abroad, and which will be found in another place. During the John Brown excitement, Mr. McKim had the privilege of accompanying Mrs. Brown in her melancholy errand to Harper's Ferry, to take her last leave of her husband before his execution, and to bring away the body. His companions on that painful but memorable journey were his wife and Hector Tyndale, Esquire, afterwards honorably distinguished in the war as General Tyndale. Returning with the body of the hero and martyr, still in company with Mrs. Brown, Mr. McKim proceeded to North Elba, where he and wendell phillips who had joined him in new york with a few other friends gathered from the neighborhood assisted in the final obsequies when war broke out mr mckim was one of the first to welcome it as the harbinger of the slave's deliverance and the country's redemption a righteous war he said is better than a corrupt peace when war can only be averted by consenting to crime then welcome war with all its calamities in the winter of 1862, after the capture of Port Royal, he procured the calling of a public meeting of the citizens of Philadelphia to consider and provide for the wants of the 10,000 slaves who had been suddenly liberated. One of the results of this meeting was the organization of the Philadelphia Port Royal Relief Committee. By request, he visited the Sea Islands, accompanied by his daughter, and on his return made a report which served his associates as a basis of operations and which was republished extensively in this country and abroad after the proclamation of emancipation he advocated an early dissolution of the anti-slavery organization and at the may meeting of the american anti-slavery society in eighteen sixty four introduced a proposition looking to that result it was favorably received by mr garrison and others but no action was taken upon it at that time when the question came up the following year the proposition to disband was earnestly supported by mr garrison mr quincy mr may mr johnson and others but was strongly opposed by wendell phillips and his friends among whom from philadelphia were mrs mott miss grew and robert purvis and was decided by a vote in the negative mr mckim was an early advocate of colored enlistments as a means of lifting up the blacks and putting down the rebellion in the spring of eighteen sixty three he urged upon the philadelphia union league of which he was a member the duty of recruiting colored soldiers as a result on the motion of thomas webster esq a movement was set on foot which led to the organization of the philadelphia supervisory committee and the subsequent establishment of camp william penn with the addition to the national army of eleven colored regiments when in november eighteen sixty three the port royal relief committee was enlarged into the pennsylvania freedman's relief association mr mckim was made its corresponding secretary he had previously resigned his place in the anti-slavery society believing that that organization was near the end of its usefulness 
In the freedmen's work, he traveled extensively and worked hard, establishing schools at the South and organizing public sentiment in the free states. In the spring of 1865, he was made corresponding secretary of the American Freedmen's Commission, which he had helped to establish, and took up his residence in the city of New York. This association was afterwards amplified, in name and scope, into the American Freedmen's Union Commission, and Mr. McKim continued with it as corresponding secretary, laboring for reconstruction by means of freedmen's schools and impartial popular education. On the 1st of July, 1869, the commission, by unanimous vote on his motion, disbanded, and handed over the funds in its treasury to its constituent state associations. Mr. McKim retired from his labors with impaired health, and has since taken no open part in public affairs. He is one of the proprietors of the New York Nation, in the establishment of which he took an effective interest. Mr. McKim's long and assiduous career in the anti-slavery cause has given evidence of a peculiar fitness in him for the functions he successively discharged. His influence upon men and the times has been less as a speaker than as a writer, and perhaps still less as a writer than as an organizer, a contriver of ways and means, fertile in invention, prepared to take the initiative, and bringing to the conversion of others an earnestness of purpose and a force of language that seldom failed of success. In an enterprise where theory and sentiment were fully represented, and business capacity and what is called practical sense were comparatively rare, his talents were most usefully employed, while in periods of excitement, and when were such wanting, his caution, sound judgment, and mental balance were qualities hardly less needed or less important. End of section 10 Section 11 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 11. Portraits and Sketches. William H. Furness, D.D. Among the abolitionists of Pennsylvania, no man stands higher than Dr. Furness, and no anti-slavery minister enjoys more universal respect. For more than thirty years he bore faithful witness for the black man, in season and out of season, contending for his rights. When others deserted the cause, he stood firm. When associates in the ministry were silent, he spoke out. They defined their position by declaring themselves as much opposed to slavery as ever, but without sympathy for the abolitionists. He defined his by showing himself more opposed to slavery than ever, and fraternizing with the most hated and despised anti-slavery people. Dr. Furness came into the cause when it was in its infancy, and had few adherents. From that time till the day of its triumph, he was one with it sharing in all its trials and vicissitudes. In the operations of the Vigilance Committee he took the liveliest interest. Though not in form a member, he was one of its chief co-laborers. He brought it material aid continually, and was one of its main reliances for outside support. His quick sympathies were easily touched, and when touched were sure to prompt him to corresponding action. He would listen with moistened eyes to a tale of outrage, and go away saying never a word. But the story of wrong would work upon him, and through him upon others. His own feelings were communicated to his friends, and his friends would send gifts to the committee's treasury. A wider spread sympathy would manifest itself in the community, and the general interests of the cause would be visibly promoted. It was in the latter respect that of moral cooperation, that Dr. Furness's services were most valuable. After hearing a harrowing recital, 
whether he would or not it became the burden of his next sunday's sermon abundant proof of this may be found in his printed discourses take the following as an illustration it is an extract from a sermon delivered on the twenty ninth of may eighteen fifty four a period when the slave oligarchy was at the height of its power and was supported at the north by the most violent demonstrations of sympathy the text was feed my lambs and now brothers sisters children give me your hearts listen with a will to what i have to say as heaven is my witness i would not utter one word save for the dear love of christ and of god and the salvation of your own souls does it require any violent effort of the mind to suppose christ to address each one of us personally the same question that he put to peter lovest thou me and at the hearing of his brief command feed my lambs so simple so direct so unqualified are we prompted like the teacher of the law who when christ bade him love his neighbor as himself asked and who is my neighbor and in the parable of the good samaritan received an answer that the samaritans whom he despised just as we despise the african was his neighbor are we prompted in like manner to ask who are the lambs of christ who are his lambs behold that great multitude more than three millions of men and feeble women and children wandering on our soil no not wandering but chained down not allowed to stir a step at their own free will crushed and hunted with all the power of one of the mightiest nations that the world has yet seen wielded to keep them down in the depths of the deepest degradation into which human beings can be plunged these then that we despise are our neighbors the poor stricken lambs of christ to cast one thought towards them may well cause us to bow down our heads in the very dust with shame no wonder that professing to love christ and his religion we do not like to hear them spoken of for so far from feeding the lambs of christ we are exciting the whole associated power of this land to keep them from being fed feed my lambs we might feed them with fraternal sympathy with hope with freedom the imperishable bread of heaven we might lead them into green pastures and still waters into the glorious liberty wherewith christ died to make all men free the liberty of the children of god we might secure to them the exercise of every sacred affection and faculty wherewith the creator has endowed them but we do none of these things we suffer this great flock of the lord jesus to be treated as chattels bought and sold like beasts of burden hunted and lacerated by dogs and wolves i say we we of these free northern communities because it is by our allowance signified as effectually by silence as by active cooperation that such things are they could continue so scarcely an hour were not the whole moral religious and physical power of the north pledged to their support are we not in closest league and union with those who claim and use the right to buy and sell human beings god's poor the lambs of christ a union which we imagine brings us in as much silver and gold as compensates for the sacrifice of our humanity and manhood nay are we not under a law to do the base work of bloodhounds hunting the panting fugitives for freedom i utter no word of denunciation there is no need for facts that have occurred only within the last week transcend all denunciation only a few hours ago there was a man with his two sons hurried back into the inhuman bondage from which they had just escaped and that man the brother and those two sons the nephews of a colored clergyman of new york of such eminence in the new school presbyterian church that he has received the honors of a european university and has acted as moderator in one of the presbyteries of the same church when held in the city where he resides almost at the very moment the poor fugitive with his children 
were dragged through our city, the General Assembly of that very branch of the Presbyterian Church, now in session here, after discussing for days the validity of Roman Catholic baptism, threw out as inexpedient to be discussed the subject of that great wrong which was flinging back into the agony of slavery a brother of one of their own ordained ministers, and could not so much as breathe a word of condemnation against the false and cruel deed which has just been consummated at the capital of the nation. When such facts are occurring in the midst of us, we cannot be guiltless concerning the lambs of Christ. It is we, we who make up the public opinion of the North, we who consent that these free states shall be the hunting ground, where these, our poor brothers and sisters, are the game. It is we that withhold from them the bread of life, the inalienable rights of man. As we withhold these blessings, so it is in our power to bestow them. The sheep, then, that Christ commands us, as we love him, to feed, are those who are famishing for the lack of the food which it is in our power to supply. And we can help to feed and relieve and liberate them by giving our hearty sympathy to the blessed cause of their emancipation, to the abolition of the crying injustice with which they are treated, by uttering our earnest protest against the increasing and flagrant outrages of the oppressor, by withholding all aid and countenance from the work of oppression. To say that Dr. Furness, in his pleadings for the slave, was instant in season and out of season, is not to exaggerate. So palpably was this true, that even some of his sympathizing friends intimated to him that his zeal carried him beyond proper bounds, and that his discourses were needlessly reiterative. To these friends, who, it is needless to say, did not fully comprehend the breadth and bearing of the question, he would reply, as he did in the following extract from a sermon delivered soon after the one above quoted. Again and again I have had it said to me, with apparently the most perfect simplicity, Why do you keep saying so much about the slaves? Do you imagine that there is one among your hearers who does not agree with you? We all know that slavery is very wrong. What is the use of harping upon this subject Sunday after Sunday? We all feel about it just as you do. Feel about it just as I do, very likely, my friends. It is very possible that you all feel as much, and that many of you feel about it more than I do. God knows that my regret always has been not that I feel so much, but that I do not feel more. Would to heaven that neither you nor I could eat or sleep for pity, pity for our poor downtrodden brothers and sisters. But the thing to which I implore your attention now is not what we know and feel, but the delusion which we are under in confounding knowing with doing, in fancying that we are working to abolish slavery because we know that it is wrong. This is what I would have you now to consider the deception that we practice on ourselves, the dangerous error into which we fall, when we pass off the knowledge of our duty for the performance of it. These are two very distinct things. If you know what is right, happy are ye if you do it. Observe, my friends, what it is to which I am now entreating your consideration. It is not the wrongs nor the rights of the oppressed upon which I am now discoursing. It is our own personal exposure to a most serious mistake. It is a danger which threatens our own souls, to which I would that our eyes should be open and on the watch. And here, by the way, let me say that one great reason why I refer, as often as I do, to that great topic of the day, which in one shape or another is continually shaking the land and marking the age in which we live, is not merely the righting of the wronged, but the instruction, the moral enlightenment, the religious edification of our own hearts, which this momentous topic affords. To me this subject involves infinitely more than a mere question of humanity. Its political bearing is the very least and most superficial part of it. 
scarcely worth noticing in comparison with its moral and religious relations once deterred by its outside political aspect i shunned it as many do still but the more it has pressed itself on my attention the more i have considered it the more and more manifest has it become to me that it is a subject full of light and of guidance of warning and inspiration for the individual soul it is the most powerful means of grace and salvation appointed in the providence of heaven for the present day and generation more religious than churches and sabbaths it is full of sermons it is a perfect gospel a whole bible of mind enlightening heart cleansing soul saving truth how much light has it thrown for me on the page of the new testament what a profound significance has it disclosed in the precepts and parables of Jesus Christ? How do his words burst out with a new meaning? How does it help us to appreciate his trials and the godlike spirit with which he bore them? The dark winter of 1860 broke gloomily over all abolitionists. Perhaps upon none did it press more heavily than upon the small band in Philadelphia situated as that city is upon the very edge of slavery and socially bound as it was by ties of blood or affinity with the slaveholders of the south to all human foresight it would assuredly be the first theatre of bloodshed in the coming deadly struggle as dr furness said in his sermon on old john brown out of the grim cloud that hangs over the south a bolt has darted and blood has flowed and the place where the lightning struck is wild with fear the return stroke we all felt must soon follow and philadelphia we feared would be selected as the spot where slavery would make its first mortal onslaught and the abolitionists there the first victims dr furness had taken part in the public meeting held on the day of john brown's execution to offer prayers for the heroic soul that was then passing away and had gone with two or three others to the railroad station to receive the martyr's body when it was brought from the gallows by mr afterwards general tyndale and mr mckim and it was generally feared that he and his church would receive the brunt of slavery's first blow the air was thick with vague apprehension and rumor so much so that some of dr furness's devoted parishioners who followed his abolitionism but not his non-resistance came armed to church uncertain what an hour might bring forth or in what shape of mob violence or assassination the blow would fall few of dr furness's hearers will forget his sermon of december sixteenth eighteen sixty so full was it of prophetic warning and saddened by the thought of the fate which might be in store for him and his congregation it was printed in the evening bulletin and made a deep impression on the public outside of his own church and was reprinted in full in the boston atlas but the trouble cannot be escaped it must come but we can put it off by annihilating free speech by forbidding the utterance of a word in the pulpit and by the press for the rights of man by hurling back into the jaws of oppression the fugitive gasping for his sacred liberty by recognizing the right of one man to buy and sell other men by spreading the blasting curse of despotism over the whole soil of the nation you may allay the brutal frenzy of a handful of southern slave masters you may win back the cotton states to cease from threatening you with secession and to plant their feet upon your necks and so evade the trouble that now menaces us then you may live on the few years that are left you and perhaps it is not certain we may be permitted to make a little more money and die in our beds but no friends i am mistaken we cannot put the trouble off or if we put it off in its present shape only that it may take another and more terrible form if to get rid of the present alarm we concede all that makes it worth while to live and nothing less will avail perhaps those who can deliberately make such a concession will not feel the degradation 
but stripped of all honor and manhood, they may eat as heartily and sleep as soundly as ever. But the degradation is not the less, but the greater, for our unconsciousness of it. The trouble which we shall then bring upon ourselves is a trouble in comparison with which the loss of all things but honor is a glorious gain, and a violent death for right's sake on the scaffold or by the hands of a mob, peace and joy and victory. Since we are thus placed, and there is no alternative for us of the free states but to meet the trouble that is upon us, or by base concessions and compromises to bring upon ourselves a far greater trouble, in the name of God let us let all things go, and cleave to the right. Prepared to confront the crisis like men, let us with all possible calmness endeavor to take the measure of the calamity that we dread. God knows I have no desire to make light of it. But I affirm that never since the world began was there a grander cause for which to speak, to suffer, and to die, than the cause of these free states as against that of the states now rushing upon secession. The great grievance of which they complain is nothing more nor less than this, that we endanger the right they claim to treat human beings as beasts of burden. And they maintain this monstrous claim by measures inhuman and barbarous, listening not to the voice of reason or humanity, but treating every man who goes amongst them, suspected of not favoring their cause, or of the remotest connection with others who do not favor it, with a most savage and fiendish cruelty. It is the conflict between barbarism and civilization, between liberty and the most horrible despotism that ever cursed this earth, in which we are called to take part. And all that is great and noble in the past, all the patriots and martyrs that have suffered on man's behalf, all the sacred instincts and hopes of the human soul, are on our side, and the welfare of untold generations of men. Oh, if God in his infinite bounty grants us the grace to appreciate the transcendent worth of the cause which is now at stake, there is no trouble that can befall us, no, not the loss of property, of idolized parents or children, or life itself, that we shall not count a blessed privilege. To serve this dear cause of peace and liberty and love we have no need to grasp the sword or any instrument of violence and death. But we must be ready, without flinching, to confront the utmost that men can do, and amid all the uproar and violence of human passions, still calmly to assert and to exercise our sacred and inalienable liberties, let who will frown and forbid, assured that no just and law of God abiding people will ever do otherwise than give us their sympathy and their aid. Death is the worst that can befall us, if so be that we are faithful to the right. It is a solemn and a fearful thing to die, and mortality shrinks from facing that last great mystery. But we must all die, my friends, and the dying hour is not far distant from the youngest of us. To most of us it is very near. To many, only a few brief years remain. And for the sake of those few and uncertain years, shall we push off this present trouble upon our children, who have to stay here a little longer? There is nothing that can so sweeten the bitter cup of mortality when we shall be called to drink it, nothing that can so cheer us in the prospect of parting from all we love, nothing that can send such a blessed light on before us into the dark valley which we must enter, as the consciousness of fidelity to man and to God. And now, in these times of great trouble which have come upon us, we have a peculiar and special opportunity of testifying our fidelity, and of enjoying a full experience of its power to support us. We may gather from this trouble a sweetness that shall take away from all suffering its bitterness we may kindle that light in our bosoms which shall make death come to us as a radiant angel. Four months after the above was uttered, on the 28th of April, 1861, after the attack on Fort Sumter, and the whole North had burst into a flame, 
People of all denominations flocked to Dr. Furness's church, as to that church which had shown that it was founded on a rock. And none can ever forget the long-drawn breath with which the sermon began. The long agony is over. It was the te deum of a lifetime. Dr. Furness's words and counsels were not wanting throughout the war, and his sermons were constantly printed in the daily press and in separate pamphlet form, and since its close he has continued his absorbing study of the historical accounts of Jesus. Dr. Furness was born in Boston in April 1802, and graduated at Harvard in 1820, and five years later became the minister of the first Congregational Unitarian Christians in this city, and is consequently the senior clergyman there, on the score of length of pastorate. Happy is the man, and enviable the gospel minister, who, looking back upon his course in the great anti-slavery contest, can recall as the chief charge brought against him that of being overzealous, that he spoke too often and said too much in favor of the slave. There are but few men, and still fewer ministers, who have a right to take comfort from such recollections. And yet it is to this small class that the cause is most indebted under God for its triumph, and the country for its deliverance from slavery. End of section 11《ッション12オブ・ザ・アンダーグラウンド・レールロード・パート5》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Al Leach. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still, Section 12. Portraits and Sketches, William Lloyd Garrison, Part 1. The character and career of the leader of the movement for immediate emancipation in this country are too well known to be dwelt on here, nor in the space at our command is it possible to give in full those facts of his life which have already appeared in print. His earliest biographer was Mary Howitt, and another, even more famous authoress, Mrs. H. B. Stowe, in Men of Our Times, has stood in the same relation to him while his lifelong friend, Oliver Johnson, has written the best concise account of him in Appleton's New American Cyclopedia. Mr. Garrison, the Cyclopedia is on this point in error, was born December 12, 1804, in Newburyport, Massachusetts, his father, Abijah Garrison being a ship captain, trading with the West Indies, and his mother, Fanny Lloyd, a woman of remarkable beauty, as well as piety and force of character. Intemperate habits led the husband and father from home to a solitary and obscure end, leaving his family entirely dependent. William, or as he was always called, Lloyd, was the youngest but one of five children, and had not done with his schooling before he began to contribute to his own support. At first in Lynn, where he was set at shoemaking, at the age of eleven afterwards in Newburyport, and finally in 1818 at Haverhill, where he was apprenticed to a cabinet-maker. Not finding these trades suited to his taste, the same year he was indentured to Ephraim W. Allen, editor of the Newburyport Herald, and in the printing office he completed his education so far as he was to have any, with such early success as soon to be an acceptable contributor to his employer's paper, while the authorship of his articles was still his own secret. As soon as his apprenticeship came to a close in 1826, he became proprietor of the free press in his native city, but the paper failed of support. Seeking work as a journeyman, in Boston he was engaged in 1827 to edit, in the interest of total abstinence, the National Philanthropist the first paper of its kind ever published. On a change of proprietors in 1828, he was induced to join a friend in Bennington, Vermont, in publishing The Journal of the Times, 
which advocated the election of John Quincy Adams for president, besides being devoted to peace, temperance, anti-slavery, and other reforms. In this town, Mr. Garrison began his agitation of the subject of slavery, quote, in consequence of which there was transmitted to Congress an anti-slavery memorial more numerously signed than any similar paper previously submitted to that body." Unquote. It was in Bennington, too, that he received from Benjamin Lundy, who had met him the previous year at his boarding house in Boston, an invitation to go to Baltimore and aid him in editing The Genius of Universal Emancipation. Baltimore was no strange city to Mr. Garrison. Thither he had accompanied his mother in 1815, serving as a chore boy, and he had visited her just before her death in 1823. He took leave of Boston in the fall of 1829, after having acted as the orator of the day, July 4th, in Park Street Church and surprised his hearers by the boldness of his utterances on the subject of slavery. The causes of his imprisonment at Baltimore scarcely need to be repeated. For an alleged gross and malicious libel on a townsman of Newburyport, whose ship was engaged in the coastwise slave trade, and whom he accordingly denounced in the genius, he was tried and convicted and sentenced to pay a fine of fifty dollars and costs. The cell in which he was confined for forty-nine days, and from which he was liberated only by the spontaneous liberality of Arthur Tapin, a perfect stranger to him, he had the satisfaction of reseeking after the close of the war, in company with Judge Bond, but the prison had been removed. Compelled to part company with Lundy, to whom he has ever owned his moral indebtedness, Mr. Garrison at length started in Boston in January 1831, his liberator with little else besides his dauntless spirit and a press. The difficulties which beset the birth of this paper were never entirely overcome, and its publication was attended, through all the thirty-five years of its existence, with constant struggle and privation, and with personal labor at the printer's case and over the forms which only an iron constitution could have endured. The Liberator was the organ of the editor alone, and he gave room in it to the numerous reforms which were, in his mind, only subordinate to abolition. In 1865, the last volume was issued, Mr. Garrison having already in May withdrawn from the American Anti-Slavery Society, which he had helped to found in 1833, and of which, as he drew up the Declaration of Sentiments, he may be supposed to have known something of the original aims and proper duration. In September 1834, Mr. Garrison was married to Helen Eliza, daughter of the venerable philanthropist George Benson of Providence, Rhode Island, who had, even in the previous century, been an active member of a combined anti-slavery and freedmen's aid society in that city. In October 1835 occurred the Boston Riot, led by a, quote, gentleman of property and standing, unquote, in which Mr. Garrison's life was imperiled and which made him once more familiar with the interior of a jail, this time a place of refuge. In 1832, he went to England as an agent of the New England Anti-Slavery Society to awaken English sympathy for the anti-slavery movement and to undeceive Clarkson and Wilberforce and their distinguished associates as to the nature and object of the Colonization Society, as to which he had already had occasion to undeceive himself. His mission was eminently successful in both its aspects and resulted in the subsequent visits of George Thompson to this country, between whom and himself a strong personal attachment had arisen and has ever since continued. A second visit to England he made as a delegate to the world's anti-slavery convention, in which he refused to sit after his female colleagues had been rejected. A third visit 
still in behalf of the cause, took place in 1846. Twenty years later, the war over and slavery abolished, he again went abroad to repair his health and renew old friendships, and for the first time passed over to the continent. In England he was greeted with cordial appreciation and hospitality by all classes. Numerous public receptions of a most flattering character were given to him, but without the effect of causing him to magnify his own merits or to forget the honor due to his associates in the anti-slavery struggle. At the London breakfast where John Bright presided and John Stuart Mill, the Duke of Argyll, and others spoke, he said when called upon to reply, quote, I disclaim with all the sincerity of my soul any special praise for anything I have done. I have simply tried to maintain the integrity of my soul before God and to do my duty. Unquote. In Edinburgh, the freedom of the city was conferred upon him with impressive ceremonies, he being the third American ever thus honored. In Paris, he was also received with distinction, his special mission to that city being to attend the International Anti-Slavery Convention in the capacity of a delegate from the American Freedmen's Union Commission, of which he was the first vice president. The justice of the war on the part of the North and its effect on the fate of slavery at the South were never subjects of doubt in the mind of Mr. Garrison, and he quickly recognized the force of events which had taken from the abolitionists the helm of direction and reunited them with their countrymen in the irresistible flood which no man's hand guided and no man's hand could stay. An agitator from conviction and not from choice, he was only too glad to lay down the heavy burden of a lifetime and retire to well-earned repose after such a vision of faint hope realized as certainly no other reformer was ever blessed with. He had lived to see the disunion which he advocated on sacred principles, attempted by the South in the name of the sum of all villainies, the uprising of the North, the grand career of Lincoln, the proclamation of emancipation, the arming of the blacks, his own son among their officers, the end of rebellion, and the consummation of his prayers and labors for the salvation of his country. He had taken part in the ceremonies at the recovery of Sumter, had walked the streets of Charleston, and received floral tokens of the gratitude of the emancipated. To him it seemed as if his work was done, and that he might, without suspicion or accusation, cease to be conspicuous, or to occupy the public attention in any way relating to the past, and recalling his part in the anti-slavery struggle. Notoriety, no longer a necessity, was eagerly avoided, and the physical rest, which was now enjoined upon him, the liberality of his friends having enabled him to secure, he settled down into the quiet life of a private citizen, whose great duty had become to him merely one of the duties which every man owes his country and his race. His sweet temper, his modesty, his unfailing cheerfulness, his rarely mistaken judgment of men and measures, his blameless and happy domestic life, and his hospitality, his warm sympathy with all forms of human suffering. These and other qualities which cannot be enumerated here will doubtless receive the just judgment of posterity. End of section 12section 13 of the underground railroad part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria casper the underground railroad part 5 by william still section 13 portraits and sketches William Lloyd Garrison, Part Two. As a fitting adjunct to the foregoing sketch, extracts from some of the speeches made at the London breakfast so magnanimously extended to Mr. Garrison in 1867 
are here introduced. As presiding officer on the occasion, John Bright, M.P., spoke as follows. Speech of Mr. Bright, M.P. The position in which I am placed this morning is one very unusual for me, and one that I find somewhat difficult, but I consider it a signal distinction to be permitted to take a prominent part in the proceedings of this day, which are intended to commemorate one of the greatest of the triumphs of freedom, and to do honor to a most eminent instrument in the achievement of that freedom. Hear, hear. There may be, perhaps, those who ask, what is this triumph of which I speak? To put it briefly, and indeed only to put one part of it, I may say that it is a triumph which has had the effect of raising four million of human beings from the very lowest depths of social and political degradation to that lofty height which men have attained when they possess equality of rights in the first country on the globe. Cheers. More than this, it is a triumph which has pronounced the irreversible doom of slavery in all countries and for all time. Renewed cheers. Another question suggests itself. How has this great matter been accomplished? The answer suggests itself in another question. How is it that any great matter is accomplished? By love of justice, by constant devotion to a great cause, and by an unfaltering faith that that which is right will in the end succeed. Hear, hear. When I look at this hall, filled with such an assembly, when I partake of the sympathy which runs from heart to heart at this moment, in welcome of our guest today, I cannot but contrast his present position with that which, not so far back, but that many of us can remember, he occupied in his own country. It is not forty years ago, I believe about the year 1829, when the guest whom we honor this morning was spending his solitary days in a prison in the slave-owning city of Baltimore. I will not say that he was languishing in prison, for that I do not believe. He was sustained by a hope that did not yield to the persecution of those who thus maltreated him, and to show that the effect of that imprisonment was of no avail to suppress or extinguish his ardor, within two years after that he had the courage, the audacity, I dare say many of his countrymen used even a stronger phrase than that, he had the courage to commence the publication in the city of Boston of a newspaper devoted mainly to the question of the abolition of slavery. The first number of that paper, issued on the 1st of January, 1831, contained an address to the public, one passage of which I have often read with the greatest interest, and it is a key to the future life of Mr. Garrison. He had been complained of for having used hard language, which is a very common complaint indeed, and he said in his first number, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for such severity? I will be as harsh as truth, and as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retract a single inch, and I will be heard. Cheers and that, after all, expresses to a great extent the future course of his life. But what was at that time the temper of the people amongst whom he lived, of the people who are glorying now, as they may well glory, in the abolition of slavery throughout their country? At that time it was very little better in the North than it was in the South. I think it was in the year 1835 that riots of the most serious character took place in some of the northern cities. During that time Mr. Garrison's life was in most imminent peril, and he has never ascertained to this day how it was that he was left alive on the earth to carry on his great work. Turning to the South, a state that has lately suffered from the ravages of armies, the state of Georgia, by its legislature of House, Senate, and Governor, if my memory does not deceive me, passed a bill offering ten thousand dollars reward. Mr. Garrison here said five thousand. Well, they seemed to think that there were people who would do it cheap. Laughter. Offered five thousand dollars, and zeal, doubtless, would make up the difference. 
for the capture of Mr. Garrison, or for adequate proof of his death. Now these were menaces and perils such as we have not in our time been accustomed to in this country, in any of our political movements. Hear, hear. And we shall take a very poor measure indeed of the conduct of the leaders of the Emancipation Party in the United States, if we estimate them by any of those who have been concerned in political movements amongst us. But notwithstanding all drawbacks, the cause was gathering strength, and Mr. Garrison found himself by and by surrounded by a small but increasing band of men and women who were devoted to this cause as he himself was. We have in this country a very noble woman who taught the English people much upon this question about thirty years ago. I allude to Harriet Martineau. Cheers. I recollect well the impression with which I read a most powerful and touching paper which she had written, and which was published in the number of the Westminster Review for December 1838. It was entitled The Martyr Age of the United States. The paper introduced to the English public the great names which were appearing on the scene in connection with this cause in America. There was, of course, I need not mention, our eminent guest of today. There was Arthur Tappan and Louis Tappan, and James G. Burney of Alabama, a planter and slave owner, who liberated his slaves and came north, and became, as I think, the first presidential candidate upon abolition principles in the United States. Hear, hear. There were, besides them, Dr. Channing, John Quincy Adams, a statesman and president of the United States, and father of the eminent man who is now minister from that people amongst us. Cheers. Then there was Wendell Phillips, admitted to be, by all who know him, perhaps the most powerful orator who speaks the English language. Hear, hear. I might refer to others. To Charles Sumner, the well-known statesman, and Horace Greeley, I think the first of journalists in the United States, if not the first of journalists in the world. Hear, hear. But besides these, there were of noble women not a few. There was Lydia Maria Child. There were the two sisters, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, ladies who came from South Carolina, who liberated their slaves and devoted all they had to the service of this just cause. And Maria Weston Chapman, of whom Miss Martineau speaks in terms which, though I do not exactly recollect them, yet I know described her as noble-minded, beautiful, and good. It may be that there are some of her family who are now within the sound of my voice. If it be so, all I have to say is that I hope they will feel, in addition to all they have felt heretofore as to the character of their mother, that we who are here can appreciate her services and the services of all who were united with her, as co-operators in this great and worthy cause. But there was another whose name must not be forgotten, a man whose name must live forever in history, Elijah P. Lovejoy, who in the free state of Illinois laid down his life for the cause. Hear, hear! When I read that article by Harriet Martineau, and the description of those men and women were given, I was led, I know not how, to think of a very striking passage, which I am sure must be familiar to most here, because it is to be found in the Epistle to the Hebrews. After the writer of that epistle has described the great men and fathers of the nation, he says, Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. I ask if this grand passage of the inspired writer may not be applied to that heroic band who have made America the perpetual home of freedom enthusiastic cheering. Thus, in spite of all that persecution could do, opinion grew in the North in favor of freedom. 
but in the South, alas, in favor of that most devilish delusion, that slavery was a divine institution. The moment that idea took possession of the South, war was inevitable. Neither fact, nor argument, nor counsel, nor philosophy, nor religion, could by any possibility affect the discussion of the question, when once the church leaders of the South had taught their people that slavery was a divine institution, for then they took their stand on other and different, and what they in their blindness thought higher grounds, and they said, Evil be thou my good, and so they exchanged light for darkness, and freedom for bondage, and good for evil, and, if you like, heaven for hell. There was a universal feeling in the North that every care should be taken of those who had so recently and marvelously been enfranchised. Immediately we found that the privileges of independent labor were open to them. Schools were established in which their sons might obtain an education that would raise them to an intellectual position never reached by their fathers, and at length full political rights were conferred upon those who a few short years or rather months before had been called chattels and things to be bought and sold in any market hear hear and we may feel assured that those persons in the northern states who befriended the negro in his bondage will not now fail to assist his struggles for a higher position to mr garrison more than any other man this is due his is the creation of that opinion which has made slavery hateful and which has made freedom possible in america hear hear his name is venerated in his own country venerated where not long ago it was a name of obloquy and reproach his name is venerated in this country and in europe wheresoever christianity softens the hearts and lessens the sorrows of men and i venture to say that in time to come near or remote i know not his name will become the herald and the synonym of good to millions of men who will dwell on the now almost unknown continent of africa loud cheers to mr garrison as is stated in one of the letters which has just been read to william lloyd garrison it has been given in a manner not often permitted to those who do great things of this kind to see the ripe fruit of his vast labors over a territory large enough to make many realms he has seen hopeless toil supplanted by compensated industry and where the bondman dragged his chain there freedom is established forever loud cheers we now welcome him amongst us as a friend whom some of us have known long for i have watched his career with no common interest even when i was too young to take much part in public affairs and i have kept within my heart his name and the names of those who have been associated with him in every step which he has taken and in public debate in the halls of peace and even on the blood-soiled fields of war my heart has always been with those who were the friends of freedom renewed cheering we welcome him then with a cordiality which knows no stint and no limit for him and for his noble associates both men and women after this eloquent and able speech by the chairman the honor of proposing an address to mr garrison devolved upon the duke of argyle who introduced the subject in the following glowing speech speech of the duke of argyle mr chairman ladies and gentlemen it is hard to follow an address of such extraordinary beauty simplicity and power but it now becomes my duty at your command sir to move an address of hearty congratulation to our distinguished guest william lloyd garrison cheers sir this country is from time to time honored by the presence of many distinguished and of a few illustrious men but for the most part we are contented to receive them with that private cordiality and hospitality with which i trust we shall always receive strangers who visit our shores the people of this country are not preeminently an emotional people they are not naturally fond of public demonstrations and it is only upon rare occasions that we give or can give such a reception as that which we see here this day 
there must be something peculiar in the cause which a man has served, in the service which he has rendered, and in our own relations with the people whom he represents, to justify or to account for such a reception. Hear, hear. As regards the cause, it is not too much to say that the cause of Negro emancipation in the United States of America has been the greatest cause which in ancient or in modern times has been pleaded at the bar of the moral judgment of mankind. Cheers. I know that to some this will sound as the language of exaggerated feeling, but I can only say that I have expressed myself in language which I believe conveys the literal truth. Hear, hear. I have indeed often heard it said, in deprecation of the amount of interest which was bestowed in this country, on the cause of negro emancipation in america that we are apt to forget the forms of suffering which are immediately at our own doors over which we have some control and to express exaggerated feeling as to the forms of suffering with which we have nothing to do and for which we are not responsible i have never objected to that language in so far as it might tend to recall us to the duties which lie immediately around us and in so far as it might tend to make us feel the forgetfulness of which we are sometimes guilty of the misery and poverty in our own country but on the other hand i will never admit for i think it would be confounding great moral distinctions that the miseries which arise by way of natural consequence out of the poverty and the vices of mankind are to be compared with those miseries which are the direct result of positive law and of a positive institution, giving to man property in man. Loud cheers. It is true also that there have been forms of servitude, meaning thereby compulsory labor, against which we do not entertain the same feelings of hostility and horror with which we have regarded slavery in America. It was a system of which it may be truly said that it was twice cursed. It cursed him who served, and it cursed him that owned the slave. Hear, hear. When we recollect the insuperable temptations which that system held out to maintain in a state of degradation and ignorance a whole race of mankind, the horrors of the internal slave trade, more widely demoralizing, in my opinion, than the foreign slave trade itself, the violence which was done to the sanctities of domestic life, the corrupting effect which it was having upon the very churches of Christianity, when we recollect all these things, we can fully estimate the evil from which my distinguished friend and his coadjutors have at last redeemed their country. Cheers! It was not only the slave states which were concerned in the guilt of slavery. It had struck its roots deep in the free states of North America. We honor Mr. Garrison in the first place, for the immense pluck and courage he displayed. Cheers! Sir, you have truly said that there is no comparison between the contests in which he had to fight and the most bitter contests of our own public life. In looking back, no doubt, to the contest which was maintained in this country some thirty-five years ago against slavery in our colonies, we may recollect that Clarkson and Wilberforce were denounced as fanatics, and had to encounter much opprobrium, but it must not be forgotten that so far as regards the entwining of the roots of slavery into the social system, in the opinions and interests of mankind, there was no comparison whatever between the circumstances of that contest here and those which attended it in America. Hear, hear. The number of persons who in this country were enlisted on the side of slavery by personal interest was always comparatively few. Whilst in attacking slavery at its headquarters in the United States, Mr. Garrison had to encounter the fiercest passions which could be roused. Thank God Mr. Garrison appears before us as the representative of the United States. Freedom is now the policy of the government and the assured policy of the country, and we can today accept and welcome Mr. Garrison not merely as the liberator of the slaves, but as the representative also of the American government. Cheers! End of section 13
Section 14 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 14. Portraits and Sketches, William Lloyd Garrison. Part three. Sir, we heartily welcome you to England, in the name of thousands of Englishmen who have watched with admiring sympathy your labors for the redemption of the Negro race from slavery, and for that which is a higher object than the redemption of any single race, the vindication of the universal principles of humanity and justice, and who, having sympathized with you in the struggle, now rejoice with you in the victory. Forty years ago, when you commenced your efforts, slavery appeared to be rapidly advancing to complete ascendancy in America. Not only was it dominant in the southern states, but even in the free states it had bowed the constituencies, society, and in too many instances even the churches, to its will. Commerce, linked to it by interest, lent it her support. A great party, compactly organized and vigorously wielded, placed in its hands the power of the state. It bestowed political offices and honors, and was thereby enabled to command the apostate homage of political ambition. Other nations felt the prevalence in your national councils of its insolent and domineering spirit. There was a moment, most critical in the history of America and of the world, when it seemed as though that continent, with all its resources and all its hopes, was about to become the heritage of the slave power. But providence interposes to prevent the permanent triumph of evil. It interposes not visibly or by the thunderbolt, but by inspiring and sustaining high moral effort and heroic lives. You commenced your crusade against slavery in isolation, in weakness, and in obscurity. The emissaries of authority with difficulty found the office of the liberator, in a mean room, where its editor was aided only by a negro boy, and supported by a few insignificant persons, so the officers termed them, of all colors. You were denounced, persecuted, and hunted down by mobs of wealthy men, alarmed for the interests of their class. You were led out by one of these mobs, and saved from their violence and the imminent peril of death, almost by a miracle. You were not turned from your path of devotion to your cause and to the highest interests of your country, by denunciation, persecution, or the fear of death. You have lived to stand victorious and honored in the very stronghold of slavery, to see the flag of the Republic now truly free, replace the flag of slavery on Fort Sumter, and to proclaim the doctrines of the Liberator in the city and beside the grave of Calhoun. Enemies of war, we most heartily wish, and doubt not that you wish as heartily as we do, that this deliverance could have been wrought out by peaceful means. But the fierce passions engendered by slavery in the slave owner determined it otherwise, and we feel at liberty to rejoice, since the struggle was inevitable, that its issue has been the preservation, not the extinction, of all that we hold most dear. We are, however, not more thankful for the victories of freedom in the field than for the moderation and mercy shown by the victors, which have exalted and hallowed their cause and ours in the eyes of all nations. We shall now watch with anxious hope the development, amidst the difficulties which still beset the regeneration of the South, of a happier order of things in the states rescued from slavery, and the growth of free communities, in which your name, with the names of your fellow workers in the same cause, will be held in grateful and lasting remembrance. Once more we welcome you to a country in which you will find many sincere admirers and warm friends. Earl Russell and John Stuart Mill, M.P., at the close of this address, followed with most eloquent speeches, conferring on the honored guest the highest praise for his lifelong and successful labors in the cause of freedom. After these gentlemen had taken their seats, the chairman proposed that the address should be passed unanimously. 
the chairman's call was responded to by the whole assemblage lifting up their hands and mr garrison presenting himself in front of the platform was received with an enthusiastic burst of cheering hats and handkerchiefs being waved by nearly all present speech of mr garrison mr garrison said mr chairman ladies and gentlemen for this marked expression of your personal respect and appreciation of my labors in the cause of human freedom and of your esteem and friendship for the land of my nativity i offer you one and all my grateful acknowledgments but i am so profoundly impressed by the formidable array of rank genius intellect scholarship and moral and religious worth which i see before me that i fear i shall not be able to address you except with a fluttering pulse and a stammering tongue for me this is indeed an anomalous position assuredly this is treatment with which i have not been familiar for more than thirty years i had to look the fierce and unrelenting hostility of my countrymen in the face with few to cheer me onward in all the south i was an outlaw and could not have gone there though an american citizen guiltless of wrong and though that flag here the speaker pointed to the united states ensign had been over my head except at the peril of my life nay with the certainty of finding a bloody grave hear hear in all the north i was looked upon with hatred and contempt the whole nation subjugated to the awful power of slavery rose up in mobocratic tumult against any and every effort to liberate the millions held in bondage on its soil and yet i demanded nothing that was not perfectly just and reasonable in exact accordance with the declaration of american independence and the golden rule i was not the enemy of any man living i cherish no personal enmities i know nothing of them in my heart even whilst the southern slaveholders were seeking my destruction i never for a moment entertained any other feeling toward them than an earnest desire under god to deliver them from a deadly curse and an awful sin hear hear it was neither a sectional nor a personal matter at all it had exclusive reference to the eternal law of justice between man and man and the rights of human nature itself sir i always found in america that a shower of brickbats had a remarkably tonic effect materially strengthening to the backbone laughter but sir the shower of compliments and applause which has greeted me on this occasion would assuredly cause my heart to fail me were it not that this generous reception is only incidentally personal to myself hear hear you ladies and gentlemen are here mainly to celebrate the triumph of humanity over its most brutal foes to rejoice that universal emancipation has at last been proclaimed throughout the united states and to express as you have already done through the mouths of the eloquent speakers who have preceded me sentiments of peace and goodwill toward the american republic sure i am that these sentiments will be heartily reciprocated by my countrymen cheers i must here disclaim with all sincerity of soul any special praise for anything that i have done i have simply tried to maintain the integrity of my soul before god and to do my duty cheers i have refused to go with the multitude to do evil i have endeavored to save my country from ruin i have sought to liberate such as were held captive in the house of bondage but all this i ought to have done and now rejoicing here with you at the marvelous change which has taken place across the atlantic i am unable to express the satisfaction i feel in believing that henceforth my country will be a mighty power for good in the world while she held a seventh portion of her vast population in a state of chattelism it was in vain that she boasted of her democratic principles and her free institutions ostentatiously holding her declaration of independence in one hand and brutally wielding her slave-driving lash in the other marvelous inconsistency and unparalleled assurance but now god be praised she is free free to advance the cause of liberty throughout the world loud cheers sir this is not the first time i have been in england i have been here three times before on anti-slavery missions and wherever i traveled i was always exultantly told 
Slaves cannot breathe in England. Now, at last, I am at liberty to say, and I came over with the purpose to say it, slaves cannot breathe in America. Cheers. And so England and America stand side by side in the cause of Negro emancipation, and side by side may they stand in all that is just and noble and good, leading the way gloriously in the world's redemption. Loud cheers. I came to this country for the first time in 1833 to undeceive Wilberforce, Clarkson, and other eminent philanthropists in regard to the real character, tendency, and object of the American Colonization Society. I am happy to say that I quickly succeeded in doing so. Before leaving, I had the pleasure of receiving a protest against that society as an obstruction to the cause of freedom throughout the world and consequently as undeserving of British confidence and patronage, signed by William Wilberforce, Thomas Fowell Buxton, Zachary Macaulay, and other illustrious philanthropists. On arriving in London, I received a polite invitation by letter from Mr. Buxton to take breakfast with him. Presenting myself at the appointed time, when my name was announced, instead of coming forward promptly to take me by the hand, he scrutinized me from head to foot, and then inquired somewhat dubiously, Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Garrison, of Boston, in the United States? Yes, sir, I replied, I am he, and I am here in accordance with your invitation. Lifting up his hands, he exclaimed, Why, my dear sir, I thought you were a black man, and I have consequently invited this company of ladies and gentlemen to be present to welcome Mr. Garrison, the black advocate of emancipation from the United States of America. Laughter. I have often said, sir, that that is the only compliment I have ever had paid to me that I care to remember or tell of, for Mr. Buxton had somehow or other supposed that no white American could plead for those in bondage as I had done, and therefore I must be black. Laughter. It is indeed true, sir, that I have had no other rule by which to be guided than this. I never cared to know precisely how many stripes were inflicted on the slaves. I never deemed it necessary to go down into the southern states if I could have gone for the purpose of taking the exact dimensions of the slave system. I made it from the start, and always, my own cause, thus. Did I want to be a slave? No. Did God make me to be a slave? No. But I am only a man, only one of the human race. And if not created to be a slave, then no other human being was made for that purpose. My wife and children, dearer to me than my heart's blood, were they made for the auction block? Never. And so it was all very easily settled here, pointing to his breast. Great cheering. I could not help being an uncompromising abolitionist. Here, allow me to pay a brief tribute to the American abolitionists. Putting myself entirely out of the question, I believe that in no land at any time was there ever a more devoted, self-sacrificing, and uncompromising band of men and women. Nothing can be said to their credit which they do not deserve. With apostolic zeal they counted nothing dear to them for the sake of the slave, and him dehumanized. But whatever has been achieved through them is all of God, to whom alone is the glory due. Thankful are we all that we have been permitted to live to see this day, for our country's sake, and for the sake of mankind. Of course we are glad that our reproach is at last taken away, for it is very desirable, if possible, to have the good opinions of our fellow men. But if, to secure these, we must sell our manhood and sully our souls, then their bad opinions of us are to be coveted instead. Sir, my special part in this grand struggle was in first unfurling the banner of immediate and unconditional emancipation, and attempting to make a common rally under it. This I did, not in a free state, but in the city of Baltimore, in the slaveholding state of Maryland. It was not long before I was arrested, tried, condemned by a packed jury, and incarcerated in prison for my anti-slavery sentiments. This was in 1830. 
In 1864 I went to Baltimore for the first time since my imprisonment. I do not think that I could have gone at an earlier period except at the peril of my life, and then only because the American government was there in force holding the rebel elements in subserviency. I was naturally curious to see the old prison again, and if possible to get into my old cell. But when I went to the spot, behold, the prison had vanished, and so I was greatly disappointed. Laughter. On going to Washington, I mentioned to President Lincoln the disappointment I had met with. With a smiling countenance and a ready wit, he replied, So, Mr. Garrison, the difference between 1830 and 1864 appears to be this. In 1830 you could not get out, and in 1864 you could not get in. Great laughter. This was not only wittily said, but it truthfully indicated the wonderful revolution that had taken place in Maryland, for she had adopted the very doctrine for which she imprisoned me, and given immediate and unconditional emancipation to her 80,000 slaves. Cheers. I commenced the publication of The Liberator in Boston on the 1st of January, 1831. At that time I was very little known, without allies, without means, without subscribers. Yet no sooner did that little sheet make its appearance than the South was thrown into convulsions, as if it had suddenly been invaded by an army with banners. Notwithstanding, the whole country was on the side of the slave power, the church, the state, all parties, all denominations, ready to do its bidding. Oh, the potency of truth, and the inherent weakness and conscious insecurity of great wrong! Immediately a reward of five thousand dollars was offered for my apprehension by the state of Georgia. When General Sherman was making his victorious march through that state, it occurred to me, but too late, that I ought to have accompanied him and in person claimed the reward. Laughter but I remembered that had I done so, I should have had to take my pay in Confederate currency, and therefore it would not have paid traveling expenses. Renewed laughter. Where is Southern slavery now? Cheers. Henceforth, through all coming time, advocates of justice and friends of reform, be not discouraged. For you will and you must succeed if you have a righteous cause. No matter, at the outset, how few may be disposed to rally round the standard you have raised, if you battle unflinchingly and without compromise, if yours be a faith that cannot be shaken, because it is linked to the eternal throne, it is only a question of time when victory shall come to reward your toils. Seemingly no system of iniquity was ever more strongly entrenched, or more sure and absolute in its sway than that of American slavery, yet it has perished. In the earthquake God has spoken. He has smitten with his thunder, the iron walls asunder, and the gates of brass are broken. So it has been, so it is, so it ever will be throughout the earth, in every conflict for the right. Great cheering. Ladies and gentlemen, I began my advocacy of the anti-slavery cause at the North, in the midst of brickbats and rotten eggs. I ended it on the soil of South Carolina, almost literally buried beneath the wreaths and flowers which were heaped upon me by her liberal bondmen. Cheers. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 15. Portraits and Sketches, Lewis Tappan, Part 1. Was one of the warmest friends of the slave and of the colored man. He was very solicitous for their welfare, and that the colored people who were free should be enlightened and educated. He opened a Sunday school for colored adults, which was numerously attended, in West Broadway, New York, and with a few others devoted the most of the Sabbath to their teaching. When he and his brother Arthur assembled the seventy anti-slavery agents, who were thereafter, like firebrands, scattered all over the land, they held their meetings in this room. 
These agents were entertained by abolitionists in the city, and many of us had two or three of them in each of our families for a couple of weeks. They went out all over the land and were instrumental in diffusing more truth perhaps about the dreadful system of American slavery than was accomplished in any other way. He also aided in establishing several periodicals, brimful of anti-slavery truth, among which were the Anti-Slavery Record, The Emancipator, The Slave's Friend, the latter to indoctrinate the children in anti-slavery. The American Missionary Society, originally begun for the support of a mission in Africa, on the occasion of the return of the Amistad captors to the native land, and now doing so much for the freedmen of the South, was almost entirely established by his efforts. During the continuance of slavery, much was done by this society for the diffusion of anti-slavery gospel. The Vigilance Committee for Aiding and Befriending Fugitives, of which I was treasurer for many years, had no better or warmer friend than he. He was almost always at their meetings, which were known only to the elect, for we dared not hold them too publicly, as we almost always had some of the travelers toward the North Star present, whose masters or their agents were frequently in the city, in hot pursuit. At first we sent them to Canada, but after a while sent them only to Syracuse and the center of the state. In 1834, I think, was the first rioting, the sacking of Mr. Tappan's house in Rose Street. The mob brought all his furniture out, and piling it up in the street, set it on fire. The family were absent at the time. Soon after, they stoned Reverend Mr. Ludlow's and Dr. Cox's church, and the house of the latter. They threatened Arthur Tappan and Company's store in Pearl Street, but hearing that there were a few loaded muskets there, they took it out in threats. But their mercantile establishment was almost ostracized at this time by the dry goods merchants. And country merchants in all parts of the country, north as well as south, did not dare to have it known that they bought goods of them. And when they did so, requested particularly that the bundles or boxes should not be marked from A. Tappan and Company, as was customary. Southern merchants especially avoided them. And when two or three years later, there was a general insolvency among them, occasionally large losses to New York merchants, and in some cases failure. The Tappans were saved by having no southern debts. Through Mr. Tappan's influence and extensive correspondence abroad, many remittances came for the help of the Vigilance Committee from England and Scotland, and at one time an extensive invoice of useful and fancy articles in several large boxes was received from the Glasgow ladies, sufficient to furnish a large bazaar or fair, which was held in Brooklyn for the benefit of the committee. Although lately afflicted by disease, Mr. Tappan still lives in the enjoyment of all his faculties, and a good measure of health, and in his advanced years sees now some of the great results of his lifelong efforts for the restoration and maintenance of human rights. Although still suffering under many of the evils which slavery has inflicted upon him, the American slave no longer exists. Instead, stands up in all our southern states the freed man, knowing his rights, and as a rule enjoying them. Original American abolitionists, who met the scorn and odium, the imputed shame and obloquy, the frowns and cold shoulders which they bore through all the dark days of slavery, now see and feel their reward in some measure, to be completed only when they shall hear the plaudit, Inasmuch as ye have done it to the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Anthony Lane, New York, November 8, 1871 Mr. Lane, Mr. Tappan's personal friend who labored with him in the anti-slavery cause, and especially in the Vigilance Committee for many years, from serious affection of his eyes, was not prepared to furnish as full a sketch of his, Mr. T.'s, labors as was desirable. Mr. Tappan was, therefore, requested to furnish a few reminiscences from his own storehouse, which he kindly did as follows. William Still, Esquire. My dear sir, in answer to your request that I would furnish an article for your forthcoming book, giving incidents within my personal knowledge relating to the Underground Railroad, I have already apprised you of my illness and my consequent inability to write such an article as would be worthy of your publication. However, feeling somewhat relieved today from my paralysis owing to the cheering sunshine and the favor of my almighty preserver, I will try to do what I can in dictating a few anecdotes to my amanuensis which may afford you and your readers some gratification. These facts I must give without reference to date, as I will not tax my memory with perhaps a vain attempt to narrate them in order. As mentioned in my Life of Arthur Tappan, some abolitionists 
myself among the number, doubted the propriety of engaging in such measures as were contemplated by the conductors of the Underground Railroad, fearing that they would not be justified in aiding slaves to escape from their masters. But reflection convinced them that it was not only right to assist men in efforts to obtain their liberty, when unjustly held in bondage, but a duty. Abolitionists, white and colored, both in slave and free states, entered into extensive correspondence, set their wits at work to devise various expedients for the relief from bondage and transmission to the free states and to Canada of many of the most enterprising bondmen and bondwomen. They vied with each other in devising means for the accomplishment of this objective. Those who had money contributed it freely, and those who were destitute of money gave their time, saying with the apostle, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. 1. I recollect that one morning on reaching my office, that of the treasurer of the American Missionary Association, my assistant told me that in the inner room were eighteen fugitives, men, women, and children who had arrived that morning from the south in one company. On going into the room, I saw them lying about on the bales and boxes of clothing, destined for our various missionary stations, fatigued, as they doubtless were, after their sleepless and protracted struggle for freedom. On inquiry, I learned that they had come from a southern city. After most extraordinary efforts, it seemed that they had, while in slavery, secretly banded together and put themselves under the guidance of an intrepid conductor, whom they had hired to conduct them without the limits of the city in the evening, when the police force was changed. They came through Pennsylvania and New Jersey to my office. The agent of the Underground Railroad in New York took charge of them and forwarded them to Albany and by different agencies to Canada. 2. I well remember that one morning as I entered the Sabbath school, one of the scholars, a Mrs. Mercy Smith, beckoned to me to come to her class, and there introduced me to a young girl of about fifteen, as a fugitive, who had arrived the day before. In answer to my inquiries, this girl told me the name of the southern city and the names of the persons who had held her as a slave, and the mode of her escape, etc. I was walking near the water, she said, when a white sailor spoke to me and after a few questions offered to hide me on board his vessel and conduct me safely to New York if I would come to him in the evening. I did so, and was hid and fed by him, and on landing at New York he conducted me to Mrs. Smith's house, where I am now staying. Footnote. For three years I superintended a Sabbath school mostly composed of colored children and adults. Most of the teachers were warm-hearted abolitionists, and the whole number taught in the school during this period was seven or eight hundred. End footnote. To my inquiry, have you parents living and also brothers and sisters? She replied, there is no child but myself. Were not your parents kind to you, and did you not love them? Yes, I love them very much. How were you treated by your master and mistress? They treated me very well. How then, said I, could you put yourself in the care of that sailor, who was a stranger to you, and leave your parents? I shall never forget her heartfelt reply. He told me I should be free. One Sunday morning I received a letter informing me that an officer belonging to Savannah, Georgia, had started for New York, in pursuit of two young men of nineteen or twenty, who had been slaves of one of the principal physicians of the place, and who had escaped and were supposed to be in New York. The letter requested me to find them and give them warning. As there was no time to be lost, I concluded to go over to New York, notwithstanding the doubtfulness of attempting to find them in so large a city. I wrote notices to be read in the colored churches and colored Sabbath schools which I delivered in person. I then went to the colored school, superintended by Rev. C. B. Bay. I stated my errand to him with a description of the young men. Why, said he, I must have one of them in my school. He took me to a class where I found one of the young men to whom I gave the needful information. He told me that his father was Dr. Blank of Savannah, and that he had five children by the young man's mother, who was his slave. On his marriage to a white woman, he sent his five colored children and their mother to auction, to be sold for cash to the highest bidder. On being put upon the auction block, this young man addressed the bystanders and told them the circumstances of the case that his mother had long lived in the family of the doctor, that it was cruel to sell her and her children. And he warned the people not to bid for him, for he would no longer be a slave to any man, and if anyone bought him, he would lose his money. He added, I thought it right to say this, 
I then spoke to the crowd. My father, said I, has long been one of your first doctors, and do you think it right for him to sell my mother and his children in this way? I was sold, and my brother also, and the rest, although my brother said to the crowd what I had said. We soon made our escape, and are now both in the city. I am a blacksmith, and have worked six months in one shop in New York with white journeymen, not one of whom believes, I suppose, that I am a colored man. It was not surprising, for so fair was his complexion, that with the aid of a brown wig, after he had cut off his hair, he was completely disguised. He soon notified his brother, who lived in another part of the city, and both put themselves out of harm's way. They were remarkably fine young men, and it seemed a special providence that I should find them in such a large city, and direct them to escape from their pursuer, within one hour after I left my house in Brooklyn. I felt it to be an answer to prayer. End of section 15 Section 16 of The Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 16. Portraits and Sketches, Lewis Tappan, Part 2. 4. One day, when I lived in New York City, a colored man came running to my house, and in a hurried manner said, Is this Mr. Tappan? On replying in the affirmative, he said, I have driven my master from Baltimore. He has just arrived, and the servants are taking off the baggage at the Astor House. I inquired of a person passing by where you lived. He said, Eighty White Street, and I have run here to tell you that you may give notice to a man who has escaped from my master, to this city that the object of this journey is to find him and take him back to slavery. The man hurried back so that he need not be missed by his master, who believed that this coachman, who had lived years with him, was his confidential servant and would be true to his interest. I went immediately to the house of a colored friend to describe the fugitive and to see if we could not concert measures to protect him. I think, said he, that I know the man by your description and that he boards in this house. He will soon come in from South Street, where he has worked today. While we were consulting together, sure enough, the man came in, and was most glad to have the opportunity thus afforded of secreting himself. I have not strength to dictate much more, although many other instances occur to me of most remarkable providential occurrences of the escape of fugitives within my knowledge. I used to say that I was the owner of half a horse that was in active service near the Susquehanna River. This horse I own jointly with another friend of the slave, dedicating the animal to the service of the Underground Railroad. It was customary for the agent at Haverty Grace, bringing a fugitive to the river, to kindle a fire, as it was generally in the night, to give notice to a person living on the opposite side of the river. This person well understood the signal and would come across in his boat and receive the fugitive. An aged colored couple residing in Brooklyn came over to my office in New York City and said that they had just heard from Wilmington, North Carolina, that their two sons, about 25 or 26 years of age, who were slaves, were about to be sold for $1,000 each, and they hoped I should be able and willing to assist them in raising the money. I told them that I had scruples about putting money into the hands of slaveholders, but I would give them something that might be of as much value. I then pointed out a way by which their son might reach the city. In about three weeks, one of the young men came to my office. Give me, said I, some particulars of your escape. I am, said he, a builder, and planned and erected the hotel at Wilmington, and some other houses. I used to hire my time of my master, and was accustomed to ride about the country attending to my business. I borrowed a pass from a man about my size and complexion. I then went to the railroad office and asked for a ticket for Fredericksburg. From there, I came on directly to Washington. I had not been questioned before, but here I was taken up and carried before a magistrate. He examined me by the description in my pass, complexion, height, etc., then read, and a scar under his left knee. When I heard that, my heart sank within me, for I had no scar there that I knew. Pull up the boy's trousers, said the justice to the constable. He did so and said, Here's a scar, all right, said the justice. No mistake. Let him go. Glad was I. 
I got a ticket for Baltimore, and there for another town, and finally reached here. You ask me to give an account of the sums that I have expended for the Underground Railroad, etc. I must be excused from doing this, as if I could now ascertain, I should not think it worth while to mention. I must now conclude my narrative by giving, with some additions, an account of an interesting escape from slavery, which was written by my wife more than fifteen years ago for Frederick Douglass's paper. On page 177, the narrative of The Fleeing Girl of Fifteen is so fully written out that it precludes the necessity of reproducing a large portion of this story. In the evening, a friend arrived bringing with him a bright, handsome boy whom he called Joe. Most heartily was Joe welcomed, and deep was the thrill which we felt as we looked upon him and thought of the perils he had escaped. The next day was Thanksgiving Day, and my house was thronged with guests. In an upper room, with a comfortable fire and the door locked, sat Joe, still in boy's clothes, to be able to escape at the first intimation of danger. But with a smile and a look of touching gratitude, whenever any one of the family who was in the secret left the festive group to look in upon the interesting stranger. Not one of us can ever forget the deep abhorrence of slavery, and thanksgiving to Almighty God that we felt that day as we moved among the guests, who were wholly ignorant of the occupant of that upper room. Some curiosity was indeed excited among the little grandchildren who saw slices of turkey and plum pudding sent upstairs. It was Joe's first Thanksgiving dinner in a free state. As she brought nothing away with her, it was necessary the next day to procure a complete wardrobe for a girl, which was carefully packed for her to take with her. The second day after Joe's arrival, the Reverend Mr. Freeman, pastor of a colored church in Brooklyn, agreed to accompany her to her Uncle Brown's in Canada West, and we saw them depart knowing the danger that would be set both on the way. The following is part of a letter from Mr. F. giving an account of their journey. After stating that they left New York in the cars at 5 o'clock p.m. and through the providence of God, went on their way safely and speedily, with none to molest or to make them afraid, he says, On reaching Rochester, I began to ask myself, how shall we get over Niagara Falls? I was not sure that the cars ran across the suspension bridge, Besides, I felt that we were in more danger here than we had been at any other place. Knowing that there was a large reward offered for Joe's apprehension, I feared there might be some lurking spy ready to pounce upon us. But when we arrived at the bridge, the conductor said, Sit still, this car goes across. You may judge of my joy and relief of mind when I looked out and was sure that we were over. Thank God, I exclaimed, we are safe in Canada. Having now a few minutes before the cars would start again, I sat down and hastily wrote a few lines to inform friends at home of our safe arrival. As soon as possible, I ran to the post office with my letter, paid the postage, and while I was waiting for my change, the car bell rang. I quickly returned, and in a few minutes we were on our way to Chatham, 200 miles west. That place we reached between 7 and 8 o'clock, Saturday evening. When we got out, we met a gentleman who asked me if I wanted a boarding house. I said yes, and he invited me to go with him. I asked him if there was any way for us to get to Dresden that night. He answered, no, it is a dark night and a muddy road, and no conveyance can be got tonight. I soon found that we must stay in Chatham until Monday morning. On our way to the boarding house, the gentleman said to me, is this your son with you? I answered no, and then I asked him if he knew a man living in D by the name of Bradley. He replied that he was very well acquainted with him, and then inquired if that young man was Mr. Bradley's brother. I said no, not exactly a brother. He must have thought it strange that I did not give him a more definite answer to his question. When we reached the house, we found several boarders in the sitting room and a few neighbors. I had already told him my name, but with regard to Joe, I had not yet had a chance to explain. I, of course, was introduced to those who were in the room, but Joe, well, Joe took a seat and did not seem to be troubled about an introduction. As the landlord was going out of the room, I asked permission to speak with him alone. He took me into another room, and I said to him, That young man, as you call him, is a young woman, and has come dressed in this manner all the way from Washington City. She would be very glad now to be able to change her clothes. He was greatly surprised and would hardly believe that it was so, but said, I will call my wife. She came, and I guess all the women in the house came with her. They soon disappeared, and Joe with them, who, after being absent a while, 
returned and was introduced as Miss Anne Maria Weems. The whole company were on their feet, shook hands, laughed and rejoiced, declaring that this beat all they had ever seen before. Chatham contains, I was told, more than 3,000 fugitives. The weather there is not colder than in New York. The next morning was the Sabbath, but this I must pass and hasten to D, the residence of Mr. Bradley. We started early Monday morning. As a part of the road was very bad, we did not reach there till a late hour. As we were passing along and getting near to the place, we met two colored men who were talking together, one on horseback and the other on foot. I inquired of them if they could tell me how far it was to Mr. Bradley's. The man on horseback said it was about a mile further, and then proceeded to give directions. After he had done this, he said, I reckon I am the one that you want to find. My name is Bradley. Well, I replied, probably you are the man. Just then, Anne Maria turned her head around. As soon as he saw her face, he exclaimed, My Lord, Maria, is that you? Is that you? My child, is it you? We never expected to see you again. We had given you up. Oh, what will your aunt say? It will kill her. She will die. It will kill her. I told him that as I was obliged to leave again soon, I must proceed. Well, said he, you go on. I am just going over to M, and will be back in a few minutes. We started for his house, and he towards M, but we had only gone a short distance when he overtook us, exclaiming, I can't go to M, and began talking to Anne Maria, asking her all about her friends and relatives, whom they had left behind, and about his old master, and his wife's master, from whom they had run away four years before. As we approached the house, he said, I will go and open the gate, and have a good fire to warm you. When he came up to the gate, he met his wife, who was returning from a store or neighbor's house, and he said to her, That's Anne Maria coming yonder. She stopped until we came to the gate. The tears were rolling from her eyes, and she exclaimed, Anne Maria, is it you? The girl leaped from the wagon, and they fell on each other's necks, weeping and rejoicing. Such a scene I never before witnessed. She, who had been given up as lost, was now found. She, who but a short time before had been, as they supposed, a slave for life, was now free. We soon entered the house, and after the first gush of feeling had somewhat subsided, they both began a general inquiry about the friends they had left behind. Every now and then the aunt would break out, My child, you are here. Thank God you are free. We were talking about you today and saying we shall never see you again, and now here you are with us. I remained about an hour and a half with them, took dinner, and then started for home, rejoicing that I had been to a land where colored men are free. This Mr. Bradley, who ran away with himself and wife about four years ago from the land of whips and chains, is the owner of two farms, and is said to be worth three thousand dollars. Can slaves take care of themselves? You may well suppose that the receipt of this letter gave us great pleasure, and called forth heartfelt thanksgiving to him, who had watched over this undertaking and protected all concerned in it. A bright and promising girl had been rescued from the untold miseries of a slave woman's life, and found a good home, where she would have an opportunity to acquire an education and be trained for a useful and happy life. Mr. Bradley intended to send for her parents, and hoped to prevail on them to come and live with him. Truly yours, Louis Tappan. End of section 16《Section 17 of the Underground Railroad Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The Underground Railroad Part 5 by William Still Section 17. Portraits and Sketches. Elijah F. Pennypacker. Whose name belongs to the history of the Underground Railroad, owed his peculiarly fine nature to a mother of large physical proportions and correspondingly liberal mental and spiritual endowments. She was a natural sovereign in the sphere in which she moved, and impressed her son with the qualities which made his anti-slavery life 
nothing but an expression of the rules of conduct which governed him in all other particulars believing in his inmost soul in principles of rectitude all men believed in him his yea or nay passing current wherever he went tall dignified and commanding he had that in his face which inspired immediate confidence said one who looked if that is not a good man there is no use in the lord writing his signature on human countenances even in early youth honors which he never sought were pressed upon him as he gave assurance of ability commensurate with his worth he was sent to the legislature of pennsylvania for five sessions where he became the personal friend of the governor joseph rittner and also of thaddeus stevens at the request of the latter he consented to occupy the position of secretary to the board of canal commissioners and two years after by the wishes of mr rittner took his seat in the canal board becoming a co-worker with thaddeus stevens here ripened a friendship which afterward became of national importance for although a nature so positive as that of thaddeus stevens could scarcely be said to be under the influence of any other mind still if there were those who exercised a moral sway sustaining this courageous republican leader at a higher level than he might otherwise have attained elijah f pennypacker was surely amongst them almost antipodal as they were in certain respects each recognized the genuine ring of the other and admired and respected that which was most true and noble the purity simplicity and high-minded honor which distinguished the younger had its effect on the elder even while he smiled at the inflexibility which would not swerve one hair's breadth from the line of right the story is often told how when this young man's conscience stood bolt upright in the way of what was deemed a desirable arrangement stevens one day exclaimed it don't do pennypacker to be so d dash d honest pennypacker stood his ground and the lifelong respect which stevens ever after awarded proved that he at least thought it did do when it became clear to his mind that a great battle was to be fought between liberty and slavery in america mr pennypacker felt it to be his duty to turn aside from the sunny paths of political preferment into the shadows of obscure life and ally himself with the misrepresented despised and outcast abolitionists ever after devoting himself assiduously to the promotion of the cause of freedom notwithstanding his natural modesty here as elsewhere he took a conspicuous position at home in the local anti-slavery society of his neighborhood he was for many years chosen president as he was also of the chester county anti-slavery society and of the pennsylvania state anti-slavery society soon after his retirement from public life he united himself with the society of friends but was much too radical to be an acceptable addition for a long time he was endured rather than endorsed and it was only when such anti-slavery feelings as he cherished became generally diffused throughout the society that he found the unity he desired and expected whatever may have been his trials here or elsewhere he found a rich reward for his faithfulness in the intellectual and moral growth which he attained by association with the most advanced minds of the time and he has often been heard to say that no part of his life has been more fully and generously compensated than that devoted to the anti-slavery cause his home near phoenixville chester county pennsylvania was an important station on the underground railroad the majority of fugitives proceeding through the southern rural districts of eastern pennsylvania passing through his hands at all times he was deeply interested in their welfare and in his hospitality towards them had the entire sympathy and cooperation of his family they like himself being earnest abolitionists but his more important duty of influencing public sentiment in favor of freedom overshadowed his labors in this department and steadfastness and integrity he stood beside finley coates and thomas whitson a trio who will long be remembered in their native state 
so long as dr b fussell resided in the northern section of chester county he and elijah f pennypacker were companions in anti-slavery and other reform labors as well as in business on the underground railroad differing widely in temperament and mental structure these two men were harmonious in spirit and a close bond of sympathy and affection existed between them it was a mutual pleasure to work as brothers and afterward to rejoice together in labor accomplished one of the last visits which roused the flickering animation of the dying physician was from this friend of more vigorous years and the voice which gave fitting expression to the worth of the departed at his funeral was that of elijah f pennypacker like that of the highest grade of men everywhere his appreciation of women has ever been keen and true in demanding the full rights of humanity he makes no distinction either on account of sex or color in his own family he has always encouraged the pursuit of any occupation congenial to the person choosing it whether or not it were a departure from the routine of custom and in educational advantages he has ever demanded the widest possible culture for all wherever known he is estimated as a pillar in the temperance cause gentle modest courteous and benignant he combines in a remarkable degree strength and tenderness courage and sympathy at one time holding at bay the powers of evil and baffling the most determined opponents by his manly adherence to right at another he may be found yielding to impressions bidding him to seek the source of some hidden private sorrow and with delicate touch binding up a flowing wound or offering himself as the defender and protector of such as may need his brotherly care obedient to these impressions he rarely errs in his administrations and whether his errand be to remonstrate with the evil doer setting his sins clearly and vividly before him or to strengthen and encourage suffering innocence he is alike successful men whom he has warned in reproof when it cost the utmost bravery to do so have become his confiding friends and have been known afterward to entrust him with heavy pecuniary responsibilities and to point him out to their children as an example worthy of imitation those whose griefs he has frequently softened have laid upon his head a crown of blessing whiter than the honors which come with his silver hairs and all with whom he comes in contact in business in duty or in social intercourse acknowledge the presence the wide usefulness and influence of the upright man the memories of the choice spirits he used to meet in the anti-slavery gatherings their mutual and kindly greetings the holy resolves which animated them and made the time hours of exultation now serve to brighten the pathway of his declining years and to throw a halo around the restfulness of his home as in peace of mind he looks abroad over his beloved country to see millions of enfranchised men beginning to avail themselves of its pecuniary educational and political advantages and beholds them starting on a career of material and spiritual prosperity with a rapidity commensurate with the expansive force of the repressed energies of a race end of section seventeen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section eighteen of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer dore the underground railroad part five by william still section eighteen portraits and sketches william wright memorial william wright a distinguished abolitionist of adams county pennsylvania was born on the twenty first of december seventeen eighty eight various circumstances conspired to make this unassuming quaker an earnest abolitionist and champion of the oppressed in every land and of every nationality and color his uncle, Benjamin Wright, and cousin, Samuel B. Wright, were active members of the old Pennsylvania Abolition Society, and at the time of the emancipation of the slaves in this state were often engaged in lawsuits with slaveholders to compel them to release their bondmen according to the requirements of the law. William Wright grew up under the influence 
of the teaching of these relatives. Joined to this, his location caused him to take an extraordinary interest in underground railroad affairs. He lived near the foot of the southern slope of the South Mountain, a spur of the Alleghanies, which extends under various names to Chattanooga, Tennessee. This mountain was followed in its course by hundreds of fugitives until they got into Pennsylvania and were directed to William Wright's house. In November 1817, William Wright married Phoebe Weirman, born on the 8th of February, 1790, daughter of a neighboring farmer and sister of Hannah W. Gibbons, wife of Daniel Gibbons, a notice of whom appears elsewhere in this work. Phoebe Wright was the assistant of her husband in every good work, and their married life of 48 years was a long period of united and efficient labor in the cause of humanity. She still, 1871, survives him. William and Phoebe Wright began their Underground Railroad labors about the year 1819. Hamilton Moore, who ran away from Baltimore County, Maryland, was the first slave aided by them. His master came for him, but William Wright and Joel Weirman, Phoebe Wright's brother who lived in the neighborhood, rescued him and sent him to Canada. In the autumn of 1828, as Phoebe Wright, surrounded by her little children, came out upon her back porch in the performance of some household duty, she saw standing before her in the shade of the early November morning a colored man without hat, shoes, or coat. He asked if Mr. Wright lived there, and upon receiving an affirmative reply, said that he wanted work. The good woman, comprehending the situation at a glance, told him to come into the house, get warm, and wait till her husband came home. He was shivering with cold and fright. When William Wright came home, the fugitive told his story. He came from Hagerstown, Maryland, having been taught the blacksmith's trade there. In this business, it was his duty to keep an account of all the work done by him, which record he showed to his master at the end of the week. Knowing no written character but the figure five, he kept this account by means of a curious system of hieroglyphics in which straight marks meant horseshoes put on, circles, cartwheels fixed, etc. One day, in happening to see his master's book, he noticed that wherever five and one were added, the figure six was used. Having practiced this till he could make it, he ever after used it in his accounts. As his master was looking over these one day, he noticed the new figure and compelled the slave to tell how he had learned it. He flew into a rage and said, I'll teach you how to be learning new figures, and picking up a horseshoe, threw it at him, but fortunately for the audacious chattel, missed his aim. Notwithstanding his ardent desire for liberty, the slave considered it his duty to remain in bondage until he was twenty-one years old in order to repay by his labor the trouble and expense which his master had had in rearing him. On the evening of his twenty-first anniversary, he turned his face toward the North Star and started for a land of freedom. Arriving at Risertown, a village on the Westminster Turnpike about 25 miles from Baltimore and 35 miles from Mr. Wright's house, he was arrested and placed in the bar room of the country tavern in care of the landlady to wait until his captors, having finished some work in which they were engaged, could take him back to his master. The landlady, being engaged in getting supper, set him to watch the cakes that were baking. As she was passing back and forth, he ostentatiously removed his hat coat and shoes, and place them in the bar room. Having done this, he said to her, I will step out a moment. This he did, she sending a boy to watch him. When the boy came out, he appeared to be very sick and called hastily for water. The boy ran in to get it. Now was his golden opportunity. Jumping the fence, he ran to a clump of trees which occupied low ground behind the house, and concealing himself in it for a moment, ran and continued to run. He knew not whither until he found himself at the toll gate near Petersburg in Adams County. Before this, he had kept in the fields and forests, but now found himself compelled to come out upon the road. The toll gate keeper, seeing at once that he was a fugitive, said to him, I guess you don't know the road. I guess I can find it myself, was the reply. Let me show you, said the man. You may, if you please, replied the fugitive. Taking him out behind his dwelling, he pointed across the fields to a new brick farmhouse and said, Go there and inquire for Mr. Wright. The slave thanked him and did as he was directed. He remained with William Wright until April 1829. During the short time, he learned to read, write, and cipher as far as the single rule of three, as it was then called, or simple proportion. During his residence with William Wright, nothing could exceed his kindness or gratitude to the whole family. 
he learned to graft trees and thus rendered great assistance to William Wright in his necessary business. When working in the kitchen during the winter, he would never allow Phoebe Wright to perform any hard labor, always scrubbing the floor and lifting heavy burdens for her. Before he went away in the spring, he assumed a name which his talents, perseverance, and genius have rendered famous in both hemispheres, that of James W. C. Pennington. The initial W was for his benefactor's family, and C for the family of his former master. From William Wright's, he went to Daniel Gibbons, thence to Delaware County, Pennsylvania, and from there to New Haven, Connecticut, where, while performing the duties of janitor at Yale College, he completed the studies of the college course. After a few years, he went to Heidelberg, where the degree of D.D. was conferred upon him. He never forgot William Wright and his family, and on his return from Europe, brought them each a present. The story of his escape and wonderful abilities was spread over England. An American acquaintance of the Wright family was astonished, on visiting an anti-slavery fair in London many years ago, to see among the pictures for sale there, one entitled, William and Phoebe Wright Receiving James W. C. Pennington. The doctor died in Florida in 1870, where he had gone to preach and assist in opening schools amongst the freemen. In 1842, a party of 16 slaves came to York, Pennsylvania from Baltimore County, Maryland. Here they were taken in charge by William Wright, Joel Fisher, Dr. Lewis, and William Yoakum. The last named was a constable and used to assist the Underground Railroad managers by pretending to hunt fugitives with the kidnappers. Knowing where the fugitives were, he was enabled to hunt them in the opposite direction from that in which they had gone, and thus give them time to escape. This constable and a colored man of York took this party one by one out into Samuel Willis's cornfield near York and hid them under the shocks. The following night, Dr. Lewis piloted them to near his house at Lewisburg, York County, on the banks of the Conewoga. Here they were concealed several days, Dr. Lewis carrying provisions to them in his saddlebags. When the search for them had been given up in William Wright's neighborhood, he went down to Lewisburg, and in company with Dr. Lewis, took the whole sixteen across the Conewoga, they fording the river and carrying the fugitives across on their horses. It was a gloomy night in November. Every few moments clouds floated across the moon, alternately lighting up and shading the river, which swelled by autumn rains, ran a flood. William Wright and Dr. Lewis mounted men or women behind and took children in their arms. When the last one got over, the doctor, who professed to be an atheist, exclaimed, Great God, is this a Christian land, and are Christians thus forced to flee for their liberty? William Wright guided this party to his house that night and concealed them in a neighboring forest until it was safe for them to proceed on their way to Canada. Just in the beginning of harvest of the year 1851, Four men came off from Washington County, Maryland. They were almost naked and seemed to have come through great difficulties, their clothing being almost entirely torn off. As soon as they came, William Wright went to the store and got four pairs of shoes. It was soon heard that their masters and the officers had gone to Harrisburg to hunt them. Two of them, Fenton and Tom, were concealed at William Wright's, and the other two, Sam, and one whose name has been forgotten, at Joel Weirman's. In a day or two, as William Wright, a number of carpenters, and other workmen, among whom were Fenton and Tom, were at work in the barn, a party of men rode up and recognized the colored men as slaves of one of their number. The colored men said they had left their coats at the house. William Wright looked earnestly at them and told them to go to the house and get their coats. They went off, and one of them was observed by one of the family to take his coat hastily down from where it hung in one of the outhouses a few moments afterward. After conversing a few moments at the barn, William Wright brought the slaveholders down to the house, where he, his wife, and daughters engaged them in a controversy on the subject of slavery which lasted about an hour. One of them seemed very much impressed and labored hard to convince his host that he was a good master and would treat his men well. Finally, one of the party asked William Wright to produce the men. He replied that he would not do that that they might search his premises if they wished to, but they could not compel him to bring forth the fugitives. Seeing that they had been duped, they became very angry and proceeded forthwith to search the house and all the outhouses immediately around it, without, however, finding those whom they sought. As they left the house and went toward the barn, William Wright, waving his hand toward the former, said, You see they are not anywhere there. 
They then went to the barn and gave it a thorough search. Between it and the house, a little away from the path, but in plain sight, stood the carriage house, which they passed by without seeming to notice. After they had gone, poor Tom was found in this very house, curled up under the seats of the old-fashioned family carriage. He had never come to the house at all, but had heard the voices of his hunters from his hiding place during their whole search. About two o'clock in the morning, Fenton was found by William Wright out in the field. He had run along the bed of a small watercourse, dry at that time of year, until he came to a rye field amid whose high grain he hid himself until he thought the danger was past. From William Wright's, the slave catchers went to Joel Weirman's, where despite all that could be done, they got poor Sam, took him off to Maryland, and sold him to the traders to be taken far south. In 1856, William Wright was a delegate from Adams County to the convention at Philadelphia, which nominated John C. Fremont for President of the United States. As the counties were called in alphabetical order, he responded first among the Pennsylvania delegation. It is thought that he helped away during his whole life nearly 1,000 slaves. During his latter years, he was aided in the good work by his children, who never hesitated to sacrifice their own pleasure in order to help away fugitives. His convictions on the subject of slavery seem to have been born with him, to have grown with his growth, and strengthened with his strength. He could not remember when he first became interested in the subject. William Wright closed his long and useful life on the 25th of October, 1865. More fortunate than his co-laborer Daniel Gibbons, he lived to see the triumph of the cause in which he had labored all his life. His latter years were cheered by the remembrance of his good deeds in the cause of human freedom. Modest and retiring, he would not desire as he does not need a eulogy. His labors speak for themselves and are such as are recorded upon the Lamb's Book of Life. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 19. Portraits and Sketches, Dr. Bartholomew Fussell. Dr. Fussell, whose death occurred within the current year, was no ordinary man. He was born in Chester County, Pennsylvania, in 1794, his ancestors being members of the Society of Friends, principally of English origin, who arrived in America during the early settlement of Pennsylvania, some being of the number who, with William Penn, built their homes on the unbroken soil where Philadelphia now stands. He inherited all the bravery of these early pioneers who left their homes for the sake of religious freedom, the governing principle of his life being a direct antagonism to every form of oppression. Removing in early manhood to Maryland, where Negro slavery was legally protected, he became one of the most active opponents of the system, being a friend and co-laborer of Elisha Tyson, known and beloved as Father Tyson, by all the slaves of the region and to the community at large as one of the most philanthropic of men. While teaching school during the week as a means of self-education and reading medicine at night, the young student expended his surplus energy in opening a Sabbath school for colored persons, teaching them the rudiments of knowledge, not for a few hours only, but for the whole day, and frequently finding as many as 90 pupils collected to receive the inestimable boom which gave them the power of reading the Bible for themselves. To the deeply religious nature of these Africans, this was the one blessing they prized above all others in his power to bestow, and the overflowing gratitude they gave in return was a memory he cherished to the latest years of his life. After his graduation in medicine, being at one time called upon to deliver an address before the Medical Society of Baltimore in the midst of a pro-slavery audience and before slaveholding professors and men of authority, Dr. Fussell, with a courage scarcely to be comprehended at this late day, denounced the most preposterous and cruel practice of slavery as replete with the causes of disease and expressed the hope that the day would come when slavery and cruelty should have no abiding place in the whole habitable earth when the philosopher and the pious Christian could use the salutation of brother, and the physician and divine be as one man, when the rich and the poor should know no distinction, the great and the small be equal in dominion, and the arrogant master and his menial slave should make a truce of friendship with each other, all following the same law of reason, all guided by the same light of truth. 
As a matter of course, a spirit so thoroughly awake to the welfare of humanity would hail with joy and welcome as a brother the appearance of such a devoted advocate of freedom as Benjamin Lundy, and with all the warmth of his nature, would give love, admiration, and reverence to the later apostle of immediate emancipation, William Lloyd Garrison. It was one of the pleasures of Dr. Fussell's life that he had been enabled to take the first number of The Liberator and to continue a subscriber without intermission until the battle being ended, the last number was announced. He was himself one of the most earnest workers in the anti-slavery cause, never omitting in a fearless manner to embrace an opportunity to protest against the encouragement of a pro-slavery spirit. Returning to Pennsylvania to practice his profession, his home became one of the havens where the hunted fugitives from slavery found food, shelter, and rest. Laboring in connection with the late Thomas Garrett of Wilmington, Delaware, and with many others at available points, about 2,000 fugitives passed through his hands on their way to freedom, and amongst these, he frequently had the delight of welcoming some of his old Sabbath school pupils. The mutual recognition was sometimes touching in the extreme. In later life, his anecdotes and reminiscences, told in the vivid style resulting from a remarkably retentive memory which could recall word, tone, and gesture, brought to life some of the most interesting of his experiences with these fleeing bondmen, whose histories no romance could ever equal. Being one of the signers of the Declaration of Sentiments issued by the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833, he had also the gratification of attending the last meeting of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, called to celebrate the downfall of slavery in America and the dissolution of an organization whose purpose was affected. There are those who may remember how, at the time, in perfect forgetfulness of self, the relation of the heroism of his friend Elisha Tyson seemed to recall for a moment the vigor of youth to render the decrepitude of age almost majestic. But it was not slavery alone which occupied the thoughts and attention of this large-hearted man. He was well known as an advocate of common school education, of temperance, and of every other interest which, in his view, pertained to the welfare of man. Unfortunately, he was addicted to the use of tobacco from his youth. Having become convinced that it was an evil, he, for the sake of consistency and as an example to others, resolutely abandoned the habit at the age of 70. He was fond of accrediting his resolve to a very aged relative, who, in remonstrating with him about the subject, replied to his remark that a sudden cessation from a practice so long indulged in might result in his death. Well, die then, and go to heaven decently. As a practitioner of medicine, he was eminently successful, his intense sympathy with suffering seeming to elevate his faculties and give them a vigor in tracing the hidden causes of disease and in suggesting to his mind alleviating agencies. His patients felt an unspeakable comfort in his presence, well knowing that the best possible remedy which his knowledge, his judgment, or his experience suggested would be selected. Let the difficulty and inconvenience to himself be what it would. In cases where life hung trembling in the balance, he would watch night after night, feeding the flickering flame until he perceived it brighten, and this in the abode of misery just as freely as in the home of wealth. The lifelong affection of those whom he recalled was his reward, where often none was sought or expected. He believed in woman as only a thoroughly good man can, and from early youth he had been impressed with her peculiar fitness for the practice of medicine. The experience of a physician confirmed him in his sentiments, and it became one of his most earnest aspirations to open to her all the avenues to the study of medicine. In the year 1840, he gave regular instruction to a class of ladies, and it was through one of these pupils that the first female graduate in America was interested in the study of medicine. In 1846, he communicated to a few liberal-minded professional men a plan for the establishment of a college of the highest grade for the medical education of women. This long-cherished plan, hallowed to him by the approbation of a beloved wife, was well received. Others with indomitable zeal took up the work, and finally, after a succession of disappointments and discouragements from causes within and without, the Woman's College on North College Avenue, Philadelphia, starting from the germ of his thought, entered on the career of prosperity it is so well entitled to receive. Though never at any time connected with the college, he regarded its success with the most affectionate interest, considering its proposition as one of the most important results of his life. 
happy in having lived to see slavery abolished, and believing in the speedy elevation of woman to her true dignity as joint sovereign with man, and in the mitigation of the evils of war, intemperance, poverty, and crime, which might be expected to follow such a result, he rested from his labors and died in peace. End of section 19. Recording by Jeff Machado. Section 20 of the Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 20. Portraits and Sketches. Thomas Shipley, Part 1. This account of the life of Thomas Shipley is abridged from a memoir by Dr. Isaac Parrish, published in 1837. Thomas Shipley, one of the foremost in the early generation of philanthropists who devoted their lives to the extinction of human slavery, was born in Philadelphia on the 2nd of 4th month, 1787. He was the youngest of five children of William and Margaret Shipley, his father having emigrated from Atoxeter in Staffordshire, England, about the year 1750. From a very early period in the history of the Society of Friends, his ancestors had been members of that body, and he inherited from them the strong sense of personal independence and the love of toleration and respect for the rights of others, which have ever characterized that body of people. Soon after his birth his mother died, and he was thus early deprived of the fostering care of a pious and devoted parent, whose counsels are so important in forming the youthful mind, and in giving a direction to a future life. A few years after the death of his mother, his father was removed, and Thomas was left an orphan before he had attained his sixth year. After this affecting event he was taken into the family of Isaac Bartram, who had married his eldest sister, here he remained for several years, acquiring the common rudiments of education, and at a suitable age was sent to West Town School. After remaining there for a little more than a year, he met with an accident which rendered it necessary for him to return home, and the effects of which prevented him from proceeding with his education. He fell from the top of a high flight of steps to the ground, and received an injury of the head, followed by convulsions, which continued at intervals for a considerable time, and rendered him incapable of any effort of mind or body. He was, during childhood, remarkably fond of reading, and was distinguished among his friends and associates for uncommon perseverance in accomplishing anything he undertook, a trait which peculiarly marked him through life. His disposition is said to have been unusually amiable and docile, so as to endear him very strongly to his relatives and friends. After his removal from West Town, he was again taken into the family of his brother-in-law, and remained under the care of his sister, who was very much attached to him, until he was placed as an apprentice to the hardware business. While here he was entirely relieved of the affliction caused by the fall, and was restored to sound health. About the age of twenty-one he entered upon the pursuits of the business he had selected. The exact time at which his attention was turned to the subject of slavery cannot be ascertained, but it is probable that a testimony against it was among his earliest impressions as a member of the Religious Society of Friends. He joined the Pennsylvania Society for the Promoting the Abolition of Slavery, etc., in 1817 and the ardent interest which he took in its objects was evinced on many occasions within the recollection of many now living. He was for many years an active member of its Board of Education, and took a prominent part in extending the benefits of learning to colored children and youth. The career of Thomas Shipley, as it was connected with the interests of the colored community, abounds in incidents which have rarely occurred in the life of any individual, being universally regarded as their adviser and protector, he was constantly solicited for his advice on questions touching their welfare. This led him to investigate the laws relating to this class of persons in all their extended ramifications, 
the knowledge he thus acquired, together with his practical acquaintance with the business and decisions of our courts, rendered his opinion peculiarly serviceable on all matters affecting their rights. Never did a merchant study more closely the varied relations of business and their influence on his interests than did Thomas Shipley all those questions which concerned the well-being of those for whom he was so warmly interested. He had volunteered his services as their advocate, and they could not have been more faithfully served had they poured out the wealth of Croesus at the feet of the most learned counsel. On every occasion of popular commotion, where the safety of the colored people was threatened, he was found at his post, fearlessly defending their rights and exerting his influence with those in authority, to throw around them the protection of the laws. In the tumultuous scenes which disgraced Philadelphia in the summer of 1835, in which the fury of the mob was directed against the persons and property of the colored inhabitants, he acted with an energy and prudence rarely found combined in the same individual. The mob had collected and organized to the number of several hundred, and were marching through the lower part of the city, dealing destruction in their course. The houses of respectable and worthy colored citizens were broken in upon, the furniture scattered to the winds, all they possessed destroyed or plundered, and they themselves subjected to the most brutal and savage treatment. Defenseless infancy and decrepit age were alike disregarded in the general devastation which these ruffians had decreed should attend their course. The color of the skin was the mark by which their vengeance was directed and the cries and entreaties of their innocent and defenceless victims were alike disregarded in the accomplishment of their ends. Already had several victims fallen before the fury of the ruthless band. Law and order were laid waste, and the officers of justice looked on, some perhaps with dismay, and others with indifference, while the rights of citizens were prostrated, and their peaceful and quiet homes invaded by the hand of violence. At such a time the voice of remonstrance or entreaty would have been useless, and had the avowed friends of the colored man interfered in any public manner, the effect would probably have been to increase the fury of the storm, and to have directed the violence of the mob upon themselves. Under these perilous circumstances, Thomas Shipley was determined to attempt an effort for their relief. He could not look on and see those for whom he was so deeply interested, threatened almost with extermination, without an effort for their preservation. And yet he was aware that his presence amongst the mob might subject him to assassination without adding to the security of the objects of his solicitude. He therefore determined to disguise himself in such a manner as not to be recognized, and to mingle amongst the rioters in order to ascertain their objects, and if possible to convey such information to the proper authorities as might lead to the arrest of those most active in fomenting disorder. Accordingly, he left his house late in the evening, attired so as to be completely disguised, and repaired to the scene of the tumult. By this time much mischief had been done, and to add fresh fury to the multitude, and to incite them to new deeds of blood, nothing was wanting but some act of resistance on the part of their victims, who, during the whole period, had conducted themselves with a forbearance and patience highly creditable to them as good citizens and upright Christians. Such an occasion was about to occur, and was prevented by the admirable coolness and forethought of Thomas Shipley. A number of colored men who had been driven to desperation by the acts of the mob, and who had relinquished the idea of protection from the civil authorities, determined to resort to arms to defend themselves and their families from the further aggressions of their persecutors, they accordingly repaired to Benezet Hall, one of their public buildings on South 7th Street, with a supply of firearms and ammunition, determined to fire upon the assailants and maintain their post or die in the attempt. This fact became known to the leaders of the mob, and the cry was raised to march for the hall and make the attack. Thomas Shipley, who had mingled amongst the rioters, and apparently identified himself with them, was now perfectly aware of all their designs. He knew their numbers, he had seen their implements of destruction which they were brandishing about them, and he was aware that the occurrence of such a conflict would be attended with the most disastrous results, and might be the beginning of hostilities which would terminate in the destruction of the weaker party, or at least in a dreadful effusion of human blood. 
Seeing the position in which the parties were now placed, he left the ranks of the rioters and ran at the top of his speed to the house in which the colored people were collected, awaiting the approach of their enemy. As he drew near, they were about coming out to meet their assailants, highly excited by continued outrages and determined to defend themselves or die. At this unexpected moment their protector drew nigh. He raised his voice aloud and addressed the multitude. He deprecated the idea of a resort to physical force as being calculated to increase their difficulties, and to plunge them into general distress, and entreated them to retire from the hall. His voice was immediately recognized. The effect was electric. The whole throng knew him as their friend. Their fierce passions were calmed by the voice of reason and admonition. They could not disregard his counsels. He had come among them at the dead hour of night, in the midst of danger and trial, to raise his warning voice against a course of measures they were about to pursue. They listened to his remonstrances, and retreated before the mob had reached the building. At this juncture the mayor and his officers assembled in front of the hall, and by prompt and energetic action succeeded in dispersing the mob, and through the information received from Thomas Shipley the ringleaders were secured and lodged in prison. The part which Thomas Shipley acted in the trying scenes so often presented in our courts during this unhappy period has invested his character with a remarkable degree of interest. It is probable that his connection with the Pennsylvania Abolition Society was the means of enlisting his talents and exertions in this important service. The energy and zeal of our friend in his efforts for the relief of those about to be deprived of their dearest rights soon distinguished him as the most efficient member of the society in this department of its duties. So intense was his interest in all cases where the liberty of his fellow men was at issue, that during a period of many years he was scarcely ever absent from the side of the unhappy victim, as he sat before our judicial tribunals trembling for his fate. The promptings of interest, the pleasures and allurements of the world, the quiet enjoyment of a peaceful home, were all cheerfully sacrificed when his services were demanded in these distressing cases. Often has he left the business in which his pecuniary interests were materially involved, to stand by the unhappy fugitive in the hour of his extremity, with an alacrity and a spirit which could only be displayed by one animated by the loftiest principles and the purest philanthropy. Who that has ever witnessed one of these trying scenes can forget his manly and honest bearing, as he stood before the unrelenting and arrogant claimant, watching with an eagle eye every step of the process by which he hoped to gain his victim, who has not been struck with his expressive glances toward the judge, when a doubtful point arose in the investigation of the case, who has not caught the lively expression of delight which beamed from his countenance when a fact was disclosed which had a favorable bearing on the liberty of the captive, who has not admired the sagacity with which his inquiries were dictated, and the tact and acumen with which he managed every part of his cause? His principle was unhesitatingly to submit to existing laws, however unjust their decrees might be, but to scan well the bearing of the facts and principles involved in each case, and to see that nothing was wanting in the chain of evidence or in the legal points in question, fully to satisfy the requisitions of law. If a doubtful point arose, he was unwearied in investigating it, and devoted hours, days, and even weeks in the collection of testimony which he thought would have a favorable influence on the prisoner. Through his untiring vigilance, many victims have escaped from the hand of the oppressor, whose title to freedom, according to the laws of this commonwealth, was undoubted, and many others whose enslavement was at least questionable. The time and labor expended by Thomas Shipley in protecting the interests of his colored clients would be almost incredible to those who were not aware of his extraordinary devotion to the cause. The only notice which can be found among his papers of the various slave cases in which he was engaged is contained in a memorandum book which he commenced in the summer of 1835. In this book he has noted, in the order of their occurrence, such instances of difficulty or distress as demanded his interference, almost without a comment. I find from this book that his advice and assistance were bestowed in twenty-five cases, from seventh month sixteenth to eighth month twenty-fourth, 1836, a period of little more than a month. 
A number of these cases required the writing of letters to distant places. In some it was necessary for him to visit the parties interested, and others demanded his personal attendance at court. This, perhaps, may be considered as a fair average of the amount of labor which he constantly expended in this department of his benevolent efforts. And when we consider the time occupied in the necessary duties of his ordinary avocations, it must be evident that he possessed not only extraordinary humanity, but uncommon activity and energy to have accomplished so much. In the memorandum book referred to, under date of 12th month, 1835, I find the following note. Spent eighteen days in the trial of A. Hemsley and his wife Nancy and her three children, arrested at Mount Holly, the husband claimed by Goldsboro Price, executor of Isaac Boggs of Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and the wife and children by Richard D. Cooper of the same county. John Willoughby, agent for both claimants, B. R. Brown and B. Clark, attorneys for the claimant, and D. P. Brown, J. R. Slack, E. B. Cannon, and G. W. Camblos for defendants, after a full argument in which a manumission was produced for Nancy, from R. D. Cooper's father, she and her children were discharged, but her husband was remanded, on which a certiorari was served on the judge and a habeas corpus placed in the sheriff's hands. Alexander was discharged by the Supreme Court at Trenton, third month, fifth. The circumstances of the case were briefly the following. The wife and children had been regularly manumitted in Delaware by the father of the claimant, while the title to the father to freedom was less positive, though sufficiently clear to warrant a vigorous effort on his behalf. The first object of the counsel on the part of the alleged fugitive was to prove the manumission of the mother and children, and as it was thought the necessary documents for that purpose were collected and arranged. After the trial had proceeded, however, for a short time, the attorney for the defendants discovered a defect in the testimony on this point. The necessary papers, duly authenticated by the governor or chief justice of Delaware, were missing, and without them it was impossible to make out the case. The fact was immediately communicated to Thomas Shipley. He saw that the papers must be had, and that they could not be procured without a visit to Dover in Delaware. He at once determined to repair thither in person and obtain them. Without the knowledge of the claimant's counsel, who might have taken advantage of the omission and hurried the case to a decision, he started on the evening of the sixth day and traveled as fast as possible to Dover, in the midst of a season unusually cold and inclement. On the next morning inquiries were made in all directions for friend Shipley. It was thought strange that he should desert his post in the midst of so exciting and momentous a trial, and at a time when his presence seemed to be particularly required. The counsel for the prisoners, who were aware of his movements, proceeded with the examination of witnesses as slowly as possible, in order to allow time for procuring this important link in the chain of testimony, and thus to procrastinate the period when they should be called upon to sum up the case. Fortunately, on the evening of the day on which Thomas Shipley set out upon his journey, it was proposed to adjourn, and farther proceedings were postponed until second day morning. At the meeting of the court in the morning, the expected messenger was not there, and the ingenuity of the counsel was taxed, still farther, to procrastinate the important period. After three hours had been consumed in debate upon legal points, he who was so anxiously looked for came hurrying through the crowd, making his way toward the bench. His countenance and his movements soon convinced the wondering spectators that he was the bearer of gratifying news, and in a few minutes the mystery of his absence was revealed by the production of a document which was the fruit of his effort. The papers completely established the legal title of the mother and children to their freedom, and placed them out of the reach of further persecution. An attack of illness was the result of the extreme exertion and fatigue endured by this devoted man in his earnest advocacy of the rights of these friendless beings. End of section 20section 21 of the underground railroad part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 21. Portraits and Sketches. Thomas Shipley, Part 2. The freedom of the husband and father was, however, still in jeopardy. If the decision of the court should be against him, he would be torn from the bosom of his now joyful and emancipated family, and consigned to a life of bondage. To avert this calamity, the counsel for the prisoner suggested an expedient as humane as it was ingenious. He proposed that a writ of certiorari, which would oblige the judge to remove the case to the Supreme Court, and a habeas corpus from the Chief Justice of the State, should both be in readiness when the decision of the judge should be pronounced, in case that if it should be unfavorable, the writs might be at once served, and the prisoner remanded to the sheriff of the county, to be brought up before the Supreme Court at Trenton for another trial. To procure these writs, it was necessary to obtain the signature of the Chief Justice of New Jersey, who resided at Newark, and again Thomas Shipley was ready to enter with alacrity into the service. He saw the importance of the measure, and that it would require prompt action, inasmuch as the decision of the judge would probably be pronounced on the following day. It fortunately happened that a friend was just about leaving for Newark in his own conveyance, and feeling an interest in the case, he kindly invited friend Shipley to accompany him. They left in the afternoon, traveled all night, and arrived at Newark by daylight the following morning. The weary traveler was unwilling, however, to retire to bed, although the night was exceedingly cold and tempestuous, but he proceeded at once to the house of the Chief Justice. He called the worthy judge from his bed, offering the importance of his business, and the necessity of speedy action as an apology for so unseasonable a visit. Chief Justice Hornblower, on being informed of the circumstances of the case, expressed his pleasure at having it in his power to accede to his wishes, and treated him with a respect and kindness which the disinterested benevolence of his mission was calculated to inspire. Having obtained the necessary papers, he left at once for Mount Holly, where he arrived on the following day, in time to place the writs in the hands of the sheriff, just before the decision of Judge H. was pronounced. Had he consulted his ease or convenience, and deferred his visit to Newark a few hours, or had he, as most men under similar circumstances would have done, reposed his weary limbs after a cold and dreary ride of eighty miles, in order to enable him to return with renewed strength, he would have arrived too late to render this meritorious effort effectual. As it was, he was there in time. The judge, according to the expectation of the friends of the colored man, gave his decision in favor of the slaveholders, and ordered poor Alexander to be given up to the tender mercies of the exasperated claimant. The decision sent a thrill of indignation through the anxious and excited multitude, which perhaps was never equaled amongst the inhabitants of that quiet town. The friends of humanity had assembled from all parts of the country to witness the proceedings in the case. Many of them were personally acquainted with the prisoner. They knew him to be a man of intelligence and integrity. He was an industrious and orderly citizen, and was universally respected in the neighborhood. He was now about to be made a slave, and was declared to be the property of another. The father was about to be torn from his helpless children. The husband, in defiance of the divine command, was to be wrested from the fond embrace of his sorrowing wife, to spend his days in misery and toil, and this was to be done before the eyes of those who had a just regard for human rights, a hearty hatred of oppression. Is it wonderful that under such circumstances there should have been a deep abhorrence for the perpetrators of this outrage upon humanity, and a general sympathy for the innocent captive? but it was decreed that those feelings of honest indignation should be speedily supplanted by the warm outpouring of public gratitude and joy. While the feeling of the spectators was in this state of intense interest and excitement, the judge, stern and inflexible in his purposes, and the clan of greedy claimants ready to seize upon their prey, the sheriff produced his writ of certiorari and handed it to the court. It was instantly returned, and the judge, who sat unmoved by a scene to which he was not unaccustomed, and conceiving, perhaps, that his official dignity was impugned, 
persisted in his determination that the prisoner should be handed over to the claimant. The prudence and foresight of Thomas Shipley and his friends had provided, however, for this anticipated difficulty. Happily for the prisoner, he was yet embraced under the provision of that constitution which secured to him the protection of a habeas corpus, and this threw around him a shield which his enemies could not penetrate. A writ of habeas corpus, signed by the Chief Justice of the State, and demanding the body of the prisoner, before the Supreme Court at its next term, was now produced. The astonished judge found himself completely foiled. He had exercised his authority to its utmost limit, in support of the claims of his slaveholding friends, and had given the influence of his station and character to bolster up the patriarchal institution, but it was all in vain. Just as they supposed they had achieved a victory, they were obliged with fallen crests to succumb to the dictates of a higher tribunal, and to see their victim conveyed beyond their reach in the safekeeping of the sheriff. In the third month, March, the case was brought up before the Supreme Court for final adjudication. In the meantime, Thomas Shipley adopted vigorous measures to have the facts collected and arranged. He procured the aid of an intelligent and humane friend of the cause, who resided near Trenton, to attend personally to the case, and secured the legal services of Theodore Frelinghuysen, well known as one of the most gifted and virtuous statesmen of the age, and as a warm and zealous friend of the oppressed. Under these happy auspices, the case came before the Supreme Court, and gave rise to a highly interesting and important argument, in which the distinguished Frelinghuysen appeared as the disinterested advocate of the prisoner, and urged upon the court his claim to liberty, under the laws of New Jersey, in a speech which was one of his most brilliant and eloquent efforts, and added another to the many laurels which his genius and philanthropy have achieved. The opinion of Chief Justice Hornblower was given at length, and is said to have displayed a soundness and extent of legal knowledge, with a spirit of mildness and humanity, well worthy of the highest judicial tribunal of New Jersey. By this decision, Alexander Helmsley was declared to be a free man, and returned with rejoicing into the bosom of his family, and to the enjoyment of the rights and privileges of a free citizen. Thus terminated this interesting case, which for several months agitated the public mind of Burlington County to an extent almost unequalled. Such disinterested devotion to the defense of the rights of the oppressed, had it been displayed only in the instance recited, would be sufficient to enroll the name of Thomas Shipley on the list of the benefactors of his race. But when we consider that for a period of twenty years his history abounds in similar incidents, and that he uniformly stood forth as the unflinching advocate of the oppressed, regardless of the sacrifices which he was obliged to make on their behalf, we are disposed to view him as one of that noble band whose lives have been consecrated to deeds of charity and benevolence, and whose names will illumine the moral firmament so long as virtue and truth shall command the homage of mankind. Thomas Shipley was one of the founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and was an active agent in those stirring movements which soon aroused the nation to a full consideration of the enormities of slavery. He was a prominent member of the Anti-Slavery Convention, which assembled in this city in 1833, and a signer of their Declaration of Sentiments. During the last few years of his life, he was more devotedly engaged in his abolition labors than at any previous period, it was his constant desire to diffuse the principles which had been so fearlessly proclaimed by the convention, and to encourage the formation of anti-slavery societies throughout the sphere of his influence. He was one of the most prominent members of the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society, which was formed, through much opposition, in 1835, and he adhered steadily to its meetings, notwithstanding the threats which were so loudly made by the enemies of public order. In the midst of the popular commotions and tumults which marked the progress of anti-slavery principles, he stood calm and unmoved. Having been long known as a firm friend of the rights of the colored man, and being amongst the most efficient public advocates of his cause, he was of course subjected to the revilings which were so liberally heaped upon the abolitionists at that time. His name was associated with that of Tappan, Burney, Green, Jay, Garrison, and other leading abolitionists, 
who were singled out by slaveholders and their abettors as fit subjects for the merciless attacks of excited mobs. In several attempts which were made in this city to stir up the passions of the ignorant against the advocates of human rights, his person and property were openly threatened with assault. Such menaces failed, however, to deter him from the steady performance of what he believed to be a solemn duty. Being fully satisfied of the truth of the principles which he had espoused, he relied with unwavering confidence upon divine power for their ultimate triumph, and for the protection of those who advocated them. When his friends expressed their anxiety for his safety, he always allayed their apprehensions, and evinced by the firmness and benignity of his manner that he was divested of the fear of man and acted under the influence of that spirit which is from above the active part which thomas shipley took in anti-slavery movements did not diminish his interest in the prosperity and usefulness of the old pennsylvania society he was a steady attendant on its meetings and exercised his wonted care on all subjects connected with its interests a short time previous to his death, his services were acknowledged by his fellow members by his election to the office of president. The incessant and fatiguing labors in which he was engaged had sensibly affected the vigor of a constitution naturally delicate, and rendered him peculiarly liable to the inroads of disease. He was seized in the autumn of 1836 with an attack of intermittent fever, which confined him to the house for ten or twelve days, and very much reduced his strength. While recovering from this attack, he experienced an accession of disease which terminated his life in less than twenty-four hours. But a few hours before his death, he inquired of his physicians as to the probable issue of his case. When informed of his critical condition, he received the intelligence with composure, and immediately requested Dr. Atley, who was by his side, to take down some directions in regard to his affairs on paper. In a few minutes after this, he quietly lapsed into the sleep of death, in the morning on the 17th of ninth month, 1836. His last words were, I die at peace with all mankind, and hope that my trespasses may be as freely forgiven as I forgive those who have trespassed against me. To all who knew him well, of whatever class in the community, the tidings of this unexpected event brought a personal sorrow. It was felt that a man of rare probity and virtue had gone to his reward. But to the colored people the intelligence of his death was at once startling and confounding. Their whole community was bowed down in public lamentation, for their warmest and most steadfast friend was gone. They repaired in large numbers to the house of their benefactor to obtain a last glance at his lifeless body. Parents brought their little ones to the house of mourning, and as they gazed upon the features of the departed, now inanimate in death, they taught their infant minds the impressive lesson that before them were the mortal remains of one who had devoted his energies to the disenthrallment of their race, and whose memory they should ever cherish with gratitude and reverence. When the day arrived for committing his remains to the grave, the evidence of deep and pervading sorrow among these wronged and outraged people was strikingly apparent. Thousands, whose serious deportment and dejected countenances evinced that they were fully sensible of their loss, collected in the vicinity of his dwelling, anxious to testify their respect for his memory. Theirs was not the gaze of the indifferent crowd, which clusters around the abodes of fashion and splendor, to witness the pomp and circumstance attendant on the interment of the haughty or the rich. It was a solemn gathering brought together by the impulse of feeling to mingle their tears and lamentations at the grave of one whom they had loved and revered as a protector and a friend. When the hearse arrived at the quiet burial place in Arch Street, where the friends for many generations have buried their dead, six colored men carried the body to its last resting place, and the silent tear of the son of Africa over the grave of his zealous friend was more expressive of real affection than all the parade which is sometimes brought so ostentatiously before the public eye. In the expressive words of the leading newspaper of the day, Aaron Burr was lately buried with the honors of war, Thomas Shipley was buried with the honors of peace, 
let the reflecting mind pause in the honorable contrast. As a public speaker, Thomas Shipley was clear, cogent, sometimes eloquent, and always impressive. He never attempted oratorical effect or studied harangues. He generally spoke extemporaneously, on the spur of the occasion, and what he said came warm from the heart. It was the simple and unadorned expression of his sentiments and feelings. He was, however, argumentative and even logical when the occasion required it. When intensely interested, his eye was full of deep and piercing expression. Although his education had been limited, and his pursuits afforded him but little leisure time, yet he indulged his fondness for reading, and exhibited a refined literary taste in his selections. He has left amongst his books and papers eight manuscript volumes of about one hundred and fifty pages each, filled with selections copied in his own handwriting, and culled from the writings of many of the most gifted authors, both in poetry and prose. These extracts are generally of a moral and religious cast, and include scraps from Young, Milton, Addison, Burns, Cowper, Watts, Akenside, Pope, Byron, Hemans, and many others. In the domestic and social circle, his conversation was animated and instructive, and always tempered by that kindness and amenity of manners which endeared him to his family and friends. He was no bigot in religion. While a firm believer in the doctrines of the gospel as maintained by the orthodox society of friends, he yet held that religion was an operative principle, producing the fruits of righteousness and peace, in all of whatever name who are sincere followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. In conclusion, we may add, that more than most men he bore about with him the sentiment of that old Roman, Nihil humanum alienum a me puto, while he added to it the higher thought of the Christian, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. We need not dwell upon the life of such a man. Today, after the lapse of more than a generation, his memory is fresh and green in the hearts of those who knew him, and who still survive to hand down to their children the story of the trials of that eventful period in our history. To the memory of Thomas Shipley, President of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, who died on the 17th of ninth month, 1836, a devoted Christian and philanthropist. By John G. Whittier Gone to thy father's heavenly rest, the flowers of Eden round thee blowing, and on thine ear the murmurs blessed of Shiloh's waters softly flowing. Beneath that tree of life, which gives to all the earth its healing leaves, in the white robe of angels clad, and wandering by that sacred river, whose streams of holiness make glad the city of our God forever. Gentlest of spirits, not for thee our tears are shed, our sighs are given. Why mourn to know thou art a free partaker of the joys of heaven? Finished thy work, and kept thy faith, in Christian firmness unto death. And beautiful as sky and earth, when autumn's sun is downward going, the blessed memory of thy worth around thy place of slumber growing. But woe for us who linger still, with feebler strength and hearts less lowly, and minds less steadfast to the will of him whose every work is holy. For not like thine is crucified the spirit of our human pride, and at the bondsman's tale of woe, and for the outcast and forsaken, not warm like thine, but cold and slow, our weaker sympathies awaken. Darkly upon our struggling way the storm of human hate is sweeping, hunted and branded, and a prey, our watch amidst the darkness keeping. Oh, for that hidden strength which can nerve unto death the inner man, O oh, for thy spirit tried and true, and constant in the hour of trial, prepared to suffer or to do in meekness and in self-denial. O oh, for that spirit meek and mild, derided, spurned, yet uncomplaining, by man deserted and reviled, yet faithful to its trust remaining, still prompt and resolute to save from scourge and chain the hunted slave, unwavering in the truth's defense, 
e'en where the fires of hate are burning, the unquailing eye of innocence alone upon the oppressor turning. O loved of thousands, to thy grave, sorrowing of heart, thy brethren bore thee. The poor man and the rescued slave wept as the broken earth closed o'er thee, and grateful tears, like summer rain, quickened its dying grass again. And there, as to some pilgrim shrine, shall come the outcast and the lowly, of gentle deeds and words of thine, recalling memories sweet and holy. O oh, for the death the righteous die, an end like autumn's day declining, on human hearts as on the sky, with holier, tenderer beauty shining. As to the parting soul were given the radiance of an opening heaven, as if that pure and blessed light, from off the eternal altar flowing, were bathing in its upward flight, the spirit to its worship going. End of section 21「Section 22 of the Underground Railroad Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano The Underground Railroad Part 5 by William Still Section 22 Portraits and Sketches Robert Purvis Was born in Charleston, South Carolina, on the fourth day of August, 1810. His father, William Purvis, was a native of Ross County, in Northumberland, England. His mother was a free-born woman, of Charleston. His maternal grandmother was a Moor, and her father was an Israelite, named Baron Judah. Robert Purvis and his two brothers were brought to the north by their parents in 1819. In Pennsylvania and New England, he received his scholastic education, finishing it at Amherst College. Since that time, his home has been in Philadelphia, or in the vicinity of that city. His interest in the anti-slavery cause began in his childhood, inspired by such books as Sanford and Burton, and Dr. Tony's Portraiture of Slavery, which his father put into his hands. His father, though resident in a slave state, was never a slaveholder, but was heartily an abolitionist in principle. It was Robert Purvis's good fortune, before he attained his majority, to make the acquaintance of that earnest and self-sacrificing pioneer of freedom, Benjamin Lundy, and in conjunction with him was an early laborer in the anti-slavery field. He was a member of the convention held in Philadelphia in 1833, which formed the American Anti-Slavery Society, and among the signatures to its Declaration of Sentiments, the name of Robert Purvis is to be seen, a record of which his posterity to the latest generation may be justly proud. During the whole period of that society's existence, he was a member of it, and was also an active member and officer of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. To the cause of the slave's freedom, he gave with all his heart, his money, his time, his talents. Fervent in soul, eloquent in speech, most gracious in manner, he was a favorite on the platform of anti-slavery meetings. High-toned in moral nature, keenly sensitive in all matters pertaining to justice and integrity, he was a most valuable coadjutor with the leaders of an unpopular reform, and throughout the anti-slavery conflict he always received, as he always deserved, the highest confidence and warm personal regard of his fellow laborers. His faithful labors in aiding fugitive slaves cannot be recorded within the limits of this sketch. Throughout that long period of peril, to all who dared to remember those in bonds as bound with them, his house was a well-known station on the Underground Railroad. His horses and carriages, and his personal attendants, were ever at the service of the travelers upon that road. In those perilous duties his family heartily sympathized with him, and cheerfully performed their share. He has lived to witness the triumph of the great cause to which he devoted his youth and his manhood, to join in the jubilee song of the American slave, and the thanksgiving of the abolitionists, and to testify that the work of his life has been one whose reward 
is in itself. End of section 22. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 23 of The Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 23. Portraits and Sketches. John Hun, Part 1. Almost within the lion's den, in daily sight of the enemy, in the little slave-holding state of Delaware, lived and labored the freedom-loving, earnest, and whole-souled Quaker abolitionist John Hun. His headquarters were at Cantwell's Bridge, but, as an engineer of the Underground Railroad, his duties, like those of his fellow laborer Thomas Garrett, were not confined to that section, but embraced other places, and were attended with great peril, constant care and expense. He was well known to the colored people far and near, and was especially sought with regard to business pertaining to the Underground Railroad, as a friend who would never fail to assist as far as possible in every time of need. Through his agency, many found their way to freedom, both by land and water. The slaveholders regarding him with much suspicion watched him closely, and were in the habit of breathing out threatenings and slaughter very fiercely at times. But Hun was too plucky to be frightened by their threats and menaces, and as one commissioned by a higher power to remember those in bonds as bound with them, he remained faithful to the slave, men, women, or children, seeking to be unloosed from the fetters of slavery, could not make their grievances known to John Hun without calling forth his warmest sympathies. His house and heart were always open to all such. The slaveholders evidently concluded that Hun could not longer be tolerated, consequently devised a plan to capture him, on the charge of aiding off a woman with her children. John Hun and Thomas Garrett were conjointly prosecuted in this case, and in the sketch of the latter, the trial, conviction, etc., are so fully referred to that it is unnecessary to do more than allude to it here. These noted Underground Railroad offenders being duly brought before the United States District Court in May 1848, Judge Taney presiding, backed by a thoroughly pro-slavery sentiment, obviously found it a very easy matter to convict them, and a still easier matter to find them to the extent of every dollar they possessed in the world. Thousands of dollars were swept from Hun in an instant, and his family left utterly destitute. But he was by no means conquered, as he deliberately gave the court to understand in a manly speech, delivered while standing to receive his sentence. There and then he avowed his entire sympathy with the slave, and declared that in the future, as in the past, by the help of God, he would never withhold a helping hand from the downtrodden in the hour of distress. That this pledge was faithfully kept by Hun, there can be no question, as he continued steadfast at his post until the last fetter was broken by the great proclamation of Abraham Lincoln. He was not without friends, however, for even nearby dwelt a few well-tried abolitionists. Ezekiel Jenkins, Mifflin Warner, and one or two others, whole-souled workers in the same cause with Hun. He was therefore not forgotten in the hour of his extremity. Wishing to produce a sketch worthy of this veteran, we addressed him on the subject, but failed to obtain all the desired material. His reasons, however, for withholding the information which we desired were furnished, and, in connection therewith, a few anecdotes touching underground railroad matters coming under his immediate notice, which we here take great pleasure in transcribing. Buford, South Carolina, 11th month, 7th day, 1871. William Still, dear friend, in thy first letter thee asked for my photograph, as well as for an opinion of the book about to be edited by thyself. 
I returned a favorable answer and sent likeness, as requested. I incidentally mentioned that probably some of my papers might be of service to thee. The papers alluded to had no reference to myself, but consisted of anecdotes and short histories of some of the fugitives from the hell of American slavery, who gave me a call as engineer of the Underground Railroad in the state of Delaware, and received the benefit of my advice and assistance. I was twenty-seven years old when I engaged in the Underground Railroad business, and I continued therein diligently until the breaking up of that business by the Great Rebellion. I then came to South Carolina to witness the uprising of a nation of slaves into the dignity and privileges of mankind. Nothing can possibly have the same interest to me. Therefore, I propose to remain where this great problem is in the process of solution, and to give my best efforts to its successful accomplishment. In this matter the course that I have pursued thus far through life has given me solid satisfaction. I ask no other reward for any efforts made by me in the cause than to feel that I have been of use to my fellow men. No other course would have brought peace to my mind, then why should any credit be awarded to me, or how can I count any circumstance that may have occurred to me in the light of a sacrifice? If a man pursues the only course that will bring peace to his own mind, is he deserving of any credit, therefore? Is not the reward worth striving for at any cost? Indeed it is, as I well know. Would it be well for me, entertaining such sentiments, to sit down and write an account of my sacrifices? I think not. Therefore, please hold me excused. I am anxious to see thy book, and will forward the price of one as soon as I can ascertain what it is. Please accept my thanks for thy kind remembrance of me. I am now fifty-three years old, but I well remember thy face in the anti-slavery office in Fifth Street, when I called on business of the Underground Railroad. Our mutual friend, S. D. Burris, was the cause of much uneasiness to us in those times. It required much trouble, as well as expense, to save him from the slave traders. I stood by him on the auction block, and when I stepped down, they thought they had him sure. Indeed, he thought so himself for a little while but we outwitted them at last, to their great chagrin. Those were stirring times, and the people of Dover, Delaware, will long remember the time when S. D. Burris was sold at public sale for aiding slaves to escape from their masters, and was bought by the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. I remain very truly thy friend, John Hunn. End of section 23 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 24 of The Underground Railroad, Part 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still. Section 24. The case of Molly, a slave, belonging to R. Blank, B. Blank, of Smyrna, Delaware. By John Hunn, engineer of the Underground Railroad. Molly escaped from her master's farm in Cecil County, Maryland, and found a place of refuge in the house of my cousin, John Alston, near Middletown, Delaware. The man-hunters, headed by a constable with a search warrant, took her thence and lodged her in Newcastle jail. This fact was duly published in the county papers, and her master went after his chattel, and having paid the expenses of her capture, took immediate possession thereof. She was handcuffed, and, her feet being tied together, she was placed in the wagon. Before she left the jail, the wife of the sheriff gave her a piece of bread and butter, which her master kicked out of her hand, and swore that bread and butter was too good for her. After this act, her master took a drink of brandy and drove off. He stopped at a tavern about four miles from Newcastle, and took another drink of brandy. He then proceeded to Odessa, 
then called Cantwell's Bridge, and got his dinner and more brandy, for the day was a cold one. He had his horse fed, but gave no food to his human chattel, who remained in the wagon cold and hungry. After sufficient rest for himself and horse, he started again. He was now twelve miles from home. On a good road his horse was gentle, and he himself in a genial mood at the recovery of his bond woman. He yielded to the influence of the liquor he had imbibed, and fell into a sound sleep. Molly now determined to make another effort for her freedom. She accordingly worked herself gradually over the tailboard of the wagon, and fell heavily upon the frozen ground. The horse and wagon passed on, and she rolled into the bushes, and waited for deliverance from her bonds. This came from a colored man who was passing that way. As he was neither a priest nor a Levite, he took the rope from her feet and guided her to a cabin near at hand, where she was kindly received. Her deliverer could not take the handcuffs off, but promised to bring a person, during the evening, who could perform that operation. He fulfilled his promise, and brought her that night to my house, which was in sight of the one whence she had been taken to Newcastle Jail. I had no fear for her safety, as I believed that her master would not think of looking for her so near to the place where she had been arrested. Molly remained with us nearly a month, but, seeing fugitives coming and going continually, she finally concluded to go further north. I wrote to my friend, Thomas Garrett, desiring him to get a good home for Molly. This he succeeded in doing, and a friend from Chester County, Pennsylvania, came to my house and took Molly with him. She remained in his family more than six months. In the meantime, the fugitive slave law was passed by Congress, and several fugitives were arrested in Philadelphia and sent back to their masters. Molly, hearing of these doings, became uneasy, and finally determined to go to Canada. She arrived safely in the Queen's dominions, and felt at last that she had escaped from the hell of American slavery. Molly described her master as an indulgent one when sober, but when he was on a spree, he seemed to take great delight in tormenting her. He would have her beaten unmercifully, without cause, and then have her stripes washed in salt water. Then he would have her dragged through the horse pond till she was nearly dead. This last operation seemed to afford him much pleasure. When he became sober, he would express regret at having treated her so cruelly. I frequently saw this master of Molly's, and was always treated respectfully by him. He would have his sprees after Molly left him. An account of the escape from slavery of Samuel Hawkins and family of Queen Anne's County, Maryland, on the Underground Railroad in the state of Delaware, by John Hunn. On the morning of the 27th of Twelfth Month, December, 1845, as I was washing my hands at the yard pump of my residence, near Middletown, Newcastle County, Delaware, I looked down the lane and saw a covered wagon slowly approaching my house. The sun had just risen and was shining brightly after a stormy night on the snow which covered the ground to the depth of six inches. My house was situated three quarters of a mile from the road leading from Middletown to Odessa, then called Cantwell's Bridge. On a closer inspection, I noticed several men walking beside the wagon. This seemed rather an early hour for visitors and I could not account for the circumstance. When they reached the yard fence I met them, and a colored man handed me a letter addressed to Daniel Corbett, John Austin, or John Hunn. I asked the man if he had presented the letter to either of the others to whom it was addressed. He said no, that he had not been able to see either of them. The letter was from my cousin, Ezekiel Jenkins, of Camden, Delaware, and stated that the travelers were fugitive slaves, under the direction of Samuel D. Burris, who handed me the note. The party consisted of a man and his wife, with their six children, and four fine-looking colored men, without counting the pilot, S. D. Burris, who was a free man, from Kent County, Delaware. This was the first time I had ever saw Burris, and also the first time that I had ever been called upon to assist fugitives from the hell of American slavery. The wanderers were gladly welcomed, and made as comfortable as possible until breakfast was ready for them. One man, in trying to pull his boots off, 
found they were frozen to his feet. He went to the pump and filled them with water. Thus he was able to get them off in a few minutes. This increase of thirteen in the family was a little embarrassing, but after breakfast they all retired to the barn to sleep on the hay, except the woman and four children, who remained in the house. They were all very weary, as they had traveled from Camden, twenty-seven miles, through a snowstorm. The woman and four children in the wagon with the driver, the others walking all the way. Most of them were badly frostbitten before they arrived at my house. In Camden they were sheltered in the houses of their colored friends. Although this was my first acquaintance with S. D. Burris, it was not my last, as he afterwards piloted them himself, or was instrumental in directing hundreds of fugitives to me for shelter. About two o'clock of the day on which these fugitives arrived at my house, a neighbor drove up with his daughter in a sleigh, apparently on a friendly visit. I noticed his restlessness and frequent looking out of the window fronting the road, but did not suppose that he had come to spy out the land. The wagon and the persons walking with it had been observed from his house, and he had reported the fact in Middletown. Accordingly, in half an hour, another sleigh came up, containing a constable of Middletown, William Hardcastle of Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and William Chestnut, of the same neighborhood. I met them at the gate, and the constable handed me an advertisement, wherein one thousand dollars reward was offered for the recovery of three runaway slaves, therein described. The constable asked me if they were in my house. I said they were not. He then asked me if he might search the house. I declined to allow him this privilege unless he had a warrant for that purpose. While we stood thus conversing, the husband of the woman with the six children came out of the house near the barn and ran into the woods. The constable and his two companions immediately gave chase with many hellos. After running more than a mile through the snow, the fugitive came toward the house. I went to meet him and found him with his back against the barnyard fence, with a butcher's knife in his hand. The man-hunters soon came up, and the constable asked me to get the knife from the fugitive. This I declined, unless the constable should first give me his pistol, with which he was threatening to shoot the man. He complied with my request, and the fugitive handed me the knife. Then he produced a pass, properly authenticated, and signed by a magistrate of Queen Anne's County, Maryland certifying that this man was free, and that his name was Samuel Hawkins. William Hardcastle now advanced, and said that he knew the man to be free, but that he was accused of running away with his wife and children, who were slaves. He also said that this man had two boys with him, who belonged to a neighbor of his, named Charles Wesley Glanding, and that the four other children and mother belonged to Catherine Turner, of Queen Anne's County, Maryland. Hardcastle further expressed his belief that this man knew where his wife and children were at that time, and insisted that he should go before a magistrate in Middletown and be examined in regard thereto. He also expressed doubts as to the genuineness of this pass, and wished the man to go to Middletown on that account also. As there was no other course to pursue under the circumstances, I had my sleigh brought out, and we all went to Middletown, before my friend, William Streets, who was then in commission as a magistrate. It was now after dark of this short winter's day. Soon after our arrival at the office of William Streets, Hardcastle put his arm very lovingly around the neck of the colored man, Samuel Hawkins, and drew him into another room. In a short time, Samuel came out and told me that Hardcastle had agreed that if he, Hawkins, would give up his two older boys, who belonged to Charles Wesley Glanding, that he might pursue his journey with his wife and four children. I asked him if he believed Hardcastle would keep his promise. He replied, Yes, I do not think Master William would cheat me. I assured him that he would cheat him, and that the offer was made for the purpose of not only getting the two older boys, fourteen and sixteen years of age, but his wife and other children, to the office, when all of them would be taken together to the jail, in Newcastle. Samuel thought differently, and at his request, I wrote to my wife for the delivery of the family of Samuel Hawkins to the constable. They were soon forthcoming, and on their arrival at the office, a commitment was made out for the whole party. Samuel and his two older sons were handcuffed, amidst many tears and lamentations, 
and they all went off under charge of the man-hunters to newcastle jail a distance of eighteen miles william streets committed the whole party as fugitives from slavery while the husband samuel was a free man this was done on account of the detestation of the wicked business as much as on account of his friendship for me on their arrival at the jail about midnight the sheriff was aroused and the commitment shown to him after reading it he asked samuel if he was a slave he said no and showed his pass which had been pronounced genuine by the magistrate the sheriff thereupon told them that the commitment was not legal it would not hold them lawfully it was now first day sunday and the man-hunters were in a quandary the constable finally agreed to go back and get another commitment if the sheriff would take the party into the jail until his return hardcastle also urged the sheriff to adopt this plan accordingly they were taken into the jail the sheriff's daughter had heard her father's conversation with the constable accordingly she sent word on first day morning to my revered friend thomas garrett of wilmington five miles distant in regard to the matter inviting him to see the fugitives early on second day morning monday thomas went over with john wales attorney at law the latter soon obtained a writ of habeas corpus from judge booth of newcastle which was served upon the sheriff who therefore brought the whole party before judge booth who discharged them at once as being illegally detained by the sheriff thomas garrett with the consent of the judge then hired a carriage to take the woman and four children over to wilmington samuel and the two older boys walked so they all escaped from the man-hunters they went from wilmington to byberry and settled near the farm of robert purvis samuel hawkins and wife have since died but their descendants still live in that neighborhood under the name of hackett soon after the departure of the fugitives from newcastle jail the constable arrived with new commitments from william streets and presented them in due form to the sheriff who informed him that they had been liberated by order of judge booth a few hours after william hardcastle arrived from philadelphia expecting to take samuel hawkins and his family to queen anne's county maryland judge of his disappointment at finding they were beyond his control absolutely gone they returned to middletown in great anger and threatened to prosecute william streets for his participation in the affair after the departure of the hawkins family from middletown i returned home to see what had become of s d burris and his four men i found them taking some solid refreshment preparatory to taking a long walk in the snow they left about nine p m for wilmington i sent by s d burris a letter to thomas garrett detailing the arrest and commitment of s hawkins and family to newcastle jail they all arrived safely in wilmington before daylight next morning burris waited to hear the result of the expedition to newcastle and actually had the pleasure of seeing s hawkins and family arrive in wilmington samuel burris returned to my house early on third day morning with a letter from thomas garrett giving me a description of the whole transaction my joy on this occasion was great and i returned thanks to god for this wonderful escape of so many human beings from the charnel house of slavery of course this circumstance excited the ire of many pro-slavery editors in maryland i had copies of several papers sent me wherein i was described as a man unfit to live in a civilized community and calling upon the inhabitants of middletown to expel such a dangerous person from that neighborhood they also told exactly where I lived, which enabled many a poor fugitive escaping from the house of bondage to find a hearty welcome and a resting place on the road to liberty. Thanks be to God for his goodness to me in this respect. The trial which ensued from the above came off before Chief Justice Taney at Newcastle. My revered friend Thomas Garrett and myself were there convicted of harboring fugitive slaves and were fined accordingly to the extent of the law judge taney delivering the sentence a detailed account of said trial will appear fully in the memoirs of our deceased friend thomas garrett end of section twenty four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twenty five of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. The Underground Railroad, Part 5, by William Still, Section 25. Portraits and Sketches, Samuel Rhodes. Was born in Philadelphia in 1806 and was through life a consistent member of the Society of Friends. His parents were persons of great respectability and integrity. The son early showed an ardent desire for improvement and was distinguished among his young companions for warm affections, amiable disposition, and genial manners, rare purity and refinement of feeling, and a taste for literary pursuits, preferring as his associates those to whom he looked for instruction and example, and aiming at a high standard, he won a position both mentally and socially superior to his early surroundings. With a keen sense of justice and humanity, he could not fail to share in the traditional opposition of his religious society to slavery, and to be quickened to more intense feeling as the evils of the system were more fully revealed in the anti-slavery agitation, which in his early manhood began to stir the nation. A visit to England in 1834 brought him into connection and friendship with many leading friends in that country, who were actively engaged in the anti-slavery movement, and probably had much to do with directing his attention specially to the subject. Once enlisted, he never wavered, but as long as slavery existed by law in our country, his influence both publicly and privately was exerted against it. He was strengthened in his course by a warm friendship and frequent intercourse with the late Abraham L. Pennock, a man whose unbending integrity and firm allegiance to duty were equaled only by his active benevolence, broad charity, and rare clearness of judgment. Samuel Rhodes, like him, while sympathizing with other phases of the anti-slavery movement, took a special interest in the subject of abstaining from the use of articles produced by slave labor. Believing that the purchase of such articles, by furnishing to the master the only possibility of pecuniary profit from the labor of his slaves, supplied one motive for holding them in bondage, and the purchaser thus became, however unwittingly, a partaker in the guilt, he felt conscientiously bound to withhold his individual support as far as practicable and to recommend the same course to others. His practical action upon these views began about the year 1841 and was preserved in and at no small expense and inconvenience till slavery ceased in this country to have a legal existence. About this time he united with the American Free Produce Association, which had been formed in 1838 and in 1845 took an active part in the formation of the Free Produce Association of Friends of Philadelphia, YM both associations having the object of promoting the production by free labor of articles usually grown by slaves, particularly of cotton. Agents were sent into the cotton states to make arrangements with small planters who were growing cotton by the labor of themselves and their families without the help of slaves, to obtain their crops which otherwise went into the general market and could not be distinguished. A manufactory was established for working this cotton, and a limited variety of goods were thus furnished. In all these operations, Samuel Rhodes aided efficiently by counsel and money. In 1846, the non-slaveholder, a monthly periodical devoted mainly to the advocacy of the free produce cause, was established in Philadelphia, edited by A. L. Pennock, S. Rhodes, and George W. Taylor. It was continued five years for the last two of which Samuel Rhodes conducted it alone. He wrote also a pamphlet on the free labor question. From July 1856 to January 1867, he was editor of the Friends Review, a weekly paper, religious and literary, conducted in the interest of his own religious society, and in this position he gave frequent proofs of interest in the slaves, keeping his readers well advised of events and movements bearing upon the subject. While thus awake to all forms of anti-slavery effort, his heart and hand were ever open to the fugitive from bondage who appealed to him, and none such were ever sent away empty. Though not a member of the Vigilance Committee, he rendered it frequent and most efficient aid especially during the dark ten years after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law. A second visit to England in 1847 had enlarged his connection and correspondence with anti-slavery friends there, and in addition to his own contributions, very considerable sums of money were transmitted to him, especially through A. H. Richardson, for the benefit of the fugitives. Often when the treasury of the committee ran low, he came opportunely to their relief, with funds sent by his English friends, while his sympathy and encouragement never failed. The extent of his assistance in this direction was known to but few, but by them its value was gratefully acknowledged. None rejoiced more than he in the overthrow of American slavery, though its end came in convulsion and bloodshed at which his spirit revolted, not by the peaceful means through which he with others had labored to bring it about. 
He had, some years before, been active in preparing a memorial to Congress, asking that body to make an effort to put an end to slavery in the states by offering from the national treasury to any state or states which would emancipate the slaves therein, and engage not to renew the system, compensation for losses thus sustained. This proposition was made not as admitting any right of the masters to compensation, but on the ground that the whole nation, having shared in the guilt of maintaining slavery, might justly share also in whatever pecuniary loss might follow its abandonment. This memorial was sent to Congress, but elicited no response, and in the fullness of time, the nation paid even in money many times any possible price that could have been demanded under this plan. Samuel Rhodes died in 1868. End of section 25section 26 of the underground railroad part 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer door the underground railroad part 5 by william still section 26 portraits and sketches george corson was born in Plymouth Township, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, January 24, 1803. He was the son of Joseph and Hannah Corson. He was married January 24, 1832, to Martha, daughter of Samuel and Susanna Malsby. There were perhaps few more devoted men than George Corson to the interests of the oppressed everywhere. The slave, fleeting from his master, ever found a home with him, and felt while there that no slave hunter would get him away until every means of protection should fail. He was ever ready to send his horse and carriage to convey them on the road to Canada, or elsewhere towards freedom. His home was always open to entertain the anti-slavery advocates, and being warmly supported in the cause by his excellent wife. Everything which they could do to make their guests comfortable was done. The Burleys, J. Miller McKim, Miss Mary McGrew, F. Douglas, and others will not soon forget that hospitable home. It is to be regretted that he died before the emancipation of the slaves, which he had so long labored for, arrived. In this connection, it may not be improper to state that simultaneously with his labors in the anti-slavery cause, he was also laboring with zeal in the cause of temperance. Of his efforts in that direction through nearly thirty years, our space will not allow us to speak. His life and labors were a daily protest against the traffic of rum. There is also another phase of his character which should be mentioned. Whenever he saw animals abused, horses beaten, he instantly interfered, often at great risk of personal harm from the brutal drivers about the lime quarries and iron ore diggings. So firm, so determined was he, that the cruelest ruffian felt that he must yield or confront the law. Take him all for all, there will rarely be found in one man more universal benevolence and justice than was possessed by the subject of this notice. Hiram Corson, brother of the subject of this sketch, and a faithful co-laborer in the cause, in response to a request that he would furnish a reminiscence touching his brother's agency in assisting fugitives, wrote as follows. November 1, 1871. Dear Robert, William Still wishes some account of the case of the Negro slave taken from our neighborhood some years ago, after an attempt by my brother George to release him, about thirty years ago. George had been on a visit to our brother Charles, living at the fork of the Skipack and Perkyoman Creeks, in this county, and on his return late in the afternoon, while coming along an obscure road, not the main direct road, he came up to a man on horseback, who was followed at a distance of a few feet by a colored man with a rope tied around his neck and the other end held by the person on horseback. George had had experience with those slave drivers before, as in the case of John and James Lewis, and withal had become deeply interested in the anti-slavery cause. He therefore inquired of the mounted man what the other had done that he was to be thus treated. He quietly remarked that he was his slave and had run away. He then asked by what authority he held him. He said by warrant from Esquire Vanderslice. Indignant at this great outrage, my brother hurried on to Norristown and waited his arrival, with the process to arrest him. The slave master, confident in his rights, bold in the country of those pretended freemen, who were ever ready to kiss the rod of slavery, came slowly riding into Norristown just before sunset, with the rope still fast to the slave's neck. He was immediately taken before a justice of the peace, whose name I do not now remember. 
the people gathered around anxious inquiries were made as to the person who had the audacity to question the right of this quiet peaceable man to do with his slave as he pleased great scorn was expressed for the busy abolitionists much sympathy given to the abused slave owner it was soon decided by the aid of a volunteer lawyer whose sons have since fought the battle for freedom that the slave owner had a right to take his slave wherever and in whatever way he pleased through the country and not only that but at his call for help it was the bounden duty of every man called upon to aid him and the person who had the audacity to stop him was threatened with punishment but george's blood was up so pained was he at the sight of a man a poor man a helpless man being dragged through from pennsylvania with a halter around his neck that amidst the jeers and insults of the debased crowd he denounced slavery its aiders and abettors in tones of scorn and loathing but the man-thief was left with his prey through the advice of those who stood by the slave laws and who knelt before the slave power as personified by that hunter of slaves the rope was taken from the neck and the man guarded while the master regaled himself that night he disappeared with his man i can also give a few particulars of the escape of the gorsuch murders from norristown on their way to canada there should be a portrait of daniel ross and a history of his labors during twenty or more years hundreds were entertained in his humble home and it was in his home that the gorsuch murderer was secreted he must not be left out i can also get the whole history escape capture trial conviction and redemption of james and john lewis and one other they were captured here within sight of our house george corson esq published it all about ten years ago respectfully robert r corson hiram corson end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the underground railroad part five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the underground railroad part five by william still section twenty seven portraits and sketches charles d cleveland part one mr still has asked me to record the part that my father bore in the anti-slavery enterprise as it began and grew in this city i comply because the history of that struggle would be very incomplete if from it were omitted the peculiar work which my father's position here shaped for him yet i can only indicate his work not portray it tell some of its elements and then leave them to the moral sympathies of the reader to upbuild for first his labor for the love of man was evenly distributed through the mould and movements of his entire life and from a perpetual current of nourishing blood one cannot name those particular atoms that are busiest or richest to sustain vitality and further if i could hear his voice it would forbid any detailed account of what he accomplished and endured it was all done unobtrusively in his life bravely defiantly in regard of the evil to be met and mastered but as unconsciously in regard of himself as every conviction works when it is as broad as the entire spiritual life of a man and has his entire spiritual force to give it expression i know therefore that while i should be permitted to mention so much of his service as the history of the conflict might demand i should be forbidden all tale of sacrifice and labor that mere personal narrative would include and i ask now only this what peculiar influence did he exert for the furtherance of the cause which so largely absorbed his labor and life did he contribute anything to what stamped with the signature of so clear an individuality that no other man could have contributed quite the same to this i maintain an affirmative answer and in witness of its truth i sketch the general course of his life that through it we may find those elements of his character which intuitively ranged him on the side of the slave when my father came to philadelphia in eighteen thirty four his sentiments in regard to slavery 
were those held generally in the North, an easy-going wish to avoid direct issue with the South on a question supposed to be peculiarly theirs. But the winds of heaven owned to no decorous limit in Mason and Dixon's line, and there were larger winds blowing than these, winds rising in the vast laboratories of the general human heart, and destined to sweep into all the vast spaces of human want and woe. The South was finding, through her blacks' perpetual defiance of torture and death for freedom, that there was perhaps something, even in a negro, which most vexatiously refused to be counted in with the figures of the auctioneer's bill of sale. And now the North's lesson was coming to her, that the soul of a century civilization was still less purchasable than the soul of a slave. A growing feeling of humanity was stirring through the northern states. It was not the work, I think, of any man or body of men. It was rather itself a creative force, and made men and bodies of men the results of its awakening influence. To such a power my father's nature was quickly responsive. Both his head and his heart recognized the terrible wrongs of the enslaved, and the urgency with which they pressed for remedy. But where was the means? From the first, he felt that the movement which brought freedom and slavery fairly into the field, and squarely against each other, through unnecessary obstacles in its own way, by the violence with which it was begun and prosecuted. If he were to work at all in the cause, he determined to work within the limits of recognized law. The Colonization Society held out a good hope, at least. He could see no other as close to the true, but closer to the feasible. And, after connecting himself with it, he seems to have been content for a while on the score of political matters, and to have devoted himself to what he had adopted as his chief purpose in life. This was, enlarging the sphere of female education, and giving it a more vigorous tone. To this he tasked all his abilities. His convictions on the subject were very earnest, his strength of character sufficient to bear them out, so that, in a short time, he was able to establish his school so firmly in the respect of this community, that, for twenty-five years, all the odium that his activity in the anti-slavery cause drew upon him did not for a moment abate the public confidence accorded to his professional power. It was in 1836, in one of his vacations, that his mind was violently turned inwards to re-examine his status upon the anti-slavery question. He happened to be visiting his old college friend, Salmon P. Chase, at Cincinnati, and, fortunately for the spiritual life of both men, it was at the time of the terrible riots that broke up the press of John G. Burney, both being known as already favoring the cause of the slave. They stood in much peril for several days, but when the dark time was past, the clearness that defined their sentiments was seen to be worth all the personal danger that had bought it. Self-delusion on the subject was no longer possible. The deductions from the facts were as plain as the facts themselves. The two friends took counsel together, and adopted the policy from which thenceforward neither ever swerved. A great cloud was rolled from their eyes, and all this turmoil of riot they saw on the one side, indeed, a love of man great in its devotion, but on the other a moral deadness in the north so profound and determined that it threatened thus brutally any voice that would disturb it. Their duty, then, was evident, to fling all the forces of their lives, and by all social and political means, right against this inertness, and shatter it if they could. To Mr. Chase, the course of things gave the larger political work, to my father, the larger social. His diary records how amazed he was, when he returned to Philadelphia, at his former blindness, and how thankful to the spirit of love that it touched and cleansed his eyes that he might see God's image erect. He knew now that his lot had been cast in the very stronghold of apathy, the home of a lukewarm spirit, which, not containing anything positive to keep it close to the right, let its sullen negativeness gravitate towards the wrong. It will be difficult to make coming generations understand, not the flaming antagonism to humanity, but the more brutal avoidance of it 
that ruled the political tone in this latitude from eighteen thirty six to eighteen sixty one i have thought of the word bitterness as expressing it but though that might convey somewhat of its recoil when disturbed it pictures nothing of its inhuman solicitude against all disturbance conservatism it was called and certainly it did conserve the devil admirably at the south one race of men were so basely wielding a greater physical power over another race of men as to crush from them the attributes of self-responsible creatures philadelphia the city of the north nearest the wrong made no plea for humanity's claims it went on this monstrous abrogation of everything that lends sanctity to man's relations on earth till slaves were beasts with instincts annihilated and masters demons with instincts reversed philadelphia made no plea for the violated rhythm of life on either side even the church betrayed its mission and practically aided in stamping out for millions the spirit that related them to the divine still philadelphia made no plea for god's love in his humanity utterly insensible to the most piercing appeals that man can make to man she loved her hardness clung to it and if now and then a voice from the north blew down warningly as a trumpet the great city turned sluggishly in her bed of spiritual and political torpor and cried let be let be a little more slumber a little more folding of the hands to my moral death sleep this souring of faith this half paralysis of the heart's beating this blurring of the intuitions that make manhood possible were what my father found here in that year of our lord's grace eighteen thirty six it will be worth while to watch him move into the fight and bear his part in its thickest just to learn how largely history lays her humanitarian advances on a few willing souls the means which lay readiest to his use for rousing the dormant spirit of the city was his social position and yet how hard one would think must have been to make the sacrifice he came accredited by all the claims of finished culture a man consecrated to the scholar's life then with the sensitiveness that springs from intellectual breeding one will look to see him shrink from conflict with the callous condition of feeling around him the glamour of book lore will spread over it and hide it from his sight he has a noble enough mission at all events to raise the standard of educational culture in a city that hardly knows the meaning of the term and if any glimpse should come to him of the lethargic inhumanity around him he can afford to let it pass as a glimpse his look being fixed on the sacred heights which the scholar's feet must tread footnote all that i write here of my father i write equally of his co-laborer in the same sphere of work rev w h furness and if it is true of others whom i did not know then to their memory also i bear this record of the two whose labors and characters has been the deepest privilege of my life to know so well End footnote. ah how his course so different proves to us that the true scholar is always a scholar of truth no matter what element of the public sentiment he met the listlessness of pampered wealth the brutal prejudice of some voting savage the refined sneer of lettered dilettantism the purposed aversion of trade or pulpit fearing disturbed markets or pews he beat lustily and incessantly at all the parts of the iron image of wrong sitting stolidly here with closed shut eyes no matter when it was on holiday or working day or sabbath at home and abroad in the parlor the street the counting-room in his school and in the church he bore down on this apathy in its brood of scorns like a west wind that sweeps through a city dying under weight of miasma and the wind might as well cease blowing yet not cease to be wind as my father's influence stop and himself live it scattered the good seed everywhere how often have i heard him say i know nothing of what the harvest will be i am responsible only for the sowing and bravely went the sowing on with the broadcast largesse of love there was no breeze of talk that did not carry the seeds to the wayside for from those that even chance upon the truth the fowls of the air cannot take it all to thin soil and among thorns for no heart so feeble 
or choked that will not find in a single day's growth of truth germination for eternity to stony places for no cranny in the rocks that can hold a seed but can be a home for riving roots and other fell on good ground and did bring forth fruit thus it was primarily to rouse those of his own class that he labored to gall them into seeing though they should turn again and rend him that moral supineness is moral decay that the soul shrivels into nothingness when wrong is acquiesced in as surely as it is torn and scattered by the furies that loose within it when wrong is done but just there lay the difficulty and pain of his mission that from his acknowledged standing in the literary world and as a leader in the interests of higher education his path brought him into contact mainly with the cultured and it was among these that the pro-slavery spirit ruled with its bitterest stringency not cultured let us unsay the word rather with the gloss and hard polish which reading and wealth and the finer appointments of living can throw over spiritual arrest or decay culture is a holy word and dare be used of intellectual advance only when the moral sympathies have kept equal step it includes something beyond an amateur sentiment in favor of what we favor if it does not open the ear to every cry of humanity struggling up or slipping back it is no culture properly so called but a sham a mask of wax a varnish with cruel glitter and what a double wrath will be poured on him who cracks the wax and the varnish not only because of the rude awakening but because the crack shows the sham End of section twenty seven recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section twenty eight of the Underground Railroad Part five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano the underground railroad part 5 by william still section 28 portraits and sketches charles d cleveland part 2 it is impossible for us now to realize what revenge this class dealt to my father for twenty-five years consider their power of revenge they could not force a loss of property or of life it is true they made no open assault in the street their delicacy held itself above common vituperation but they wielded a greater power than all these over a man whose every accomplishment made him their equal and they used it without stint they doomed him to the slow martyrdom of social scorn they shut their doors against him they elbowed him from every position to which he had a wish or a right except public respect and they could not elbow him from that unless they pushed his character from its poise they cut him off from every friendly regard which would else have been devotedly his on that level of educated life and limited him to solitary confinement within himself they compelled him to walk as if under a ban or an anathema had he been a leper in syrian deserts or a disciple of jesus among pharisees he could not have been more utterly banished from the region of homes and self-constituted piety they showered ineffable contempt upon him in every way consistent with their littleness and refinement slight sneer insult all the myriad indignities that only good society can devise these were what my father received in return for his love and his work in love how little personal relation all this obloquy bore to him let this stand as evidence that he not only continued his work but daily gave it more caustic energy and wider scope as i have hinted he did not in political matters given his adherence to that class of abolitionists who as he thought threw away their best chances of success in refusing to work within constitutional provisions he was prouder 
that this single community should call him abolitionist, though it spat the word at him, and if the whole earth should hail him with the kingliest title. But he loved the name too well not to make it stand for some practical fact, some feasible and organized effort. He believed that our national constitution did, indeed, hold many compromises with slavery, but was framed, in the majority of its provisions, and certainly in the totality of its spirit, in the interests of freedom, and that it only needed enforcement by the choice of the ballot box to bring the South either to an amicable or a hostile settlement of the question, which he did not ask or care. The duty of the present could not be misread. It was written in the vote. With these views, he gave much time and work to organizing in this state. The National Liberty Party, in 1840, and to securing from Pennsylvania some of the 7,000 votes that were cast for John G. Burney in that year throughout the Union. By the time another election came, the party had swelled its numbers to 70,000. To contribute his share towards this success, tract after tract, address after address, were written and sent broadcast. Meetings were convened, committees formed, resolutions framed, speeches made, petitions and remonstrances sent, public action fearlessly sifted and criticized. In short, because he held a steady faith in men's humane promptings, when ultimately reached, he cried aloud, to them by every access, and spared not to call them from their timidity, and time-serving to manly utterance through the ballot-box. Of such appeals his address of the Liberty Party of Pennsylvania to the people of the state, issued in 1844, may stand as a sample. It is a vivid portrayal of the slave power's insidious encroachments, and of its monopolized guidance of the government. It gathers up the national statistics into groups, shows how new meaning is reflected from them thus related, that all unite to illustrate the single fact of the South's steady increase of power, her tightening grasp about the throat of government, and her buffets of threat to the North when a wheedling palm failed to palsy fast enough. It warns northern voters of the undertow that is drawing them, and adjures them, by every consideration of political common sense, not to cast their ballots for either of the pro-slavery candidates presented. The conclusion of this address is as follows. Our Object And now, fellow citizens, you may ask, what is our object in thus exhibiting to you the alarming influence of the slave power? Do we wish to excite in your bosoms feelings of hatred against citizens of a common country? Do we wish to array the free states against the slave states in hostile strife? No, fellow citizens, but we wish to show you that, while the slave states are inferior to us in free population, having not even one half of ours, inferior in morals, being the region of bowie knives and duels, of assassinations and lynch law, inferior in mental attainments, having not one-fourth of the number that can read and write, inferior in intelligence, having not one-fifth of the number of literary and scientific periodicals, inferior in the products of agriculture and manufactures, of mines, of fisheries, and of the forest, inferior, in short, in everything that constitutes the wealth, the honor, the dignity, the stability, the happiness, the true greatness of a nation. It is wrong, it is unjust, it is absurd, that they should have an influence in all the departments of government, so entirely disproportionate to your own. We would arouse you to your own true interests. We would have you, like men, firmly resolved to maintain your own rights. We would have you say to the South, if you choose to hug to your bosom that system which is continually injuring and impoverishing you, that system which reduces two millions and a half of Native Americans in your midst to the most abject condition of ignorance and vice, withholding from them the very key of knowledge, that system which is at war with every principle of justice, every feeling of humanity, that system which makes man the property of man, and perpetuates that relation from one generation to another, that system which tramples continually upon a majority of the commandments of the Decalogue, that system 
which could not live a day if it did not give one party supreme control over the persons the health the liberty the happiness the marriage relations the parental authority and filial obligations of the other if you choose to cling to such a system cling to it but you shall not cross our line you shall not bring that foul thing here we know and we here repeat it for the thousandth time to meet for the thousandth time the calumnies of our enemies that while we may present to you every consideration of duty we have no right as well as no power to alter your state laws but remember that slavery is the mere creature of local or statute law and cannot exist out of the region where such law has force it is odious says lord mansfield that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law we would therefore say to you again in the strength of that constitution under which we live in which nowhere countenances slavery you shall not bring that foul thing here you shall not force the corrupted and corrupting blood of that system into every vein and artery of our body politic you shall not have the controlling power in all the departments of our government at home and abroad you shall not so negotiate with foreign powers as to open markets for the products of slave labor alone you shall not so manage things at home as every few years to bring bankruptcy upon our country you shall not in the apportionment of public monies have what you call your property represented and thus get that which by no right belongs to you you shall not have the power to bring your slaves upon our free soil and take them away at pleasure nor to reclaim them when they panting for liberty have been able to escape your grasp for we would have it said of us as the eloquent current said of britain the moment the slave touches our soil the ground on which he stands is holy and consecrated to the genius of universal emancipation thus fellow citizens we come to the great object of the liberty party absolute and unqualified divorce of the general government from all connection with slavery we would employ every constitutional means to eradicate it from our entire country because it would be for the highest welfare of our entire country we would have liberty established in the district and in all the territories we would have liberty of speech and of the press which the constitution guarantees to us we would have the right of petition most sacredly regarded we would secure to every man what the constitution secures the right of trial by jury we would do what we can for the encouragement and improvement of the colored race and restore to them that inestimable right of which they have been so meanly as well as unjustly deprived the right of suffrage we would look to the best interests of the country and the whole country and not legislate for the good of an oligarchy the most arrogant that ever lorded it over an insulted people we would have our commercial treaties with foreign nations regard the interests of the free states we would provide safe adequate and permanent markets for the produce of free labor and when reproached with slavery we would be able to say to the world with an open front and a clear conscience our general government has nothing to do with it either to promote to sustain to defend to sanction or to approve thus fellow citizens you see our objects you may now ask by what means we hope to attain them we answer by political action what is political action it is acting in a manner appropriate to those objects which we wish to secure through the agency of the different departments of government the only way in which we can act constitutionally is to go to the ballot box and there silently and unostentatiously deposit a vote for such men as will do what they can to carry out those principles which we have so much at heart come then men of pennsylvania come and join us in this good work join us to use such moral means as to correct public sentiment throughout the region where slavery exists and to oppress upon the people of the free states a manly sense of their own rights join us to place just men in our public offices men whose example a whole people may safely imitate join us to free our general government from the ignominious reproach of slavery to restore to our country those principles which our fathers so labored to establish and to hand these principles down afresh to successive generations 
It is the cause of truth, of humanity, and of God, to which we invite your aid. It is a cause of which you never need to be ashamed. Living, you may be thankful, and dying, you may be thankful, for having labored in it. We have, as co-laborers with us, the noblest allies that man can wish. Within, we have the deepest convictions of conscience, the clearest deductions of reason, and, all over the world, wherever man is found, the first, the most ardent longings of the human soul. Without, we have the happiness of nearly three millions of the human race, the honor, as well as the best interests of our whole country, and the universal consent of all good men whose moral vision is not obscured by the mist of a low, misguided selfishness. While we seem to hear, as it were, the voices of the great and the good, the patriot and the philanthropist, of a past generation, calling to us, and cheering us on, but, above all these, and beyond all these, we have with us the highest attributes of God, justice and mercy. With such allies, and in such a cause, who can doubt on which side the victory will ultimately rest? May he who guides the destinies of nations, and without whose aid they labor in vain that build, so incline your hearts to exert your whole influence to place in all our public offices just and good men, that our country may be preserved, her best interests advanced, and her institutions, free in reality as in name, handed down to the latest posterity. Is not the love of God and man ingrained in every line of this writing? Yet, let us see how it was received by the most Christian body in this city. End of section 28 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 29 of the Underground Railroad Part 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Jordan. The Underground Railroad Part 5 by William Still. Section 29. Portraits and Sketches. Charles D. Cleveland. Part 3. I need hardly say that my father's mind had been largely impressed from earliest manhood with the highest subject human thought can touch. His library records his wide religious reading, but he could not see an honest path towards the profession of any definite views till 1836. The change wrought in him then can best be gathered from his own simple words under date 1842, written in a flyleaf of the Unitarian Miscellany. Though I humbly trust that God made my trials in 1836 the means of bringing me to true repentance, yet I have kept these books as monuments of what I once was, and to remind me how grateful I should be to Him for having snatched me as a brand from the burning. Such a faith as this, born of the spiritual travail of years, what a life it always has for the heart that forms it. It tells not of a persuasion, but of a conviction, a disproof of skepticism, through the gathered forces of the soul, a struggle, through epochs of doubt and dismay, into an attitude of positive vital faith. Its process is the only one that gives real right to ultimate peace. In comparison with the method and measure of such a conviction, what matters its specific form? Self-truth is the point, the fact for starting, the line for guiding, and as for result, this lonely and solemn rally on the deepest within us, as it is continuously unfolded, must lead to a glad and solemn union with the highest without us. Who can know unfailing inward energy except through this new birth? It proved an ever-fresh spring of vigor to my father, and because of it he was chosen, in 1839, president of the Philadelphia Bible Society. What changes were wrought in the policy of the society? What numerous plans were devised and executed for multiplying its operations, how it was made a cordial alliance of all denominations will presently appear. This is now to be said that after filling his office for five years, he found that his anti-slavery testimony had engendered in the managers a bitterness that would seize the address of 1844 for pretext and make retaliation in his sacrifice. Thankful for the thousandth time to be a sacrifice for the cause he loved, he sent in his resignation in a letter full of Christian kindness and sorrow. A short extract will show its tone. One whose great heart wishes the best for humanity calls to us from the West. 
When your society proposed to put a Bible into every family and yet omit all reference to the slaves, and when, given an account of the destitution of the land, they make no mention of two and a half millions of people perishing in our midst without the scriptures, can we help feeling that something is dreadfully wrong? This, brethren, is a most solemn question. It is a question which I verily believe the American Bible Society, so far as they may have yielded, directly or indirectly, openly or silently, to a corrupt public sentiment on this subject, will have to answer at the bar of him who has declared that, if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and that inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. The spirit of Christianity is a spirit of universal love and philanthropy. She looks down with pity, and if she could, she would look with scorn upon all the petty distinctions that exist among men. She casts her benignant eye abroad over the earth, and wherever she sees man, she sees him as man, as a being made in the image of God, whether an Indian, an African, or a Caucasian sun may shine upon him. She stoops from heaven to raise the fallen, to bind up the broken-hearted, to release the oppressed, to give liberty to the captive, and to break the fetters of those that are bound. She is marching onward with accelerated step, and wherever she leaves the true impress of her heavenly influence, the moral wilderness is changed into the garden of the Lord. May it never be ours to do what may seem to be even the slightest obstacle to her universal sway. But I have already written more than I intended. In bringing this communication to a close, allow me to express to you individually, and as a board, my most sincere Christian attachment. Whatever course any members may have taken in relation to this matter, I must believe that they have acted from what has seemed to them a sense of duty, Far be it from me to impeach their motives. Time, the great test of truth, may show them their course in a very different light from that in which they now view it. I may, as a Christian, lament that their views of duty are not more in unison with my own. I may, as a man, feel heart-sickening at the diseased, the deplorably diseased state of the public mind in relation to two and a half millions of my fellow men in bondage. I may, as a citizen of a free state, blush at the humiliating fact that not only the tyranny but the ubiquity of the slave power is everywhere so manifest that it has insinuated itself into our free domain to such a degree that there seems to be as much mental slavery in the free states as there is personal in the slave states i may feel all this but i must not impeach the motives by which others have been governed there were twenty-one managers present at the reading of this letter, and, at its conclusion, a noble friend of the slave moved that the resignation be not accepted. The motion was lost by a vote of fourteen against seven. It was then moved that it be accepted with regret. This was carried by the same vote, but with regret was not an empty form for easing this action to its recipient. How much it meant is seen in the resolution that was added by unanimous acceptance. Resolved that this board are mainly indebted to Professor C. D. Cleveland for the prominent and influential position it has attained in the regards of this Christian community, and that they bear an earnest testimony to the sound judgment and unwearied zeal which have ever characterized the discharge of his duties in his responsible office. Let this tribute, coming from the bitterest personal opposition that ever man encountered, measure the work that extorted it. Looking at it, it will be difficult for the reader to believe that a sacrifice was made of the man to whom it refers by a representative Christian body, and merely to sate for a time in the inhuman slave greed. Yet it is only one fact out of many that might be adduced, and I have brought it forward because it is, in my father's words, a fair exponent of the position of the Christian church at that time upon the subject of slavery henceforward he ceased not to rain blows not only at his own the presbyterian denomination but at all the organized expressions of christian purpose the sunday school union the tract society etc while working thus by voice and pen he was incessantly busy in personal rescue of the slave especially was this the case when it became the duty of every lover of his kind to defy the fugitive slave law how eagerly he then sprang to aid the escape of those against whom a law of the land impotently tried to bar the law of our common humanity during the years that followed the passage of this infamous bill the position he had attained here was of particular service recognized as one who being a sort of standing sacrifice might as well continue to battle in the front 
trusted implicitly even by his bitterest foes, with such a broad philanthropy to back his appeals, pushing straight into every breach where work was needed, blind to everything but his one light of moral instinct, he became an organ for the charities of those whose softer natures longingly whispered the cry, but could not do the cut and thrust work of deliverance. Dr. Furness held the same position, and others who, like him, refused to be enrolled in the underground committee or in any definite anti-slavery organization. These men knew that they were of greater service to the cause by being its bodyguard, by standing between it and the public, by making the appeals and taking the blows, and by affording access, pecuniary and other, of each to each. Thus the times moved on, growing hotter, more difficult and dangerous, but always working these two results, redoubling the labors of this noble band, and shaking the city from lethargy to ferment. Men were compelled to take sides, and but one result could follow, the result which always follows when human nature is stung and quickened to find its highest instincts, the party of right steadily moved to triumph. For a lesson to us in courage, it is worth while to ask how these apostles of freedom stood the terrible strain put upon them for so many years. I can answer for the two of whom I write, and do not doubt that the answer is true of the rest. This self-forgetfulness was made easy by a love that filled and overfilled all their moral energies, the simple love of man, as God's highest creation, and of his natural rights, as God's best gift. Their work was not a mere result of will, not an outcome of faculty, not an unsupported impulse of heart. It was character living itself out, an utterance of its entire unity, something drawn from the solemn depths of those life convictions which all the personal and impersonal powers of a man aglow and welded unite in producing. Hence, their work was not apart from them, even so far as to be called ahead of them, nor parallel with them. It was one with them by a necessary spiritual inclusion. Will and duty ceased to be separate powers. They were transfused through the whole breadth of their human sympathies, adding to their warmth a fixity of purpose that bore them without a falter. Through thirty years of such bitter obloquy as in these latter days, only the early anti-slavery disciples have had to endure. These men never said, in reference to the anti-slavery cause, I ought or I will, because they never needed to say them. The sun shines without them, and life expands without them. And here were souls as unconsciously beneficent as the one, as spontaneous in growth and shaping as the other. Theirs was not a force that moved mechanically in right lines, with limited objects before it. It did, indeed, sweep with arrowy swiftness of a sail on every point that offered. But when I remember that it more often pleaded than stormed, that it penetrated into every secret recess that mercy casually opened and gently stirred into fuller life those roots of human feeling that can be numbed by apathy but not killed even by hate, I know that it was persuasive, diffusive, in breathing force, an influence vital in others because an effluence vitalized from themselves. So they stood, self-consecrated, enveloped by the love of God, permeated by the love of man, twin perfect loves that cast out all dream of fear, and so they walked, calm as if a thousand stabs of personal insult never brought them one of personal pain, passing through all as if nothing but the serenest skies were above them, and, as I have said, Right there is one explanation of the anomaly. There were the serenest skies above them, heaven's love perpetually shining. Why should it not shine? All the powers of the men were dedicated to rescuing the image of God on this earth. Not man as he suffered physically, but the moral instinct threatened with annihilation. It was sacred to them, this soul so sacred to redeeming love, but too brutalized to find its way to it, nor merely the slave. Their love embraced with yet more pitying fervor, the master compelling his spiritual nature into death, and the northern apologist letting his die, and this overmastering love of saving spiritual integrity was one power that made them and heart ease hold unfailing friends through the obloquy of those days. The other must be found in the fact mentioned, that neither resolve nor impulse was their spur, but personal character moving from its depths. From such a motive, power as this can come no parade of results. The nature that works proceeds from the necessary laws and forces of its being, and is as simple and unconscious as any other natural law or force. 
Hence, there are no startling epochs to record in my father's history, no supreme efforts in filling the measure of daily opportunity lay his chief work. I cannot measure it by our ten fingers counting. I can only show a life unfolding, and by the essential laws of its growth, embracing the noblest cause of its time. But if action means vivifying public sentiment, decaying under insidious poison, if it includes the doing of this amid a storm of odium that would quickly have shattered any soul irresolute for an instant, if it means incessant toil quietly performed, vast sums collected and dispersed, time sacrificed, strength spent, if it means holding up a great iniquity to loathing by a powerful pen, and nailing moral cowardice wherever it showed, if it be risking livelihood by introducing the cause of the slave into every literary work, and by mingling the school culture of fifty future mothers, year by year, with hatred of the sin, if it means one's life in one's hand, friendships yielded, society defied, and position in it cheerfully renounced, above all, if action means a wealth of goodness overliving all scorns, compelling respect from a community rebuked, fellowship from a church charged with ungodliness and acknowledgment of unsustained repute from a public eager to blacken with scandal. If to do thus, and bear thus, and live thus, is action, then my father did act to the full purpose of life in the struggle that freed the slave. S.M.C. End of section 29. Recording by Sherry Jordan.